Chapter 93 The Castaway It was but some few days after encountering the Frenchman that a most significant event befell the most insignificant of the Pequod's crew, an event most lamentable, and which ended in providing the sometimes madly merry and predestinated craft with a living and ever-accompanying prophecy of whatever shattered sequel might prove her own. Now, in the whale ship, it is not everyone that goes in the boats. Some few hands are reserved, called shipkeepers, whose province it is to work the vessel while the boats are pursuing the whale. As a general thing, these shipkeepers are as hardy fellows as the men comprising the boats' crews. But if there happen to be an unduly slender, clumsy, or timorous white in the ship, that white is certain to be made a shipkeeper. It was so in the Pequod with the little negro Pippin, by nickname Pip by abbreviation. Poor Pip. You've heard of him before. You must remember his tambourine on that dramatic midnight so gloomy jolly. In outer aspect, Pip and Doughboy made a match, like a black pony and a white one, of equal developments, though of dissimilar color, driven in one eccentric span. But while hapless Doughboy was by nature dull and torpid in his intellects, Pip, though over tender hearted, was at bottom very bright, with that pleasant, genial, jolly brightness peculiar to his tribe, a tribe which ever enjoy all holidays and festivities with finer, freer relish than any other race. For blacks, the year's calendar should show naught but 365 Fourth of July's and New Year's days. Nor smile so while I write that this little black was brilliant, for even blackness has its brilliancy. Behold yon lustrous ebony, paneled in king's cabinets. But Pip loved life, and all life's peaceable securities, so that the panic-striking business in which he had somehow unaccountably become entrapped had most sadly blurred his brightness. Though, as ere long will be seen, what was thus temporarily subdued in him in the end was destined to be luridly illumined by strange, wild fires that fictitiously showed him off to ten times the natural luster with which his native Tolland County in Connecticut he had once enlivened many a fiddler's frolic on the green, and at melodious eventide, with his gay ha-ha, had turned the round horizon into one star-bellied tambourine. So, though in the clear air of day, suspended against a blue-veined neck, the pure watered diamond drop will healthful glow, yet when the cunning jeweler would show you the diamond in its most impressive luster, he lays it against a gloomy ground, and then lights it up, not by the sun, but by some unnatural gases. Then come out those fiery effulgences, infernally superb. Then the evil, blazing diamond, once the divinest symbol of the crystal skies, looks like some crown jewels stolen from the king of hell. But let us to the story. It came to pass that in the ambergris affair, Stubbs, after oarsman, chanced so to sprain his hand, as for a time to become quite maimed, and temporarily Pip was put into his place. The first time Stubb lowered with him, Pip evinced much nervousness, but happily for that time escaped close contact with the whale, and therefore came off not altogether discreditably, though Stubb observing him took care afterwards to exhort him to cherish his courageousness to the utmost, for he might often find it needful. Now upon the second lowering the boat paddled upon the whale, and as the fish received the darted iron, it gave its customary rap, which happened in this instance to be right under poor Pip's seat. The involuntary consternation of the moment caused him to leap, paddle in hand, out of the boat, and in such a way that part of the slack whale line coming against his chest, he breasted it overboard with him so as to become entangled in it when at last plumping into the water. That instant the stricken whale started on a fierce run, the line swiftly straightened, and presto, poor Pip came all foaming up to the chocks of the boat, remorselessly dragged there by the line which had taken several turns around his chest and neck. Tashtigo stood in the bows. He was full of the fire of the hunt. He hated Pip for a poltroon. Snatching the boat knife from its sheath, he suspended its sharp edge over the line and turning towards Stubb, exclaimed interrogatively, Cut! Meantime, Pip's blue, choked face plainly looked, Do, for God's sake! All passed in a flash. In less than half a minute, this entire thing happened. Damn him, cut! roared Stubb. And so the whale was lost and Pip was saved. As soon as he recovered himself, the poor little negro was assailed by yells and execrations from the crew. 
tranquilly permitting these irregular cursings to evaporate, Stubb then, in a plain, business-like, but still half-humorous manner, cursed Pip officially, and that done unofficially gave him much wholesome advice. The substance was, never jump from a boat, Pip, except... But all the rest was indefinite, as the soundest advice ever is. Now, in general, stick to the boat is your true motto in whaling. But cases will sometimes happen when leap from the boat is still better. Moreover, as if perceiving at last that if he should give undiluted conscientious advice to Pip, he would be leaving him too wide a margin to jump in for the future, Stubb suddenly dropped all advice and concluded with a peremptory command. Stick to the boat, Pip, or by the Lord I won't pick you up if you jump. Mind that. We can't afford to lose whales by the likes of you. A whale would sell for thirty times what you would, Pip, in Alabama. Bear that in mind and don't jump any more. Hereby perhaps Stubb indirectly hinted that though man loves his fellow, yet man is a money-making animal, which propensity too often interferes with his benevolence. But we are all in the hands of the gods, and Pip jumped again. It was under very similar circumstances to the first performance, but this time he did not breast out the line, and hence when the whale started to run, Pip was left behind on the sea, like a hurried traveler's trunk. Alas, Stubb was but too true to his word. It was a beautiful, bounteous, blue day, the spangled sea calm and cool and flatly stretching away all round to the horizon like gold beater skin hammered out to the extremist. Bobbing up and down in that sea, Pip's ebon head showed like a head of cloves. No boat knife was lifted when he fell so rapidly astern. Stubb's inexorable back was turned upon him, and the whale was winged. In three minutes, a whole mile of shoreless ocean was between Pip and Stubb. Out from the center of the sea, poor Pip turned his crisp, curling black head to the sun, another lonely castaway, though the loftiest and the brightest. Now, in calm weather, to swim in the open ocean is as easy to the practiced swimmer as to ride in a spring carriage ashore. But the awful lonesomeness is intolerable. The intense concentration of self in the middle of such a heartless immensity, my God, who can tell it? Mark how when sailors in a dead calm bathe in the open sea, mark how closely they hug their ship and only coast along her sides. But had Stubb really abandoned the poor little negro to his fate? No, he did not mean to, at least, because there were two boats in his wake and he supposed no doubt that they would, of course, come up to Pip very quickly and pick him up. Though indeed such considerateness towards oarsmen jeopardized through their own timidity is not always manifested by the hunters in all similar instances, and such instances not unfrequently occur. Almost invariably in the fishery, a coward, so-called, is marked with the same ruthless detestation peculiar to military navies and armies. But it so happened that those boats, without seeing Pip, suddenly spying whales close to them on one side, turned and gave chase. And Stubb's boat was now so far away, and he and all his crew so intent upon his fish, that Pip's ringed horizon began to expand around him miserably. By the merest chance, the ship itself at last rescued him. But from that hour, the little negro went about the deck an idiot. Such, at least, they said he was. The sea had jeeringly kept his finite body up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. Not drowned entirely, though. Rather, carried down alive to wondrous depths where strange shapes of the unwarped primal world glided to and fro before his passive eyes, and the miser, merman, wisdom revealed his hoarded heaps, and among the joyous, heartless, ever-juvenile eternities, Pip saw the multitudinous, god-omnipresent coral insects that out of the firmament of waters heaved the colossal orbs. He saw God's foot upon the treadle of the loom and spoke it, and therefore his shipmates called him mad. So man's insanity is heaven's sense, and wandering from all mortal reason, man comes at last to that celestial thought which to reason is absurd and frantic, and weal or woe feels then uncompromised, indifferent as his God. For the rest, Blame not Stubb too hardly. The thing is common in that fishery, and in the sequel of the narrative it will then be seen what like abandonment befell myself. Chapter 94 
a squeeze of the hand. That whale of stubs so dearly purchased was duly brought to the Pequod's side, where all those cutting and hoisting operations previously detailed were regularly gone through, even to the bailing of the Heidelberg Tun, or case. While some were occupied with this latter duty, others were employed in dragging away the larger tubs, so soon as filled with the sperm. And when the proper time arrived, this same sperm was carefully manipulated ere going to the triworks, of which anon. It had cooled and crystallized to such a degree that when with several others I sat down before a large Constantine's bath of it, I found it strangely concreted into lumps here and there rolling about in the liquid part. It was our business to squeeze these lumps back into fluid, a sweet and unctuous duty. No wonder that in old times this sperm was such a favorite cosmetic, such a clearer, such a sweetener, such a softener, such a delicious mollifier. After having my hands in it for only a few minutes, my fingers felt like eels and began, as it were, to serpentine and spiralize. As I sat there at my ease, cross-legged on the deck, after the bitter exertion at the windlass, under a blue, tranquil sky, the ship under indolent sail, and gliding so serenely along, as I bathed my hands among those soft, gentle globules of infiltrated tissues woven almost within the hour, as they richly broke to my fingers and discharged all their opulence like fully ripe grapes their wine, as I snuffed up that uncontaminated aroma, literally and truly like the smell of spring violets, I declare to you that for the time I lived as in a musky meadow. I forgot all about our horrible oath. In that inexpressible sperm I washed my hands and my heart of it. I almost began to credit the old Paracelsian superstition that sperm is of rare virtue in allaying the heat of anger. While bathing in that bath I felt divinely free from all ill will or petulance or malice of any sort whatsoever. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze all the morning long. I squeezed that sperm till I myself almost melted into it. I squeezed that sperm till a strange sort of insanity came over me, and I found myself unwittingly squeezing my co-laborers' hands in it, mistaking their hands for the gentle globules. Such an abounding, affectionate, friendly, loving feeling did this avocation beget, that at last I was continually squeezing their hands and looking up into their eyes sentimentally as much as to say, Oh, my dear fellow beings, why should we longer cherish any social acerbities, or know the slightest ill-humor or envy? Come. Let us squeeze hands all round. Nay, let us all squeeze ourselves into each other. Let us squeeze ourselves universally into the very milk and sperm of kindness. Would that I could keep squeezing that sperm forever. For now, since by many prolonged repeated experiences, I have perceived that in all cases, man must eventually lower or at least shift his conceit of attainable felicity, not placing it anywhere in the intellect or the fancy, but in the wife, in the heart, the bed, the table, the saddle, the fireside, the country. Now that I have perceived all this, I am ready to squeeze case eternally. In thoughts of the visions of the night, I saw long rows of angels in paradise, each with his hands in a jar of spermaceti. Now, while discoursing of sperm, it behooves to speak of other things akin to it, in the business of preparing the sperm whale for the triworks. First comes white horse, so-called, which is obtained from the tapering part of the fish and also from the thicker portions of his flukes. It is tough with congealed tendons, a wad of muscle, but still contains some oil. After being severed from the whale, the white horse is first cut into portable oblongs ere going to the mincer. They look much like blocks of Berkshire marble. Plum pudding is the term bestowed upon certain fragmentary parts of the whale's flesh, here and there adhering to the blanket of blubber, and often participating to a considerable degree in its unctuousness. It is a most refreshing, convivial, beautiful object to behold. As its name imports, it is of an exceedingly rich, mottled tint, with a bestreaked snowy and golden ground dotted with spots of the deepest crimson and purple. It is plums of rubies and pictures of citron. Spite of reason, it is hard to keep yourself from eating it. I confess that once I stole behind the foremast to try it. It tasted something as I should conceive a royal cutlet from the thigh of Louis Le Gros might have tasted, supposing him to have been killed the first day after the venison season, and that particular venison season contemporary with an unusually fine vintage of the vineyards of Champagne. 
There is another substance, and a very singular one, which turns up in the course of this business, but which I feel it to be very puzzling adequately to describe. It is called Slobgollion, an appellation original with the whalemen, and even so is the nature of the substance. It is an ineffably oozy, stringy affair, most frequently found in the tubs of sperm after a prolonged squeezing and subsequent decanting. I hold it to be the wondrously thin, ruptured membranes of the case coalescing. Gurry, so-called, is a term properly belonging to right whalemen, but sometimes incidentally used by the sperm fishermen. It designates the dark, glutinous substance which is scraped off the back of the Greenland or right whale, and much of which covers the decks of those inferior souls who hunt that ignoble leviathan. Nippers. Strictly, this word is not indigenous to the whale's vocabulary, but as applied by whalemen, it becomes so. A whaleman's nipper is a short, firm strip of tendinous stuff cut from the tapering part of Leviathan's tail. It averages an inch in thickness, and for the rest is about the size of the iron part of a hoe. Edgewise moved along the oily deck, it operates like a leathern squilgee, and by nameless blandishments, as of magic, allures along with it all impurities. But to learn all about these recondite matters, your best way is at once to descend into the blubber room and have a long talk with its inmates. This place has previously been mentioned as the receptacle for the blanket pieces when stripped and hoisted from the whale. When the proper time arrives for cutting up its contents, this apartment is a scene of terror to all tyros, especially by night. On one side, lit by a dull lantern, a space has been left clear for the workmen. They generally go in pairs, a pike and gaff man and a spade man. The whaling pike is similar to a frigate's boarding weapon of the same name. The gaff is something like a boat hook. With his gaff, the gaff man hooks on to a sheet of blubber and strives to hold it from slipping as the ship pitches and lurches about. Meanwhile, the spade man stands on the sheet itself, perpendicularly chopping it into the portable horse pieces. This spade is sharp as hone can make it. The spade man's feet are shoeless. The thing he stands on will sometimes irresistibly slide away from him like a sledge. If he cuts off one of his own toes or one of his assistants, would you be very much astonished? Toes are scarce among veteran blubber room men. Chapter 95 The Cassock had you stepped on board the Pequod at a certain juncture of this post-mortemizing of the whale, and had you strolled forward nigh the windlass, pretty sure am I that you would have scanned with no small curiosity a very strange, enigmatical object which you would have seen there lying along lengthwise in the lee scuppers. Not the wondrous cistern in the whale's huge head, not the prodigy of his unhinged lower jaw, not the miracle of his symmetrical tail, none of these would so surprise you as half a glimpse of that unaccountable cone. Longer than a Kentuckian is tall, nigh a foot in diameter at the base, and jet black as Yojo, the ebony idol of Queequeg. And an idol, indeed, it is, or rather in old times its likeness was. Such an idol as that found in the secret groves of Queen Macha in Judea, and for worshipping which King Asa, her son, did depose her, and destroyed the idol and burnt it for an abomination at the brook Kedron, as darkly set forth in the fifteenth chapter of the first book of Kings. Look at the sailor called the Mincer, who now comes along, and assisted by two allies, heavily backs the Grandissimus, as the mariners call it, and with bowed shoulders staggers off with it as if he were a grenadier carrying a dead comrade from the field. Extending it upon the forecastle deck, he now proceeds cylindrically to remove its dark pelt, as an African hunter the pelt of a boa. This done, he turns the pelt inside out, like a pantaloon leg, gives it a good stretching so as to almost double its diameter, and at last hangs it well spread in the rigging to dry. Ere long, it is taken down when, removing some three feet of it towards the pointed extremity and then cutting two slits for armholes at the other end, he lengthwise slips himself bodily into it. The mincer now stands before you, invested in the full canonicals of his calling. Immemorial to all his order, this investiture alone will adequately protect him while employed in the peculiar functions of his office. That office consists in mincing the horse pieces of blubber for the pots, 
an operation which is conducted at a curious wooden horse planted endwise against the bulwarks and with a capacious tub beneath it into which the minced pieces drop, fast as the sheets from a rapt orator's desk. Arrayed in decent black, occupying a conspicuous pulpit, intent on Bible leaves. What a candidate for an archbishopric. What a land for a pope were this mincer. Bible leaves, Bible leaves. This is the invariable cry from the mates to the mincer. It enjoins him to be careful and cut his work into as thin slices as possible, inasmuch as by doing so the business of boiling out the oil is much accelerated, and its quantity considerably increased, besides perhaps improving it in quality. Chapter 96 The Triworks Besides her hoisted boats, an American whaler is outwardly distinguished by her triworks. She presents the curious anomaly of the most solid masonry joining with oak and hemp in constituting the completed ship. It is as if from the open field a brick kiln were transported to her planks. The triworks are planted between the foremast and the mainmast, the most roomy part of the deck. The timbers beneath are of a peculiar strength, fitted to sustain the weight of an almost solid mass of brick and mortar some ten feet by eight square and five in height. The foundation does not penetrate the deck, but the masonry is firmly secured to the surface by ponderous knees of iron bracing it on all sides and screwing it down to the timbers. On the flanks it is cased with wood and at top completely covered by a large sloping battened hatchway. Removing this hatch, we expose the great tripods, two in number, and each of several barrels' capacity. When not in use, they are kept remarkably clean. Sometimes they are polished with soapstone and sand till they shine within like silver punch bowls. During the night watches, some cynical old sailors will crawl into them and coil themselves away there for a nap. While employed in polishing them, one man in each pot, side by side, many confidential communications are carried on over the iron lips. It is a place also for profound mathematical meditation. It was in the left-hand tripod of the Pequod, with a soapstone diligently circling round me, that I was first indirectly struck by the remarkable fact that in geometry all bodies gliding along the cycloid, my soapstone for example, will descend from any point in precisely the same time. Removing the fireboard from the front of the triworks, the bare masonry of that side is exposed, penetrated by the two iron mouths of the furnaces directly underneath the pots. These mouths are fitted with heavy doors of iron. The intense heat of the fire is prevented from communicating itself to the deck by means of a shallow reservoir extending under the entire enclosed surface of the works. By a tunnel inserted at the rear, this reservoir is kept replenished with water as fast as it evaporates. There are no external chimneys. They open direct from the rear wall. And here let us go back for a moment. It was about nine o'clock at night that the Pequod's triworks were first started on this present voyage. It belonged to Stubb to oversee the business. Already there, off hatch then and starter. You, cook, fire the works. This was an easy thing, for the carpenter had been thrusting his shavings into the furnace throughout the passage. Here be it said that in a whaling voyage the first fire in the triworks has to be fed for a time with wood. After that, no wood is used, except as a means of quick ignition to the staple fuel. In a word, after being tried out, the crisp, shriveled blubber, now called scraps or fritters, still contains considerable of its unctuous properties. These fritters feed the flames. Like a plethoric, burning martyr or a self-consuming misanthrope, once ignited, the whale supplies his own fuel and burns by his own body. Would that he consumed his own smoke, for his smoke is horrible to inhale, and inhale it you must, and not only that, but you must live in it for the time. It has an unspeakable, wild, Hindu odor about it, such as may lurk in the vicinity of funeral pyres. It smells like the left wing of the Day of Judgment. It is an argument for the pit. By midnight the works were in full operation. We were clear from the carcass, sail had been made, the wind was freshening, the wild ocean darkness was intense. But that darkness was licked up by the fierce flames, which at intervals forked forth from the sooty flues and illuminated every lofty rope in the rigging as with the famed Greek fire. The burning ship drove on, as if remorselessly commissioned to some vengeful deed. 
So the pitch and sulfur freighted brigs of the bold Hydriote, Canaris, issuing from their midnight harbors with broad sheets of flame for sails, bore down upon the Turkish frigates and folded them in conflagrations. The hatch removed from the top of the works now afforded a wide hearth in front of them. Standing on this were the Tartarian shapes of the pagan harpooners, always the whale ship stokers. With huge pronged poles, they pitched hissing masses of blubber into the scalding pots, or stirred up the fires beneath till the snaky flames darted, curling out of the doors to catch them by the feet. The smoke rolled away in sullen heaps. To every pitch of the ship there was a pitch of the boiling oil, which seemed all eagerness to leap into their faces. Opposite the mouth of the works, on the further side of the wide wooden hearth, was the windlass. This served for a sea sofa. Here lounged the watch, when not otherwise employed, looking into the red heat of the fire, till their eyes felt scorched in their heads. Their tawny features, now all begrimed with smoke and sweat, their matted beards and the contrasting barbaric brilliancy of their teeth, all these were strangely revealed in the capricious emblazonings of the works. As they narrated to each other their unholy adventures, their tales of terror told in words of mirth, as their uncivilized laughter forked upwards out of them like the flames from the furnace, as to and fro in their front the harpooners wildly gesticulated with their huge pronged forks and dippers, as the wind howled on and the sea leaped and the ship groaned and dived and yet steadfastly shot her red hell further and further into the blackness of the sea and the night and scornfully champed the white bone in her mouth and viciously spat round her on all sides, then the rushing Pequod, freighted with savages and laden with fire, and burning a corpse and plunging into that blackness of darkness, seemed the material counterpart of her monomaniac commander's soul. So it seemed to me as I stood at her helm, and for long hours silently guided the way of this fire ship on the sea. Wrapped for that interval in darkness myself, I but the better saw the redness, the madness, the ghastliness of others. The continual sight of the fiend shapes before me, capering half in smoke and half in fire, these at last begat kindred visions in my soul, so soon as I began to yield to that unaccountable drowsiness which ever would come over me at a midnight helm. But that night in particular a strange and ever since inexplicable thing occurred to me. Starting from a brief Standing sleep, I was horribly conscious of something fatally wrong. The jawbone tiller smote my side, which leaned against it. In my ears was the low hum of sails just beginning to shake in the wind. I thought my eyes were open. I was half conscious of putting my fingers to the lids and mechanically stretching them still further apart. But spite of all this, I could see no compass before me to steer by. Though it seemed but a minute since I had been watching the card by the steady binnacle lamp illuminating it. Nothing seemed before me but a jet gloom, now and then made ghastly by flashes of redness. Uppermost was the impression that whatever swift rushing thing I stood on was not so much bound to any haven ahead as rushing from all havens astern. A stark, bewildered feeling as of death came over me. Convulsively my hands grasped the tiller, but with the crazy conceit that the tiller was somehow, in some enchanted way, inverted. My God, what is the matter with me, thought I. Lo, in my brief sleep I had turned myself about and was fronting the ship's stern with my back to her prow and the compass. In an instant I faced back, just in time to prevent the vessel from flying up into the wind and very probably capsizing her. How glad and how grateful the relief from this unnatural hallucination of the night and the fatal contingency of being brought by the lee. Look not too long in the face of the fire, O oh man. Never dream with thy hand on the helm. Turn not thy back to the compass. Accept the first hint of the hitching tiller. Believe not the artificial fire when its redness makes all things look ghastly. Tomorrow, in the natural sun, the skies will be bright. Those who glared like devils in the forking flames, the morn will show in far other, at least gentler, relief. The glorious, golden, glad sun, the only true lamp, all others but liars. 
Nevertheless, the sun hides not Virginia's dismal swamp, nor Rome's accursed Campania, nor wide Sahara, nor all the millions of miles of deserts and of griefs beneath the moon. The sun hides not the ocean, which is the dark side of this earth, and which is two-thirds of this earth. So, therefore, that mortal man who hath more of joy than sorrow in him, that mortal man cannot be true, not true or undeveloped. With books the same, the truest of all men was the man of sorrows, and the truest of all books is Solomon's, and Ecclesiastes is the fine-hammered steel of woe. All is vanity, all. This willful world hath not got hold of unchristian Solomon's wisdom yet. But he who dodges hospitals and jails, and walks fast crossing graveyards, and would rather talk of operas than hell, calls Cowper, Young, Pascal, Rousseau, poor devils all of sick men, and throughout a carefree lifetime swears by Rabelais as passing wise, and therefore jolly. Not that man is fitted to sit down on tombstones and break the green damp mold, with unfathomably wondrous Solomon. But even Solomon, he says, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain, i.e. even while living, in the congregation of the dead. Give not thyself up then to fire, lest it invert thee, deaden thee, as for the time it did me. There is a wisdom that is woe, but there is a woe that is madness. And there is a Catskill eagle in some souls that can alike dive down into the blackest gorges and soar out of them again and become invisible in the sunny spaces. And even if he forever flies within the gorge, that gorge is in the mountains, so that even in his lowest swoop, the mountain eagle is still higher than other birds upon the plain, even though they soar. Chapter 97 The Lamp Had you descended from the Pequod's triworks to the Pequod's forecastle, where the off-duty watch were sleeping, for one single moment you would have almost thought you were standing in some illuminated shrine of canonized kings and counselors. There they lay in their triangular oaken vaults, each mariner a chiseled muteness, a score of lamps flashing upon his hooded eyes. In merchantmen, Oil for the sailor is more scarce than the milk of queens. To dress in the dark and eat in the dark and stumble in darkness to his pallet, this is his usual lot. But the whaleman, as he seeks the food of light, so he lives in light. He makes his berth in Aladdin's lamp and lays him down in it, so that in the pitchiest night the ship's black hull still houses an illumination. See what with entire freedom the whaleman takes his handful of lamps, often but old bottles and vials, though, to the copper cooler at the triworks and replenishes them there as mugs of ale at a vat. He burns, too, the purest of oil, in its unmanufactured and therefore unvitiated state, a fluid unknown to solar, lunar, or astral contrivances ashore. It is sweet as early grass butter in April. He goes and hunts for his oil so as to be sure of its freshness and genuineness, even as the traveller on the prairie hunts up his own supper of game. Chapter 98 Stowing Down and Clearing Up Already it has been related how the great leviathan is afar off described from the masthead, how he is chased over the watery moors and slaughtered in the valleys of the deep, how he is then towed alongside and beheaded, and how, on the principle which entitled the headsman of old to the garments in which the beheaded was killed, his great padded surtout becomes the property of his executioner, how in due time he is condemned to the pots, and, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his spermaceti, oil, and bone pass unscathed through the fire. But now it remains to conclude the last chapter of this part of the description by rehearsing singing, if I may, the romantic proceeding of decanting off his oil into the casks and striking them down into the hold, where once again Leviathan returns to his native profundities, sliding along beneath the surface as before, but alas, never more to rise and blow. While still warm, the oil, like hot punch, is received into the six-barrel casks. And while perhaps the ship is pitching and rolling this way and that in the midnight sea, 
The enormous casks are slewed round and headed over end for end, and sometimes perilously scoot across the slippery deck like so many landslides, till at last manhandled and stayed in their course, and all round the hoops rap, rap, go as many hammers as can play upon them, for now, ex officio, every sailor is a cooper. At length, when the last pint is casked and all is cool, then the great hatchways are unsealed, the bowels of the ship are thrown open, and down go the casks to their final rest in the sea. This done, the hatches are replaced and hermetically closed, like a closet walled up. In the sperm fishery, this is perhaps one of the most remarkable incidents in all the business of whaling. One day, the planks stream with freshets of blood and oil, on the sacred quarter-deck, enormous masses of the whale's head are profanely piled. Great rusky casks lie about as in a brewery yard. The smoke from the triworks has besuited all the bulwarks. The mariners go about suffused with unctuousness. The entire ship seems great Leviathan himself, while on all hands the din is deafening. But a day or two after, you look about you and prick your ears in this self-same ship. And were it not for the telltale boats and triworks, you would all but swear you trod some silent merchant vessel with a most scrupulously neat commander. The unmanufactured sperm oil possesses a singularly cleansing virtue. This is the reason why the decks never look so white as just after what they call an affair of oil. Besides, from the ashes of the burned scraps of the whale, a potent lay is readily made. And whenever any adhesiveness from the back of the whale remains clinging to the side, that lay quickly exterminates it. Hands go diligently along the bulwarks, and with buckets of water and rags restore them to their full tidiness. The soot is brushed from the lower rigging. All the numerous implements which have been in use are likewise faithfully cleansed and put away. The great hatch is scrubbed and placed upon the triworks, completely hiding the pots. Every cask is out of sight. All tackles are coiled in unseen nooks. And when, by the combined and simultaneous industry of almost the entire ship's company, the whole of this conscientious duty is at last concluded, then the crew themselves proceed to their own ablutions, shift themselves from top to toe, and finally issue to the immaculate deck, fresh and all aglow, as bridegrooms new leaped from out the daintiest Holland. Now, with elated step, they pace the planks in twos and threes, and humorously discourse of parlors, sofas, carpets, and fine cambrics, propose to mat the deck, think of having hangings to the top, object not to taking tea by moonlight on the piazza of the forecastle. To hint to such musked mariners of oil and bone and blubber were little short of audacity. They know not the thing you distantly allude to. Away and bring us napkins. But mark. Aloft there at the three mastheads stand three men, intent on spying out more whales, which, if caught, infallibly will again soil the old oaken furniture and drop at least one small grease spot somewhere. Yes, and many is the time when, after the severest uninterrupted labors which know no night, continuing straight through for ninety-six hours, when from the boat, where they have swelled their wrists with all day rowing on the line, they only step to the deck to carry vast chains and heave the heavy windlass and cut and slash, yea, and in their very sweatings to be smoked and burned anew by the combined fires of the equatorial sun and the equatorial triworks, when on the heel of all this they have finally bestirred themselves to cleanse the ship and make a spotless dairy room of it. Many is the time the poor fellows just buttoning the necks of their clean frocks are startled by the cry of, There she blows! And away they fly to fight another whale and go through the whole weary thing again. Oh, my friends, but this is man-killing. Yet this is life. For hardly have we mortals by long toilings extracted from this world's vast bulk its small but valuable sperm, and then with weary patience cleansed ourselves from its defilements and learned to live here in clean tabernacles of the soul, hardly is this done when there she blows, the ghost is spouted up, and away we sail to fight some other world and go through young life's old routine again. Oh, the metempsychosis! O oh, Pythagoras, that in bright Greece two thousand years ago did die, so good, so wise, so mild! I sailed with thee along the Peruvian coast last voyage, and foolish as I am, taught thee, a green, simple boy, how to splice a rope.
Chapter 99 The Doubloon Ere now, it has been related how Ahab was wont to pace his quarter-deck, taking regular turns that either limit the binnacle and the mainmast. But in the multiplicity of other things requiring narration, it has not been added how that sometimes in these walks, when most plunged in his mood, he was wont to pause in turn at each spot, and stand there strangely eyeing the particular object before him. When he halted before the binnacle, with his glance fastened on the pointed needle in the compass, that glance shot like a javelin with the pointed intensity of his purpose. And when resuming his walk, he again paused before the mainmast. Then, as the same riveted glance fastened upon the riveted gold coin there, he still wore the same aspect of nailed firmness, only dashed with a certain wild longing, if not hopefulness. But one morning, turning to pass the doubloon, he seemed to be newly attracted by the strange figures and inscriptions stamped on it, as though now for the first time beginning to interpret for himself in some monomaniac way whatever significance might lurk in them. And some certain significance lurks in all things, else all things are little worth, and the round world itself but an empty cipher except to sell by the cartload as they do hills about Boston to fill up some morass in the Milky Way. Now this doubloon was of purest virgin gold, raked somewhere out of the heart of gorgeous hills, whence east and west over golden sands the headwaters of many a pactolous flow. And though now nailed amidst all the rustiness of iron bolts and the verdigree of copper spikes, yet untouchable and immaculate to any foulness, it still preserved its keto glow. Nor, though placed amongst a ruthless crew, and every hour passed by ruthless hands, and through the live-long night shrouded with thick darkness which might cover any pilfering approach, nevertheless every sunrise found the doubloon where the sunset left it last. For it was set apart and sanctified to one awe-striking end. And however wanton in their sailor ways, one and all, the mariners revered it as the white whale's talisman. Sometimes they talked it over in the weary watch by night, wondering whose it was to be at last, and whether he would ever live to spend it. Now these noble golden coins of South America are as medals of the sun and tropic token pieces. Here palms, alpacas, and volcanoes, suns, discs, and stars, ecliptics, horns of plenty, and rich banners waving are in luxuriant profusion stamped so that the precious gold seems almost to derive an added preciousness and enhancing glories by passing through those fancy mints so Spanishly poetic. It so chanced that the doubloon of the Pequod was a most wealthy example of these things. On its round border it bore the letters Republica del Ecuador, Quito. So this bright coin came from a country planted in the middle of the world and beneath the great equator and named after it, and it had been cast midway up the Andes in the unwaning clime that knows no autumn. Zoned by those letters you saw the likeness of three Andes summits, from one a flame, a tower on another, on the third a crowing cock, while arching over all was a segment of the partitioned zodiac, the signs all marked with their usual cabalistics, and the keystone sun entering Libra. Before this equatorial coin, Ahab, not unobserved by others, was now pausing. There's something ever egotistical in mountain tops and towers, and all other grand and lofty things. Look here, three peaks as proud as Lucifer. The firm tower, that is Ahab. The volcano, that is Ahab. The courageous, the undaunted and victorious fowl, that too is Ahab. All are Ahab. And this round gold is but the image of the rounder globe, which like a magician's glass to each and every man in turn but mirrors back his own mysterious self. Great pains, small gains for those who ask the world to solve them. It cannot solve itself. Methinks now this coined sun wears a ruddy face. But see! Ay, he enters the sign of storms, the equinox. And but six months before he wheeled out of a former equinox at Ares, from storm to storm. So be it then. Born in throes, tis fit that man should live in pains and die in pangs. So be it then. Here's stout stuff for woe to work on. So be it then. 
No fairy fingers can have pressed the gold, but devil's claws must have left their mouldings there since yesterday, murmured Starbuck to himself, leaning against the bulwarks. The old man seems to read Belshazzar's awful writing. I have never marked the coin inspectingly. He goes below. Let me read. A dark valley between three mighty heaven-abiding peaks that almost seem the trinity in some faint earthly symbol. So in this veil of death God girds us round, and over all our gloom the sun of righteousness still shines a beacon and a hope. If we bend down our eyes, the dark veil shows her moldy soil. But if we lift them, the bright sun meets our glance halfway to cheer. Yet, oh, the great sun is no fixture, and if at midnight we would fain snatch some sweet solace from him, we gaze for him in vain. This coin speaks wisely, mildly, truly, but still sadly to me. I will quit it, lest truth shake me falsely. Then how's the old mogul, soliloquized Stubb by the triworks? He's been twigging it. And then goes Starbuck from the same, and both with faces which I should say might be somewhere within nine fathoms long, and all from looking at a piece of gold, which did I have it now on Negro Hill or in Corlier's Hook, I'd not look at it very long ere spending it. Huh. In my poor, insignificant opinion, I regard this as queer. I have seen doubloons before now in my voyagings, your doubloons of old Spain, your doubloons of Peru, your doubloons of Chile, your doubloons of Bolivia, your doubloons of Papayan, with plenty of gold madores and pistoles and joes and half joes and quarter joes. What then should there be in this doubloon of the equator that is so killing wonderful? By Golconda, let me read it once. Hello. Here signs and wonders truly. That now is what old Bowditch in his epitome calls the zodiac, and what my almanac below calls ditto. I'll get the almanac. And as I have heard devils can be raised with Dabal's arithmetic, I'll try my hand at raising a meaning out of these queer curvicues here with a Massachusetts calendar. Here's the book. Let's see now. Signs and wonders. And the sun, he's always among them. Hum, hum, hum. Here they are. Here they go. All alive. Ares, or the ram. Taurus, or the bull. And Jiminy, here's Gemini himself, or the twins. Well, the son he wheels among them. Aye, here on the coin he's just crossing the threshold between two of twelve sitting rooms all in a ring. Book, you lie there. The fact is, you books must know your places. You'll do to give us the bare words and facts, but we come in to supply the thoughts. That's my small experience, so far as the Massachusetts calendar and Bowditch's navigator and Dabal's arithmetic go. Signs and wonders, eh? Pity if there is nothing wonderful in signs and significant in wonders. There's a clue somewhere. Wait a bit. Hist, hark. By Jove, I have it. Look, your doubloon. Your zodiac here is the life of a man in one round chapter. And now I'll read it off straight out of the book. Come, almanac. To begin, there's Ares, or the ram. Lecherous dog, he begets us. Then Taurus, or the bull, he bumps us the first thing. Then Gemini, or the twins. That is, virtue and vice. We try to reach virtue when, lo, comes Cancer the crab and drags us back. And here, going from virtue, Leo, a roaring lion, lies in the path. He gives a few fierce bites and surly dabs with his paw. We escape and hail Virgo, the virgin. That's our first love. We marry and think to be happy for I. When pop comes Libra, or the scales, happiness weighed and found wanting. And while we are very sad about that, Lord, how we suddenly jump as Scorpio or the scorpion stings us in rear. We are curing the wound when wang come the arrows all round, Sagittarius or the archer is amusing himself. As we pluck out the shaft, stand aside, here's the battering ram, Capricornus or the goat. Full tilt he comes rushing and headlong we are tossed, when Aquarius or the water bearer pours out his whole deluge and drowns us. And to wind up with Pisces or the fishes, we sleep. There's a sermon now, writ in high heaven, and the sun goes through it every year, and yet comes out of it all alive and hearty. Jollily he aloft there, wheels through toil and trouble, and so alo here does Jolly Stub. Ah, Jolly's the word for I. Adieu, doubloon. But stop. Here comes little King Post. Dodge round the triworks now, and let's hear what he'll have to say. There he's before it. He'll out with something presently. So, so, he's beginning. 
I see nothing here but a round thing made of gold. And whoever raises a certain whale, this round thing belongs to him. So what's all this staring been about? It is worth sixteen dollars, that's true, and at two cents the cigar, that's nine hundred and sixty cigars. I won't smoke dirty pipes like Stubb, but I like cigars, and here's nine hundred and sixty of them, so here goes Flaskaloff to spy him out. Shall I call that wise or foolish now? If it be really wise, it has a foolish look to it. Yet if it be really foolish, then has it a sort of wiseish look to it. But a vast. Here comes our old Manx man, the old hearse driver he must have been, that is, before he took to the sea. He luffs up before the doubloon. Hello, and goes round the other side of the mast. Why, there's a horseshoe nailed on that side. And now he's back again. What does that mean? Hark, he's muttering. Voice like an old worn-out coffee mill. Prick ears and listen. If the white whale be raised, it must be in a month and a day when the sun stands in some one of these signs. I've studied signs and know their marks. They were taught me two score years ago by the old witch in Copenhagen. Now, in what sign will the sun then be? A horseshoe sign, for there it is right opposite the gold. And what's the horseshoe sign? The lion is the horseshoe sign. The roaring, devouring lion. Ship, old ship, my old head shakes to think of thee. There's another rendering now, but still one text. All sorts of men in one kind of world, you see. Dodge again, here comes Queequeg, all tattooing. Looks like the signs of the Zodiac himself. What says the cannibal? As I live, he's comparing notes, looking at his thigh bone. Thinks the sun is in the thigh, or in the calf, or in the bowels, I suppose, as the old women talk surgeon's astronomy in the back country. And by Jove, he's found something there in the vicinity of his thigh. I guess it's Sagittarius, or the archer. No, he don't know what to make of the doubloon. He takes it for an old button off some king's trousers. But aside again, here comes that ghost devil, Fadala. Tail coiled out of sight, as usual. Oakum in the toes of his pumps, as usual. What does he say with that look of his? Ah, uh, only makes a sign to the sign and bows himself. There is a sun on the coin. Fire worshipper, depend upon it. Ho, oh, more and more, this way comes Pip. Poor boy. Would he had died. Or I. He's half horrible to me. He, too, has been watching all of these interpreters, myself included, and look now, he comes to read with that unearthly idiot face. Stand away again and hear him. Hark. I look, you look, he looks. We look, ye look, they look. Upon my soul, he's been studying Murray's grammar. Improving his mind, poor fellow. But what's that he says now, hist? I look, you look, he looks. We look, ye look. They look. Ah, he's getting it by heart. Hissed again. I look, you look, he looks. We look, ye look, they look. Well, that's funny. And I, you, and he, and we, ye, and they are all bats. And I'm a crow. Especially when I stand atop of this pine tree here. Caw, 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 caw. Ain't I a crow? And where's the scarecrow? There he stands, two bones stuck into a pair of old trousers and two more poked into the sleeves of an old jacket. Wonder if he means me. Complimentary. Poor lad. I could go hang myself. Anyway, for the present, I'll quit Pip's vicinity. I can stand the rest, for they have plain wits, but he's too crazy witty for my sanity. So, so, I leave him muttering. Here's the ship's navel, this doubloon here. And they're all on fire to unscrew it. But unscrew your navel, and what's the consequence? Then again, if it stays here, that is ugly too. For when aught's nailed to the mast, it's a sign that things grow desperate. Ha! Ah, ha, ah, old Ahab, the white whale, he'll nail ya. This is a pine tree. My father, an old tall and county, cut down a pine tree once and found a silver ring grown over in it. Some old darkie's wedding ring. How did it get there? And so they'll say in the resurrection when they come to fish up this old mast and find a doubloon lodged in it with bedded oysters for the shaggy bark. Oh, the gold! The precious, precious gold! The green miser will hoard you soon. Hish! Hish! God goes among the world's blackberrying. Cook, ho, cook, and cook us! Jenny! Hey, 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 Jenny! And get your hoe cake done! Chapter 100 Leg and Arm 
The Pequod of Nantucket meets the Samuel Enderby of London. Ship ahoy! Hast seen the white whale? So cried Ahab once more, hailing a ship showing English colors bearing down under the stern. Trumpet to mouth, the old man was standing in his hoisted quarterboat, his ivory leg plainly revealed to the stranger captain, who was carelessly reclining in his own boat's bow. He was a darkly tanned, burly, good-natured, fine-looking man of sixty or thereabouts, dressed in a spacious roundabout that hung round him in festoons of blue pilot cloth, and one empty arm of this jacket streamed behind him like the broidered arm of a hussar's surcoat. Hast seen the white whale? See you this. And withdrawing it from the folds that had hidden it, he held up a white arm of sperm whale bone, terminating in a wooden head like a mallet. Man my boat, cried Ahab impetuously and tossing about the oars near him. Stand by to lower. In less than a minute, without quitting his little craft, he and his crew were dropped to the water and were soon alongside of the stranger. But here a curious difficulty presented itself. In the excitement of the moment, Ahab had forgotten that since the loss of his leg, he had never once stepped on board of any vessel at sea but his own. And then it was always by an ingenious and very handy mechanical contrivance peculiar to the Pequod, and not a thing to be rigged and shipped in any other vessel at a moment's warning. Now, it is no very easy matter for anybody, except those who are almost hourly used to it, like whalemen, to clamber up a ship's side from a boat on the open sea. For the great swells now lift the boat high up toward the bulwarks, and then instantaneously drop it halfway down to the kelson. So deprived of one leg, and the strange ship, of course, being altogether unsupplied with the kindly invention, Ahab now found himself abjectly reduced to a clumsy landsman again, hopelessly eyeing the uncertain, changeful height he could hardly hope to attain. It has before been hinted, perhaps, that every little untoward circumstance that befell him, and which indirectly sprang from his luckless mishap, almost invariably irritated or exasperated Ahab. And in the present instance, all this was heightened by the sight of the two officers of the strange ship leaning over the side by the perpendicular ladder of nailed cleats there and swinging towards him a pair of tastefully ornamented man-ropes. For at first they did not seem to bethink them that a one-legged man must be too much of a cripple to use their sea banisters. But this awkwardness only lasted a minute, because the strange captain, observing at a glance how affairs stood, cried out, I see, I see! A vast heaving there! Jump, boys, and swing over the cutting tackle! As good luck would have it, they had had a whale alongside a day or two previous, and the great tackles were still aloft. And the massive, curved blubber hook, now clean and dry, was still attached to the end. This was quickly lowered to Ahab, who, at once comprehending it all, slid his solitary thigh into the curve of the hook. It was like sitting in the fluke of an anchor or the crotch of an apple tree and then, giving the word, held himself fast and at the same time also helped to hoist his own weight by pulling hand over hand upon one of the running parts of the tackle. Soon he was carefully swung inside the high bulwarks and gently landed upon the capstan head. With his ivory arm frankly thrust forth in welcome, the other captain advanced, and Ahab, putting out his ivory leg and crossing the ivory arm like two swordfish blades, cried out in his walrus way, Aye, aye, hearty, let us shake bones together. An arm and a leg. An arm that never can shrink, do you see, and a leg that never can run. Where didst thou see the white whale? How long ago? The white whale, said the Englishman, pointing his ivory arm towards the east and taking a rueful sight along it, as if it had been a telescope. There I saw him on the line last season. And he took that arm off, did he? asked Ahab, now sliding down from the capstan and resting on the Englishman's shoulder as he did so. Aye, he was the cause of it, at least. And that leg, too. Spin me the yarn, said Ahab. How was it? It was the first time in my life that ever I cruised on the line, began the Englishman. I was ignorant of the white whale at that time. Well, one day we lowered for a pod of four or five whales, and my boat fastened to one of them. A regular circus horse he was, too, that went milling and milling round so that my boat's crew could only trim dish by sitting all their sterns on the outer gunwale. Presently, up breaches from the bottom of the sea, a bouncing great whale with a milky white head and hump, all crow's feet and wrinkles. It was he! It was he! cried Ahab, suddenly letting out his suspended breath. And harpoons sticking in near his starboard fin. Aye! Aye, they were mine! My irons! cried Ahab, exultingly. But on! Give me a chance, then, said the Englishman, good-humouredly. 
Well, this old great-grandfather with the white head and hump runs all a foam into the pod and goes to snapping furiously at my fast line. I, I see, want to depart it, free the fast fish, an old trick I know him. How it was exactly, continued the one-armed commander, I do not know. But in biting the line, it got foul of his teeth, caught there somehow. But we didn't know it then. So that when afterwards we pulled on the line, bounce, we came plump onto his hump, instead of the other whales that went off to windward, all fluking. Seeing how matters stood, and what a noble great whale it was, the noblest and biggest I ever saw, sir, in my life, I resolved to capture him, spite of the boiling rage he seemed to be in. And thinking the haphazard line would get loose, or the tooth that was tangled to my draw, for I have a devil of a boat's crew for a pull on a whale line, seeing all this, I say, I jumped into my first mate's boat, Mr. Mounttop's here, by the way, Captain, Mounttop, Mounttop, the Captain. As I was saying, I jumped into Mounttop's boat, which, you see, was gunnel and gunnel with mine then, and snatching the first harpoon, let this old great-grandfather have it. But, Lord, look you, sir, hearts and souls alive, man. The next instant, in a jiff, I was blind as a bat, both eyes out, all be fogged and be deadened with black foam, the whale's tail looming straight up out of it, perpendicular in the air, like a marble steeple. No use turning all then, but as I was groping at midday with a blinding sun, all crown jewels, as I was groping, I say, after the second iron to toss it overboard, down comes the tail like a lemur tower, cutting my boat in two, leaving each half in splinters, and flukes first, the white hump back through the wreck, as though it was all chips. We all struck out to escape his terrible flailings. I seized hold of my harpoon pole sticking in him, and for a moment clung to that like a sucking fish. But a combing sea dashed me off, and at the same instant the fish, taking one good dart forwards, went down like a flash. And the barb of that cursed second iron, towing along near me, caught me here, clapping his hand just below his shoulder. Yes, caught me just here, I say, and bore me down to hell's flames, I was thinking, when... And all of a sudden, thank the good God, the barb ripped its way along the flesh, clear along the whole length of my arm, came out nigh my wrist, and up I floated. And that gentleman there will tell you the rest. Uh, by the way, Captain, Dr. Bunga, ship surgeon, Bunga, my lad, the captain. Now, Bunga boy, spin your part of the yarn. The professional gentleman, thus familiarly pointed out, had been all the time standing near them with nothing specific visible to denote his gentlemanly rank on board. His face was an exceedingly round but sober one. He was dressed in a faded blue woolen frock or shirt and patched trousers, and had thus far been dividing his attention between a marling spike he held in one hand and a pillbox held in the other, occasionally casting a critical glance at the ivory limbs of the two crippled captains. But at his superior's introduction of him to Ahab, he politely bowed and straightway went on to do his captain's bidding. It was a shocking bad wound, began the whale surgeon, and taking my advice, Captain Boomer here stood our old Sammy... Samuel Enderby is the name of my ship, interrupted the one-armed captain, addressing Ahab. Go on, boy. Stood our old Sammy off to the northward to get out of this blazing hot weather there on the line. But it was no use. I did all I could, sat up with him nights, was very severe with him in the matter of diet. Oh, very severe, chimed in the patient himself, then suddenly altering his voice drinking hot rum toddies with me every night till he couldn't see to put on the bandages and sending me to bed half seas over about three o'clock in the morning. Oh, ye stars! He sat up with me indeed and was very severe in my diet. Oh, a great watcher and very dietetically severe is Dr. Bunga. Bunga, you dog, laugh out, why don't you? You know you're a precious jolly rascal. But heave ahead, boy, I'd rather be killed by you than kept alive by any other man. My captain, you must have ere this perceived, respected sir, said the imperturbable, godly-looking bunger, slightly bowing to Ahab, is apt to be facetious at times. He spins us many clever things of that sort. But I may as well say, en passant, as the French remark, that I myself, that is to say, Jack Bunger, late of the reverend clergy, am a strict total abstinence man. I never drink water! cried the captain. He never drinks it. It's a sort of fit to him. Fresh water throws him into the hydrophobia. But go on, go on with the arm story. Yes, I may as well, said the surgeon coolly. I was about observing, sir, before Captain Boomer's facetious interruption, that spite of my best and severest endeavours, the wound kept getting worse and worse. The truth was, sir, it was as ugly, gaping wound as surgeon ever saw, more than two feet and several inches long. 
I measured it with the lead line. In short, it grew black. I knew it was threatened, and off it came. But I had no hand in shipping that ivory arm there. That thing is against all rule, pointing at it with a marling spike. That is the captain's work, not mine. He ordered the carpenter to make it. He had that club hammer there put to the end to knock someone's brains out with, I suppose. As he tried mine once, he flies into diabolical passions sometimes. Do you see this dent, sir? Removing his hat and brushing aside his hair and exposing a bowl-like cavity in his skull, but which bore not the slightest scarry trace or any token of ever having been a wound. Well, the captain there will tell you how that came here. He knows. No, I don't, said the captain. But his mother did. He was born with it. Oh, you solemn rogue, you... you bunger. Was there ever such another bunger in the watery world? Bunker, when you die, you ought to die in pickle, you dog. You should be preserved to future ages, you rascal. What became of the white whale? Now cried Ahab, who thus far had been impatiently listening to this byplay between the two Englishmen. Oh, cried the one-armed captain. Oh, yes, well, after he sounded, we didn't see him again for some time. In fact, as I before hinted, I didn't then know what whale it was that had served me such a trick till some time afterwards, when coming back to the line we heard about Moby Dick, as some call him, and then I knew it was he. Didst thou cross his wake again? Twice. But could not fasten? Didn't want to try to. Ain't one limb enough? What should I do without this other arm? When I'm thinking Moby Dick doesn't bite so much as he swallows. Well then, interrupted Bunger, Give him your left arm for bait to get the right. Do you know, gentlemen, very gravely and mathematically bowing to each captain in succession, do you know, gentlemen, that the digestive organs of the whale are so inscrutably constructed by divine providence that it is quite impossible for him to completely digest even a man's arm? And he knows it, too. So that what you take for the white whale's malice is only his awkwardness. For he never means to swallow a single limb. He only thinks to terrify by feints. But sometimes he is like the old juggling fellow, formerly a patient of mine in Ceylon, that making believe swallow jackknives once upon a time let one drop into him in good earnest, and there it stayed for a twelvemonth or more. When I gave him an emetic, and he heaved it up in small tacks, do you see? No possible way for him to digest that jackknife, and fully incorporate it into his general bodily system, Yes, Captain Boomer, if you are quick enough about it and have a mind to pawn one arm for the sake of the privilege of giving decent burial to the other, why, in that case, the arm is yours. Only let the whale have another chance at you shortly, that's all. No, thank you, Bunger, said the English captain. He's welcome to the arm he has, since I can't help it and didn't know him then, but not to another one. No more white whales for me. I've lowered for him once, and that has satisfied me. There would be great glory in killing him, I know that and there is a shipload of precious sperm in him, but how okay, he's best let alone. Don't you think so, Captain? Glancing at the ivory leg. He is, but he will still be hunted for all that. What is best let alone, that accursed thing, is not always what least allures. He's all a magnet. How long since thou sawest him last? Which way heading? Bless my soul and curse the foul fiends, cried Bunga, stoopingly walking round Ahab, and like a dog, strangely snuffing. This man's blood, bring the thermometer, is at the boiling point. His pulse makes these planks beat. Sir, taking a lancet from his pocket and drawing near to Ahab's arm. Avast, roared Ahab, dashing him against the bulwarks. Man the boat, which way heading? Good God, cried the English captain, to whom the question was put. What's the matter? He was heading east, I think. Is your captain crazy? Whispering Fadala. But Fadala, putting a finger on his lip, slid over the bulwarks to take the boat's steering oar, and Ahab, swinging the cutting tackle towards him, commanded the ship's sailors to stand by to lower. In a moment he was standing in the boat's stern, and the Manila men were springing to their oars. In vain the English captain hailed him, with back to the stranger ship and face set like a flint to his own. Ahab stood upright till alongside of the Pequod. Chapter 101 The Decanter Ere the English ship fades from sight, be it set down here that she hailed from London and was named after the late Samuel Enderby, merchant of that city, the original of the famous whaling house of Enderby and Sons, a house which in my poor whaleman's opinion comes not far behind the united royal houses of the Tudors and Bourbons 
in point of real historical interest. How long prior to the year of our Lord 1775 this great whaling house was in existence, my numerous fish documents do not make plain. But in that year, 1775, it fitted out the first English ships that ever regularly hunted the sperm whale, though for some score of years previous, ever since 1726, our valiant coffins and macies of Nantucket and the vineyard had in large fleets pursued that leviathan, but only in the North and South Atlantic, not elsewhere. Be it distinctly recorded here that the Nantucketers were the first among mankind to harpoon with civilized steel the great sperm whale, and that for half a century they were the only people of the whole globe who so harpooned him. In 1778, a fine ship, the Amelia, fitted out for the express purpose and at the sole charge of the vigorous Enderbys, boldly rounded Cape Horn and was the first among the nations to lower a whaleboat of any sort in the great South Sea. The voyage was a skillful and lucky one, and returning to her berth with her hold full of the precious sperm, the Amelia's example was soon followed by other ships, English and American, and thus the vast sperm whale grounds of the Pacific were thrown open. But not content with this good deed, the indefatigable house again bestirred itself. Samuel and all his sons, how many their mother only knows, and under their immediate auspices, and partly, I think, at their expense, the British government was induced to send the sloop of war Rattler on a whaling voyage of discovery into the South Sea. Commanded by a naval post captain, the Rattler made a rattling voyage of it and did some service. How much does not appear. But this is not all. In 1819, the same house fitted out a discovery whale ship of their own to go on a testing cruise to the remote waters of Japan. That ship, well called the Siren, made a noble experimental cruise and it was thus that the great Japanese whaling ground first became generally known. The siren in this famous voyage was commanded by a Captain Coffin, a Nantucketer. All honor to the Enderbys, therefore, whose house I think exists to the present day, though doubtless the original Samuel must long ago have slipped his cable for the great South Sea of the other world. The ship named after him was worthy of the honor, being a very fast sailor and a noble craft every way. I boarded her once at midnight somewhere off the Patagonian coast and drank good flip down in the forecastle. It was a fine gam we had, and they were all trumps, every soul on board. A short life to them and a jolly death. And that fine gam I had, long, very long after old Ahab touched her planks with his ivory heel, it minds me of the noble, solid Saxon hospitality of that ship, and may my parson forget me and the devil remember me if I ever lose sight of it. Flip? Did I say we had flip? Yes, and we flipped it at the rate of ten gallons the hour. And when the squall came, for it's squally off there by Patagonia, and all hands, visitors and all, were called to reef topsails, we were so top-heavy that we had to swing each other aloft in bowlins, and we ignorantly furled the skirts of our jackets into the sails, so that we hung there, reefed fast in the howling gale, a warning example to all drunken tars. However, the masts did not go overboard, and by and by we scrambled down, so sober that we had to pass the flip again, though the savage salt spray, bursting down the forecastle scuttle, rather too much diluted and pickled it to my taste. The beef was fine, tough, but with body in it. They said it was bull beef, others that it was dromedary beef, but I do not know for certain how that was. They had dumplings, too, small but substantial, symmetrically globular and indestructible dumplings, I fancied that you could feel them and roll them about in you after they were swallowed. If you stooped over too far forward, you risked their pitching out of you like billiard balls. The bread, but that couldn't be helped. Besides, it was anti-scorbutic. In short, the bread contained the only fresh fare they had. But the forecastle was not very light, and it was very easy to step over into a dark corner when you ate it. But all in all, taking her from truck to helm, considering the dimensions of the cook's boilers, including his own live parchment boilers, fore and aft, I say, the Samuel Enderby was a jolly ship, of good fare and plenty, fine flip and strong, crack fellows all, and capital, from boot heels to hat band. But why was it, think you, that the Samuel Enderby and some other English whalers I know of, not all, though, were such famous, hospitable ships that passed round the beef and the bread and the can and the joke and were not soon weary of eating and drinking and laughing. I will tell you. The abounding good cheer of these English whalers is a matter for historical research. Nor have I been at all sparing of historical whale research when it has seemed needed. 
The English were preceded in the whale fishery by the Hollanders, Zealanders, and Danes, from whom they derived many terms still extant in the fishery, and what is yet more, their fat old fashions touching plenty to eat and drink. For as a general thing, the English merchant ship scrimps her crew, but not so the English whaler. Hence, in the English, this thing of whaling good cheer is not normal and natural, but incidental and particular, and therefore must have some special origin, which is here pointed out and will be still further elucidated. During my researches in the Leviathanic histories, I stumbled upon an ancient Dutch volume, which, by the musty whaling smell of it, I knew must be about whalers. The title was Dan Koopman. Wherefore, I concluded that this must be the invaluable memoirs of some Amsterdam cooper in the fishery, as every whale ship must carry its cooper. I was reinforced in this opinion by seeing that it was the production of one Fitz Swackhammer. But my friend Dr. Snodhead, a very learned man, professor of Low Dutch and High German in the College of Santa Claus and St. Potts, to whom I handed the work for translation, giving him a box of sperm candles for his trouble, this same Dr. Snodhead, so soon as he spied the book, assured me that Dan Koopman did not mean the Cooper, but the Merchant. In short, this ancient and learned Low Dutch book treated of the commerce of Holland, and among other subjects contained a very interesting account of its whale fishery. And in this chapter it was, headed Smear, or Fat, that I found a long, detailed list of the outfits for the larders and cellars of 180 sail of Dutch whalemen from which list, as translated by Dr. Snodhead, I transcribe the following. 400,000 pounds of beef, 60,000 pounds Friesland pork, 150,000 pounds of stock fish, 550,000 pounds of biscuit, 72,000 pounds of soft bread, 2,800 firkins of butter, 20,000 pounds Texel and Leiden cheese, 144,000 pounds cheese, probably an inferior article, 550 ankers of Geneva, 10,800 barrels of beer. Most statistical tables are partially dry in the reading. Not so in the present case, however, where the reader is flooded with whole pipes, barrels, quarts, and gills of good gin and good cheer. At the time, I devoted three days to the studious digesting of all this beer, beef, and bread, during which many profound thoughts were incidentally suggested to me, capable of a transcendental and platonic application. And furthermore, I compiled supplementary tables of my own, touching the probable quantity of stockfish, etc., consumed by every low Dutch harpooner in that ancient Greenland and Spitsbergen whale fishery. In the first place, the amount of butter and Texel and Leiden cheese consumed seems amazing. I imputed, though, to their naturally unctuous natures, being rendered still more unctuous by the nature of their vocation, and especially by their pursuing their game in those frigid polar seas on the very coasts of that Eskimo country where the convivial natives pledge each other in bumpers of train oil. The quantity of beer, too, is very large, 10,800 barrels. Now, as those polar fisheries could only be prosecuted in the short summer of that climate, so that the whole crews of one of these Dutch whalemen, including the short voyage to and from the Spitsbergen Sea, did not much exceed three months, say, and reckoning thirty men to each of their fleet of 180 sail, we have 5,400 low Dutch seamen in all. Therefore, I say, we have precisely two barrels of beer per man for a twelve weeks' allowance, exclusive of his fair proportion of that 550 ankers of gin. Now, whether these gin and beer harpooners, so fuddled as one might fancy them to have been, were the right sort of men to stand up in a boat's head and take good aim at flying whales, this would seem somewhat improbable. Yet they did aim at them, and hit them, too. But this was very far north, be it remembered, where beer agrees well with the Constitution. Upon the equator, in our southern fishery, beer would be apt to make the harpooner sleepy at the masthead and boozy in his boat, and grievous loss might ensue to Nantucket and New Bedford. But no more. Enough has been said to show that the old Dutch whalers of two or three centuries ago were high livers, and that the English whalers have not neglected so excellent an example. For say they, when cruising in an empty ship, if you can get nothing better out of the world, get a good dinner out of it at least. And this empties the decanter. Chapter 102 A Bower in the Arsacides. 
Hitherto, in descriptively treating of the sperm whale, I have chiefly dwelt upon the marvels of his outer aspect, or separately and in detail upon some few interior structural features. But to a large and thorough sweeping comprehension of him, it behoves me now to unbutton him still further, and untrussing the points of his hose, unbuckling his garters, and casting loose the hooks and the eyes of the joints of his innermost bones, set him before you in his ultimatum, that is to say, in his unconditional skeleton. But how now, Ishmael? How is it that you, a mere oarsman in the fishery, pretend to know aught about the subterranean parts of the whale? Did erudite stub, mounted upon your capstan, deliver lectures on the anatomy of the cetacea, and by help of the windlass hold up a specimen rib for exhibition? Explain thyself, Ishmael. Can you land a full-grown whale on your deck for examination as a cook dishes a roast pig? Surely not. A veritable witness have you hitherto been, Ishmael, but have a care how you seize the privilege of Jonah alone, the privilege of discoursing upon the joists and beams, the rafters, ridge poles, sleepers, and underpinnings making up the framework of Leviathan, and belike of the tallow vats, dairy rooms, butteries, and cheeseries in his bowels. I confess that since Jonah few whalemen have penetrated very far beneath the skin of the adult whale. Nevertheless, I have been blessed with an opportunity to dissect him in miniature. In a ship I belonged to, a small cub sperm whale was once bodily hoisted to the deck for his poke or bag to make sheaths for the barbs of the harpoons and for the heads of the lances. Think you I let that chance go without using my boat hatchet and jackknife and breaking the seal in reading all the contents of that young cub? And as for my exact knowledge of the bones of the Leviathan in their gigantic, full-grown development, for that rare knowledge I am indebted to my late royal friend Tranquo, King of Tranquay, one of the Arsacides. For being at Tranquay years ago, when attached to the trading ship Day of Algiers, I was invited to spend part of the Arsacidean holidays with the Lord of Tranquay at his retired palm villa at Pupella, a seaside glen not very far distant from what our sailors called Bamboo Town his capital. Among many other fine qualities, my royal friend Tranquo, being gifted with a devout love for all matters of barbaric vertu, had brought together in Pupella whatever rare things the more ingenious of his people could invent, chiefly carved woods of wonderful devices, chiseled shells, inlaid spears, costly paddles, aromatic canoes, and all those distributed among whatever natural wonders the wonder-freighted tribute-rendering waves had cast upon his shores. Chief among these latter was a great sperm whale, which, after an unusually long raging gale, had been found dead and stranded with his head against a coconut tree, whose plumage-like tufted dropping seemed his verdant jet. When the vast body had at last been stripped of its fathom-deep enfoldings, and the bones become dust-dry in the sun, then the skeleton was carefully transported up the Pupella Glen, where a grand temple of lordly palms now sheltered it. The ribs were hung with trophies, the vertebrae were carved with Arsacidean annals in strange hieroglyphics, in the skull the priests kept up an unextinguished aromatic flame so that the mystic head again sent forth its vapory spout, while suspended from a bow the terrific lower jaw vibrated over all the devotees like the hair-hung sword that so affrighted Damocles. It was a wondrous sight. The wood was green as mosses of the icy glen, the trees stood high and haughty, feeling their living sap. The industrious earth beneath was as a weaver's loom with a gorgeous carpet on it, whereof the ground vine tendrils formed the warp and woof, and the living flowers the figures. All the trees with all their laden branches, all the shrubs and ferns and grasses, the message-carrying air, all these unceasingly were active. Through the lacings of the leaves, the great sun seemed a flying shuttle weaving the unwearied verdure. O oh, busy weaver, unseen weaver, pause, one word. Whither flows the fabric? What palace may it deck? Wherefore all these ceaseless toilings? Speak, weaver, stay thy hand. But one single word with thee, nay. The shuttle flies, the figures float from forth the loom, the freshet rushing carpet forever slides away. The weaver god he weaves, and by that weaving is he deafened, that he hears no mortal voice, and by that humming we too who took on the loom are deafened, and only when we escape it shall we hear the thousand voices that speak through it.
for even so it is in all material factories. The spoken words that are inaudible among the flying spindles, those same words are plainly heard without the walls bursting from the opened casements. Thereby have villainies been detected. Ah, mortal, then, be heedful, for so in all this din of the great world's loom thy subtlest thinkings may be overheard afar. Now amid the green, life-restless loom of that Arsacidean wood, the great, white, worshipped skeleton lay lounging, a gigantic idler. Yet, as the ever-woven, verdant warp and woof intermixed and hummed around him, the mighty idler seemed the cunning weaver, himself all woven over with the vines, every month assuming greener, fresher verdure, but himself a skeleton. Life folded death, death trellised life. The grim god wived with youthful life and begat him curly-headed glories. Now when with royal tranquo I visited this wondrous whale and saw the skull and altar and the artificial smoke ascending from where the real jet had issued, I marveled that the king should regard a chapel as an object of vertu. He laughed. But more I marveled that the priest should swear that smoky jet of his was genuine. To and fro I paced before this skeleton, brushed the vines aside, broke through the ribs, and with a ball of arsacity and twine wandered, eddied long amid its many winding, shaded colonnades and arbors. But soon my line was out, and following it back I emerged from the opening where I entered. I saw no living thing within, naught was there but bones. Cutting me a green measuring rod, I once more dived within the skeleton. From their arrow slit in the skull, the priests perceived me taking the altitude of the final rib. How now? they shouted. Darest thou measure this our god? That's for us. Ay, priests, well, how long do you make him then? But hereupon a fierce contest rose among them concerning feet and inches. They cracked each other's sconces with their yardsticks, the great skull echoed, and seizing that lucky chance, I quickly concluded my own admeasurements. These admeasurements I now propose to set before you. But first be it recorded that in this matter I am not free to utter any fancied measurement I please, because there are skeleton authorities you can refer to to test my accuracy. There is a Leviathanic Museum, they tell me, in Hull, England, one of the whaling ports of that country, where they have some fine specimens of finbacks and other whales. Likewise, I have heard that in the Museum of Manchester in New Hampshire they have what the proprietors call the only perfect specimen of a Greenland or river whale in the United States. Moreover, at a place in Yorkshire, England, Burton Constable by name, a certain Sir Clifford Constable has in his possession the skeleton of a sperm whale, but of moderate size, by no means of the full-grown magnitude of my friend King Tranquo's. In both cases, the stranded whales to which these two skeletons belonged were originally claimed by their proprietors upon similar grounds. King Tranquo seizing his because he wanted it, and Sir Clifford because he was lord of the seigneuries of those parts. Sir Clifford's whale has been articulated throughout, so that like a great chest of drawers you can open and shut him in all his bony cavities, spread out his ribs like a gigantic fan, and swing all day upon his lower jaw. Locks are to be put on some of his trap doors and shutters, and a footman will show round future visitors with a bunch of keys at his side. Sir Clifford thinks of charging tuppence for a peep at the whispering gallery in the spinal column, threepence to hear the echo in the hollow of his cerebellum, and sixpence for the unrivaled view from his forehead. The skeleton dimensions I shall now proceed to set down are copied verbatim from my right arm where I had them tattooed. As in my wild wanderings at that period, there was no other secure way of preserving such valuable statistics. But as I was crowded for space, and wished the other parts of my body to remain a blank page for a poem I was then composing, at least what untattooed parts might remain, I did not trouble myself with the odd inches, nor indeed should inches at all enter into a congenial admeasurement of the whale. Chapter 103. Measurement of the Whale's Skeleton. In the first place, I wish to lay before you a particular plain statement touching the living bulk of this leviathan, whose skeleton we are briefly to exhibit. Such a statement may prove useful here. According to a careful calculation I have made, and which I partly base upon Captain Scoresby's estimate of 70 tons for the largest-sized Greenland whale of 60 feet in length. According to my careful calculation, I say, a sperm whale of the largest magnitude, between 85 and 90 feet in length, 
and something less than 40 feet in its fullest circumference, such a whale will weigh at least 90 tons, so that, reckoning 13 men to a ton, he would considerably outweigh the combined population of a whole village of 1,100 inhabitants. Think you not, then, that brains like yoked cattle should be put to this leviathan, to make him at all budge to any landsman's imagination? Having already, in various ways, put before you his skull, spout hole, jaw, teeth, tail, forehead, fins, and diverse other parts, I shall now simply point out what is most interesting in the general bulk of his unobstructed bones. But as the colossal skull embraces so very large a proportion of the entire extent of the skeleton, as it is by far the most complicated part, and as nothing is to be repeated concerning it in this chapter, you must not fail to carry it in your mind, or under your arm, as we proceed, otherwise you will not gain a complete notion of the general structure we are about to view. In length, the sperm whale's skeleton at Trankway measured 72 feet, so that when fully invested and extended in life, he must have been 90 feet long, for in the whale the skeleton loses about one-fifth in length compared with the living body. Of this 72 feet, his skull and jaw comprised some 20 feet, leaving some 50 feet of plain backbone. Attached to this backbone, for something less than a third of its length, was the mighty circular basket of ribs which once enclosed his vitals. To me, this vast ivory rib chest with a long, unrelieved spine extending far away from it in a straight line not a little resembled the embryo hull of a great ship new laid upon the stocks when only some twenty of her naked bow ribs are inserted and the keel is otherwise for the time but a long, disconnected timber. The ribs were ten on a side. The first, to begin from the neck, was nearly six feet long. The second, third, and fourth were each successively longer till you came to the climax of the fifth, or one of the middle ribs, which measured eight feet and some inches. From that part, the remaining ribs diminished till the tenth and last only spanned five feet and some inches. In general thickness, they all bore a seemly correspondence to their length. The middle ribs were the most arched. In some of the Arsacides, they are used for beams whereon to lay footpath bridges over small streams. In considering these ribs, I could not but be struck anew with the circumstance so variously repeated in this book that the skeleton of the whale is by no means the mould of his invested form. The largest of the Tranquay ribs, one of the middle ones, occupied that part of the fish which in life is greatest in depth. Now the greatest depth of the invested body of this particular whale must have been at least sixteen feet, whereas the corresponding rib measured but little more than eight feet so that this rib only conveyed half of the true notion of the living magnitude of that part. Besides, for some way, where I now saw but a naked spine, all that had been once wrapped round with tons of added bulk in flesh, muscle, blood, and bowels. Still more, for the ample fins I here saw but a few disordered joints, and in place of the weighty and majestic but boneless flukes, an utter blank. How vain and foolish, then, thought I, for timid, untraveled man to try to comprehend aright this wondrous whale by merely poring over his dead, attenuated skeleton stretched in this peaceful wood. No, only in the heart of quickest perils, only when within the eddyings of his angry flukes, only on the profound, unbounded sea, can the fully invested whale be truly and livingly found out. But the spine, for that... The best way we consider it is with a crane to pile its bones high up on end. No speedy enterprise. But now it's done, it looks much like Pompey's pillar. There are forty and odd vertebrae in all, which in the skeleton are not locked together. They mostly lie like the great knobbed blocks on a Gothic spire, forming solid courses of heavy masonry. The largest, a middle one, is in width something less than three feet, and in depth more than four. The smallest, where the spine tapers away into the tail, is only two inches in width and looks something like a white billiard ball. I was told that there were still smaller ones, but they had been lost by some little cannibal urchins, the priest's children, who had stolen them to play marbles with. Thus we see how that the spine of even the hugest of living things tapers off at last into simple child's play. Chapter 104. The Fossil Whale. From his mighty bulk, the whale affords a most congenial theme whereon to enlarge, amplify, and generally expatiate. Would you, you could not compress him. 
By good rights, he should only be treated of in imperial folio. Not to tell over again his furlongs from spiracle to tail and the yards he measures about the waist, only think of the gigantic involutions of his intestines, where they lie in him like great cables and hawsers coiled away in the subterranean orlop deck of a line-of-battle ship. Since I have undertaken to manhandle this leviathan, it behoves me to approve myself omnisciently exhaustive in the enterprise, not overlooking the minutest seminal germs of his blood and spinning him out to the uttermost coil of his bowels. Having already described him in most of his present habitatory and anatomical peculiarities, it now remains to magnify him in an archaeological, fossiliferous, and antediluvian point of view. Apply to any other creature than the leviathan, to an ant or a flea, such portly terms might justly be deemed unwarrantably grandiloquent. But when leviathan is the text, the case is altered. Fain am I to stagger to this emprise under the weightiest words of the dictionary, and here be it said that whenever it has been convenient to consult one in the course of these dissertations, I have invariably used a huge quarto edition of Johnson, expressly purchased for that purpose, because that famous lexicographer's uncommon personal bulk more fitted him to compile a lexicon to be used by a whale author like me. One often hears of writers that rise and swell with their subject, though it may seem but an ordinary one. How then with me, writing of this leviathan? Unconsciously my chirography expands into placard capitals. Give me a condor's quill, give me Vesuvius crater for an inkstand. Friends, hold my arms! For in the mere act of penning my thoughts of this leviathan, they weary me and make me faint with their outreaching comprehensiveness of sweep, as if to include the whole circle of the sciences and all the generations of whales and men and mastodons, past, present, and to come, with all the revolving panoramas of empire on earth and throughout the whole universe not excluding its suburbs. Such and so magnifying is the virtue of a large and liberal theme. We expand to its bulk. To produce a mighty book, you must choose a mighty theme. No great and enduring volume can ever be written on the flea, though many there be who have tried it. Ere entering upon the subject of fossil whales, I present my credentials as a geologist by stating that in my miscellaneous time I have been a stonemason and also a great digger of ditches, canals, and wells, wine vaults, cellars, and cisterns of all sorts. Likewise, by way of preliminary, I desire to remind the reader that while in the earlier geological strata there are found the fossils of monsters now almost completely extinct, the subsequent relics discovered in what are called the tertiary formations seem the connecting or at any rate intercepted links between the antichronical creatures and those whose remote posterity are said to have entered the ark. All the fossil whales hitherto discovered belong to the tertiary period, which is the last preceding the superficial formations, and though none of them precisely answer to any known species of the present time, they are yet sufficiently akin to them in general respects to justify their taking rank as cetacean fossils. Detached broken fossils of pre-Adamite whales, fragments of their bones and skeletons, have, within thirty years past at various intervals, been found at the base of the Alps, in Lombardy, in France, in England, in Scotland, and in the states of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Among the more curious of such remains is part of a skull, which in the year 1779 was disinterred in the Rue Dauphine in Paris, a short street opening almost directly upon the palace of the Tuileries, and bones disinterred in excavating the great docks of Antwerp in Napoleon's time. Cuvier pronounced these fragments to have belonged to some utterly unknown leviathanic species. But by far the most wonderful of all cetacean relics was the almost complete vast skeleton of an extinct monster found in the year 1842 on the plantation of Judge Krieg in Alabama. The awe-stricken, credulous slaves in the vicinity took it for the bones of one of the fallen angels. The Alabama doctors declared it a huge reptile and bestowed upon it the name of Bacillosaurus. But some specimen bones of it being taken across the sea to Owen, the English anatomist, it turned out that this alleged reptile was a whale, though of a departed species. A significant illustration of the fact, again and again repeated in this book, that the skeleton of the whale furnishes but little clue to the shape of his fully invested body. So Owen rechristened the monster Zuglodon, 
and in his paper, read before the London Geological Society, pronounced it in substance one of the most extraordinary creatures which the mutations of the globe have blotted out of existence. When I stand among these mighty leviathan skeletons, skulls, tusks, jaws, ribs, and vertebrae, all characterized by partial resemblances to the existing breeds of sea monsters, but at the same time bearing on the other hand similar affinities to the annihilated antichronicle leviathans, their incalculable seniors, I am by a flood borne back to that wondrous period ere time itself can be said to have begun, for time began with man. Here Saturn's grey chaos rolls over me, and I obtain dim, shuddering glimpses into those polar eternities when wedged bastions of ice pressed hard upon what are now the tropics. And in all the twenty-five thousand miles of this world's circumference not an inhabitable hand's breadth of land was visible. Then the whole world was the whales, and, king of creation, he left his wake along the present lines of the Andes and the Himalayas. Who can show a pedigree like Leviathan? Ahab's harpoon had shed older blood than the pharaohs. Methuselah seems a schoolboy. I look round to shake hands with Shem. I am horror-struck at this anti-mosaic, unsourced existence of the unspeakable terrors of the whale, which, having been before all time, must needs exist after all humane ages are over. But not alone has this leviathan left his pre-Adamite traces in the stereotype plates of nature and in limestone and marl bequeathed his ancient bust, but upon Egyptian tablets, whose antiquity seems to claim for them an almost fossiliferous character, we find the unmistakable print of his fin. In an apartment of the great temple of Dendera, some fifty years ago, there was discovered upon the granite ceiling a sculptured and painted planisphere, abounding in centaurs, griffins, and dolphins, similar to the grotesque figures on the celestial globe of the moderns. Gliding among them, old leviathan swam as of yore, was there swimming in that planisphere centuries before Solomon was cradled. Nor must there be omitted another strange attestation of the antiquity of the whale in his own osseous post-diluvian reality as set down by the venerable John Leo, the old Barbary traveller. Not far from the seaside they have a temple, the rafters and beams of which are made of whale bones, for whales of a monstrous size are oftentimes cast up dead upon that shore. The common people imagine that by a secret power bestowed by God upon the temple, no whale can pass it without immediate death. But the truth of the matter is that on either side of the temple there are rocks that shoot two miles into the sea and wound the whales when they light upon them. They keep a whale's rib of incredible length for a miracle, which lying upon the ground with its convex part uppermost makes an arch, the head of which cannot be reached by a man upon a camel's back. This rib, says John Leo, is said to have lain there a hundred years before I saw it. Their historians affirm that a prophet who prophesied of Mahomet came from this temple, and some do not stand to assert that the prophet Jonas was cast forth by the whale at the base of the temple. In this Afric temple of the whale I leave you, reader, and if you be a Nantucketer and a whaleman, you will silently worship there. Chapter 105. Does the whale's magnitude diminish? Will he perish? Inasmuch, then, as this leviathan comes floundering down upon us from the headwaters of the eternities, it may be fitly inquired whether in the long course of his generations he has not degenerated from the original bulk of his sires. But upon investigation we find that not only are the whales of the present day superior in magnitude to those whose fossil remains are found in the tertiary system, embracing a distinct geological period prior to man, but of the whales found in that tertiary system, those belonging to its latter formations exceed in size those of its earlier ones. Of all the pre-Adamite whales yet exhumed, by far the largest is the Alabama one mentioned in the last chapter, and that was less than seventy feet in length in the skeleton whereas we have already seen that the tape measure gives 72 feet for the skeleton of a large-sized modern whale. And I have heard on Whaleman's authority that sperm whales have been captured near a hundred feet long at the time of capture. 
But may it not be that while the whales of the present hour are in advance in magnitude upon those of all previous geological periods, may it not be that since Adam's time they have degenerated? Assuredly, we must conclude so, if we are to credit the accounts of such gentlemen as Pliny and the ancient naturalists generally. For Pliny tells us of whales that embraced acres of living bulk, and Aldrovandus of others which measured 800 feet in length, rope walks and Thames tunnels of whales, and even in the days of Banks and Solander, Cook's naturalists, we find a Danish member of the Academy of Sciences setting down certain Iceland whales, Radan Siskur, or wrinkled bellies, at 120 yards, that is 360 feet, and Lasseped, the French naturalist, in his elaborate history of whales in the very beginning of his work, page 3, sets down the right whale at 100 meters, 328 feet. And this work was published so late as A.D. 1825. But will any whale man believe these stories? No. The whale of today is as big as his ancestors in Pliny's time. And if ever I go where Pliny is, I, a whaleman more than he was, will make bold to tell him so. Because I cannot understand how it is that while the Egyptian mummies that were buried thousands of years before even Pliny was born do not measure so much in their coffins as a modern Kentuckian in his socks, and while the cattle and other animals sculptured on the oldest Egyptian and Nineveh tablets by the relative proportions in which they are drawn just as plainly prove that the high-bred, stall-fed, prize cattle of Smithfield not only equal but far exceed in magnitude the fattest of Pharaoh's fat kine, in the face of all this, I will not admit that of all animals the whale alone should have degenerated. But still another inquiry remains, one often agitated by the more recondite Nantucketers. Whether owing to the almost omniscient lookouts at the mastheads of the whale ships now penetrating even through Bering Straits and into the remotest secret drawers and lockers of the world and the thousand harpoons and lances darted along all continental coasts, the moot point is whether Leviathan can long endure so wide a chase and so remorseless a havoc, whether he must not at last be exterminated from the waters and the last whale, like the last man, smoke his last pipe and then himself evaporate in the final puff. Comparing the humped herds of whales with the humped herds of buffalo, which not forty years ago overspread by tens of thousands the prairies of Illinois and Missouri, and shook their iron manes and scowled with their thunder-clotted brows upon the sites of populous river capitals, where now the polite broker sells you land at a dollar an inch, in such a comparison an irresistible argument would seem furnished to show that the hunted whale cannot now escape speedy extinction. But you must look at this matter in every light. Though so short a period ago, not a good lifetime, the census of the buffalo in Illinois exceeded the census of men now in London, and though at the present day not one horn or hoof of them remains in all that region, and though the cause of this wondrous extermination was the spear of man, yet the far different nature of the whale hunt peremptorily forbids so inglorious an end to the Leviathan. Forty men in one ship hunting the sperm whale for forty-eight months think they have done extremely well and thank God if at last they carry home the oil of forty fish. Whereas in the days of the old Canadian and Indian hunters and trappers of the West, when the far West, in whose sunset suns still rise, was a wilderness and a virgin, the same number of moccasin men for the same number of months mounted on horse instead of sailing in ships, would have slain not forty, but forty thousand and more buffaloes, a fact that, if need were, could be statistically stated. Nor, considered aright, does it seem any argument in favor of the gradual extinction of the sperm whale, for example, that in former years, the latter part of the last century, say, these leviathans in small pods were encountered much oftener than at present, and in consequence the voyages were not so prolonged and were also much more remunerative. Because, as has been elsewhere noticed, those whales, influenced by some views to safety, now swim the seas in immense caravans, so that to a large degree the scattered solitaries, yokes and pods and schools of other days are now aggregated into vast but widely separated unfrequent armies. That is all. And equally fallacious seems the conceit that because the so-called whalebone whales no longer haunt many grounds in former years abounding with them, hence that species also is declining. For they are only being driven from promontory to cape, and if one coast is no longer enlivened with their jets, 
Then be sure some other and remoter strand has been very recently startled by the unfamiliar spectacle. Furthermore, concerning these last-mentioned leviathans, they have two firm fortresses, which in all human probability will forever remain impregnable. And as upon the invasion of their valleys the frosty Swiss have retreated to their mountains, so hunted from the savannas and glades of the Middle Seas, the whalebone whales can at last resort to their polar citadels, and diving under the ultimate glassy barriers and walls there, come up among icy fields and flows, and in a charmed circle of everlasting December bid defiance to all pursuit from man. But as perhaps fifty of these whalebone whales are harpooned for one cachalot, some philosophers of the forecastle have concluded that this positive havoc has already very seriously diminished their battalions. But though for some time past a number of these whales, not less than 13,000, have been annually slain on the Norwest coast by the Americans alone, yet there are considerations which render even this circumstance of little or no account as an opposing argument in this matter. Natural as it is to be somewhat incredulous concerning the populousness of the more enormous creatures of the globe, yet what shall we say to Harto, the historian of Goa, when he tells us that at one hunting the king of Siam took four thousand elephants, that in those regions elephants are numerous as droves of cattle in the temperate climes. And there seems no reason to doubt that if these elephants, which have now been hunted for thousands of years by Semiramis, by Porus, by Hannibal, and by all the successive monarchs of the East, if they still survive there in great numbers, much more may the great whale outlast all hunting, since he has a pasture to expatiate in which is precisely twice as large as all Asia, both Americas, Europe and Africa, New Holland, and all the isles of the sea combined. Moreover, we are to consider that from the presumed great longevity of whales, they are probably attaining the age of a century and more, therefore at any one period of time several distinct adult generations must be contemporary. And what that is, we may soon gain some idea of by imagining all the graveyard cemeteries and family vaults of creation yielding up the live bodies of all the men, women, and children who were alive 75 years ago, and adding this countless host to the present human population of the globe. Wherefore, for all these things, we account the whale immortal in his species, however perishable in his individuality. He swam the seas before the continents broke water. He once swam over the site of the Tuileries and Windsor Castle and the Kremlin. In Noah's flood he despised Noah's Ark. And if ever the world is to be again flooded like the Netherlands to kill off its rats, then the eternal whale will still survive, and rearing upon the topmost crest of the equatorial flood, spout his froth defiance to the skies. Chapter 106 Ahab's Leg The precipitating manner in which Captain Ahab had quitted the Samuel Enderby of London had not been unattended with some small violence to his own person. He had lighted with such energy upon a thwart of his boat that his ivory leg had received a half-splintering shock, and when after gaining his own deck in his own pivot hole there he so vehemently wheeled round with an urgent command to the steersman it was as ever something about his not steering inflexibly enough then the already shaken ivory received such an additional twist and wrench that though it still remained entire and to all appearances lusty yet ahab did not deem it entirely trustworthy and, indeed, it seemed small matter for wonder that for all his pervading mad recklessness, Ahab did at times give careful heed to the condition of that dead bone upon which he partly stood. For it had not been very long prior to the Pequot sailing from Nantucket that he had been found one night lying prone upon the ground and insensible by some unknown and seemingly inexplicable, unimaginable casualty, his ivory limb having been so violently displaced that it had stake-wise smitten and all but pierced his groin. Nor was it without extreme difficulty that the agonizing wound was entirely cured. Nor at the time had it failed to enter his monomaniac mind that all the anguish of that then present suffering was but the direct issue of a former woe, and he too plainly seemed to see that as the most poisonous reptile of the marsh perpetuates his kind as inevitably as the sweetest songster of the grove, so equally with every felicity all miserable events do naturally beget their like. 
Yea, more than equally, thought Ahab, since both the ancestry and posterity of grief go further than the ancestry and posterity of joy. For not to hint of this, that it is an inference from certain canonic teachings that while some natural enjoyments here shall have no children born to them for the other world, but on the contrary shall be followed by the joy childlessness of all hell's despair, whereas some guilty mortal misery shall still fertilely beget to themselves an eternally progressive progeny of griefs beyond the grave, not at all to hint of this, there still seems an inequality in the deeper analysis of the thing. For, thought Ahab, while even the highest earthly felicities ever have a certain unsignifying pettiness lurking in them, but at bottom all heart woes a mystic significance, and in some men an archangelic grandeur, so do their diligent tracings out not belie the obvious deduction. To trail the genealogies of these high mortal miseries carries us at last among the sourceless primogenitures of the gods, so that in the face of all the glad haymaking suns and soft cymbling round harvest moons, we must needs give in to this, that the gods themselves are not forever glad. The ineffaceable, sad birthmark in the brow of man is but the stamp of sorrow in the signers. Unwittingly here a secret has been divulged, which perhaps might more properly in set way have been disclosed before. With many other particulars concerning Ahab, always had it remained a mystery to some why it was that for a certain period, both before and after the sailing of the Pequod, he had hidden himself away with such Grand Lama-like exclusiveness and for that one interval sought speechless refuge, as it were, among the marble senate of the dead. Captain Peleg's brooded reason for this thing appeared by no means adequate, though indeed, as touching all Ahab's deeper part, every revelation partook more of significant darkness than of explanatory light. But in the end it all came out. This one matter did, at least. That direful mishap was at the bottom of his temporary recluseness. And not only this, but to that ever-contracting, dropping circle ashore, who for any reason possessed the privilege of a less banned approach to him, to that timid circle, the above-hinted casualty, remaining as it did moodily unaccounted for by Ahab, invested itself with terrors not entirely underived from the land of spirits and of whales, so that through their zeal for him they had all conspired, so far as in them lay, to muffle up the knowledge of this thing from others. And hence it was that not till a considerable interval had elapsed did it transpire upon the Pequod's decks. But be all this as it may, let the unseen, ambiguous synod in the air or the vindictive princes and potentates of fire have to do or not with earthly Ahab. Yet in this present matter of his leg he took plain practical procedures. He called the carpenter. And when that functionary appeared before him, he bade him without delay set about making a new leg, and directed the mates to see him supplied with all the studs and joists of jaw ivory sperm whale, which had thus far been accumulated on the voyage, in order that a careful selection of the stoutest, clearest grain stuff might be secured. This done, the carpenter received orders to have the leg completed that night, and to provide all the fittings for it independent of those pertaining to the distrusted one in use. Moreover, the ship's forge was ordered to be hoisted out of its temporary idleness in the hold, and to accelerate the affair, the blacksmith was commanded to proceed at once to the forging of whatever iron contrivances might be needed. Chapter 107 The Carpenter Seat thyself sultanically among the moons of Saturn, and take high abstracted man alone. And he seems a wonder, a grandeur, and a woe. But from the same point take mankind in mass, and for the most part they seem a mob of unnecessary duplicates, both contemporary and hereditary. But most humble though he was, and far from furnishing an example of the high humane abstraction, the Pequod's carpenter was no duplicate. Hence he now comes in person on this stage. Like all seagoing ship carpenters, and more especially those belonging to whaling vessels, he was, to a certain off-handed practical extent, alike experienced in numerous trades and callings collateral to his own. The carpenter's pursuit being the ancient and outbranching trunk of all those numerous handicrafts which more or less have to do with wood as an auxiliary material. But besides the application to him of the generic remark above, 
This carpenter of the Pequod was singularly efficient in those thousand nameless mechanical emergencies continually recurring in a large ship upon a three or four years' voyage in uncivilized and far distant seas. For not to speak of his readiness in ordinary duties, repairing stove boats, sprung spars, reforming the shape of clumsy bladed oars, inserting bull's-eyes in the deck or new tree nails in the side planks and other miscellaneous matters more directly pertaining to his special business, he was moreover unhesitatingly expert in all manner of conflicting aptitudes, both useful and capricious. The one grand stage where he enacted all his various parts so manifold was his vice bench, a long, rude, ponderous table furnished with several vices of different sizes, and both of iron and of wood. At all times, except when whales were alongside, this bench was securely lashed athwart ships against the rear of the triworks. A belaying pin is found too large to be easily inserted into its hole. The carpenter claps it into one of his ever-ready vices and straightway files it smaller. A lost land bird of strange plumage strays on board and is made a captive. Out of clean shaved rods of right whale bone and crossbeams of sperm whale ivory, the carpenter makes a pagoda looking cage for it. An oarsman sprains his wrist, the carpenter concocts a soothing lotion. Stubb longs for vermilion stars to be painted upon the blade of his every oar. Screwing each oar in his big vice of wood, the carpenter symmetrically supplies the constellation. A sailor takes a fancy to wear shark bone earrings. The carpenter drills his ears. Another has the toothache. The carpenter out pincers and clapping one hand upon his bench bids him be seated there. But the poor fellow unmanageably winces under the unconcluded operation. Whirling round the handle of his wooden vice, the carpenter signs him to clap his jaw in that if he would have him draw the tooth. Thus, this carpenter was prepared at all points, and alike indifferent and without respect in all. Teeth he accounted bits of ivory, heads he deemed but top blocks, men themselves he lightly held for capstans. But while now, upon so wide a field, thus variously accomplished, and with such liveliness of expertness in him too, all this would seem to argue some uncommon vivacity of intelligence. But not precisely so. For nothing was this man more remarkable than for a certain impersonal stolidity, as it were. Impersonal, I say, for it so shaded off into the surrounding infinite of things that it seemed one with the general stolidity discernible in the whole visible world, which, while pauselessly active in uncounted modes, still eternally holds its peace and ignores you, though you dig foundations for cathedrals. Yet was this half-horrible stolidity in him involving, too, as it appeared, an all-ramifying heartlessness. Yet was it oddly dashed at times with an old, crutch-like, antediluvian, wheezing humorousness, not unstreaked now and then with a certain grizzled wittiness, such as might have served to pass the time during the midnight watch on the bearded forecastle of Noah's Ark. Was it that this old carpenter had been a lifelong wanderer whose much rolling to and fro not only had gathered no moss, but what is more had rubbed off whatever small outward clingings might have originally pertained to him? He was a stripped abstract, an unfractioned integral, uncompromised as a newborn babe, living without premeditated reference to this world or the next. You might almost say that this strange uncompromisedness of him involved a sort of unintelligence. For in his numerous trades he did not seem to work so much by reason, or by instinct, or simply because he had been tutored to it, or by any intermixture of all these, even or uneven, but merely by a kind of deaf and dumb, spontaneous, literal process. He was a pure manipulator. His brain, if he had ever had one, must have early oozed along into the muscles of his fingers. He was like one of those unreasoning but still highly useful multum in parvo, Sheffield contrivances, assuming the exterior, though a little swelled, of a common pocket knife, but containing not only blades of various sizes, but also screwdrivers, corkscrews, tweezers, awls, pens, rulers, nail filers, countersinkers. So if his superiors wanted to use the carpenter for a screwdriver, all they had to do was open that part of him and the screw was fast. Or if for tweezers, take him up by the legs, and there they were. Yet, as previously hinted, this omni-tooled, open-and-shut carpenter was, after all, no mere machine of an automaton. If he did not have a common soul in him, he had a subtle something that, somehow anomalously, did its duty. 
What that was, whether essence of quicksilver or a few drops of hartshorn, there is no telling. But there it was, and there it had abided for now some sixty years or more. And this it was, this same unaccountable, cunning life principle in him, this it was that kept him a great part of the time soliloquizing, but only like an unreasoning wheel, which also hummingly soliloquizes, or rather, his body was a sentry box, and this soliloquizer on guard there, and talking all the time to keep himself awake. Chapter 108 Ahab and the Carpenter, the deck, first night watch. Carpenter standing before his vice bench and by the light of two lanterns busily filing the ivory joist for the leg, which joist is firmly fixed in the vice. Slabs of ivory, leather straps, pads, screws, and various tools of all sorts lying about the bench. Forward the red flame of the forge is seen where the blacksmith is at work. Drat the file and drat the bone. That is hard which should be soft, and that is soft which should be hard. So here we go, who file old jaws and shin bones. Let's try another. I now, this works better, sneezes. Hello, this bone dust is sneezes. Why, it's sneezes. Yes, it's sneezes. Bless my soul, it won't let me speak. This is what an old fella gets now for working in dead lumber. Saw a live tree and you don't get this dust. Amputate a live bone and you don't get it, sneezes. Come, come, you old smut there, bear a hand, and let's have that ferrule and buckle screw. I'll be ready for him presently. Lucky now, sneezes. There's no knee joint to make. That might puzzle a little, but a mere shin bone. Why, it's as easy as making hot poles. Only I should like to put a good finish on. Time, time. If I but had the time, I could turn him out as neat a leg now as ever, sneezes, scrape to a lady in a parlor. Those buckskin legs and calves of legs I've seen in shop windows wouldn't compare at all. They soak water, they do, and of course get rheumatic and have to be doctored, sneezes, with washes and lotions, just like live legs. There, before I saw it off now, I must call his old mogul ship and see whether the length will be all right. Too short, if anything, I guess. Ah, that's the heel. We are in luck. Here he comes. Or it's somebody else, that's certain. Ahab, advancing. During the ensuing scene, the carpenter continues sneezing at times. Well, man-maker? Uh, just in time, sir. If the captain pleases, I will now mark the length. Uh, let me measure, sir. Measured for a leg. Good. Well, it's not the first time. About it. There, keep thy finger on it. This is a cogent vice thou hast here, carpenter. Let me feel its grip once. So? So it does pinch some. Oh, sir, it will break bones. Beware, beware. No fear, I like a good grip. I like to feel something in this slippery world that can hold, man. What's Prometheus about there? The blacksmith, I mean. What's he about? He must be forging the buckle screw now, sir. Right. It's a partnership. He supplies the muscle part. He makes a fierce red flame there. Aye, sir. He must have the white heat for this kind of fine work. Hmm, so he must. I do deem it now a most meaning thing that that old Greek Prometheus who made men, they say, should have been a blacksmith and animated them with fire. For what's made in fire must properly belong to fire, and so hell's probable. How the soot flies! This must be the remainder the Greek made the Africans of. Carpenter, when he's through with that buckle, tell him to forge a pair of steel shoulder blades. There's a peddler aboard with a crushing pack. Sir? Hold. While Prometheus is about it, I'll order a complete man after a desirable pattern. Imprimis. Fifty feet high in his socks. Then chest modeled after the Thames Tunnel. Then legs with roots to him to stay in one place. Then arms three feet through the wrist. No heart at all. Brass forehead and about a quarter of an acre of fine brains. And let me see. Shall I order eyes to see outwards? No, but put a skylight on top of his head to illuminate inwards. There, take the order and away. What's he speaking about? And who's he speaking to, I should like to know. Shall I keep standing here? Tis but indifferent architecture to make a blind dome. Here's one. No, 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 I must have a lantern. Ho, oh, oh, ho, that's it, hey? Uh, here are two, sir. One will serve my turn. What art thou thrusting that thief-catcher into my face for, man? Thrusted light is worse than presented pistols. I thought, sir, that you spoke to Carpenter. Carpenter? Why, that's... But no. 
A very tidy and, I may say, an extremely gentlemanlike sort of business thou art in here, Carpenter. Or wouldst thou rather work in clay? Uh, sir? Clay? Uh, clay, sir? That's mud. We leave clay to ditches, sir. The fellow's impious. What art thou sneezing about? B bone is rather dusty, sir. Take the hint, then. And when thou art dead, never bury thyself under living people's noses. Sir? Oh, ah, I guess so. Yes. Oh, dear. Look, you carpenter, I dare say thou callest thyself a right good workman like workman, eh? Well, then, will it speak thoroughly well for thy work if, when I come to mount this leg thou makest, I shall nevertheless feel another leg in the same identical place with it? That is, carpenter, my old lost leg, the flesh and blood one, I mean. Canst thou not drive that old Adam away? Uh, truly, sir, I begin to understand somewhat now. Yes, I've heard something curious on that score, sir. How that a dismasted man never entirely loses the feeling of his old spar, but it will still be pricking him at times. And may I humbly ask if it be really so, sir? It is, man. Look, put thy live leg here in the place where mine once was. So, now, here is only one distinct leg to the eye, yet two to the soul. Where thou feelest tingling life, there, exactly there, there to a hair, do I. Is the riddle? I should humbly call it a poser, sir. Hist, then. How dost thou know that some entire, living, thinking thing may not be invisibly and uninterpenetratingly standing precisely where thou standest? Aye, and standing there in thy spite, in thy most solitary hours, then dost thou not fear eavesdroppers? Hold, don't speak. And if I still feel the smart of my crushed leg, though it be now so long dissolved, then why mayest not thou, Carpenter, feel the fiery pains of hell forever and without a body? Ha! Good Lord! Truly, sir, if it comes to that, I must calculate over again. I think I didn't carry a small figure, sir. Look here, pudding head should never grant premises. How long before the leg is done? Perhaps an hour, sir. Bungle away at it, then, and bring it to me turns to go. Oh, life! Here I am, proud as a Greek god, and yet standing debtor to this blockhead for a bone to stand on. Cursed be that mortal inter-indebtedness which will not do away with ledgers. I would be as free as air, and I'm down in the whole world's books. I am so rich I could have given bid for bid with the wealthiest Praetorians at the auction of the Roman Empire, which was the world's, and yet I owe for the flesh in the tongue I brag with. By heavens! I'll get a crucible and into it, and dissolve myself down to one small compendious vertebra. So... Carpenter, resuming his work. Well, well, well. Stubb knows him best of all, and Stubb always says he's queer. Says nothing but that one sufficient little word, queer. He's queer, says Stubb. He's queer. Queer, queer. And keeps dinning it into Mr. Starbuck all the time. Queer, sir. Queer, queer. Very queer. And here's his leg. Yes, now that I think of it, here's his bedfellow. Has a stick of a whale's jawbone for a wife. And this is his leg. He'll stand on this. What was that now about one leg standing in three places and all three places standing in one hell? How was that? Oh, I don't wonder he looked so scornful at me. I'm a sort of strange thoughted sometimes, they say, but that's only haphazard-like. Then a short little old body like me should never undertake to wade out into deep waters with tall, heron-built captains. The water chucked you under the chin pretty quick, and there's a great cry for lifeboats. And here's the heron's leg, long and slim, sure enough. Now, for most folks, one pair of legs lasts a lifetime, and that must be because they use them mercifully as a tender-hearted old lady uses her roly-poly old coach horses. But Ahab, oh, he's a hard driver. Look, driven one leg to death and spavined the other one for life, and now wears out bone legs by the cord. Hello there, you smut! Bear a hand there with those screws, and let's finish it before the resurrection fellow comes a-calling with his horn for all legs, true or false, as brewery men go round collecting old beer barrels to fill them up again. What a leg is this? It looks like a real live leg filed down to nothing but the core. He'll be standing on this tomorrow. He'll be taking altitudes on it. Hello. I almost forgot the little oval slate, smooth ivory, where he figures up the latitude. So, so. Chisel, file, and sandpaper now.
Chapter 109 Ahab and Starbuck in the Cabin According to usage, they were pumping the ship next morning, and lo, no inconsiderable oil came up with the water. The casks below must have sprung a bad leak. Much concern was shown, and Starbuck went down into the cabin to report this unfavorable affair. In sperm whalemen with any considerable quantity of oil on board, it is a regular semi-weekly duty to conduct a hose into the hold and drench the casks with seawater which afterwards, at varying intervals, is removed by the ship's pumps. Hereby the casks are sought to be kept damply tight, while by the changed character of the withdrawn water, the mariners readily detect any serious leakage in the precious cargo. Now, from the south and west, the Pequod was drawing nigh to Formosa and the Bashi Isles, between which lies one of the tropical outlets from the China waters into the Pacific. And so Starbuck found Ahab with a general chart of the Oriental archipelago spread before him, and another separate one representing the long eastern coasts of the Japanese islands, Nifan, Matsmai, and Sikoki. With his snow-white new ivory leg braced against the screwed leg of his table, and with a long pruning hook of a jackknife in his hand, the wondrous old man with his back to the gangway door was wrinkling his brow and tracing his old courses again. Who's there? Hearing the footstep at the door, but not turning round to it. On deck, be gone! Captain Ahab mistakes, it is I. The oil in the hold is leaking, sir. We must up Burton's and break out. Up Burton's and break out? Now that we are nearing Japan, heave to here for a week to tinker a parcel of old hoops? Either do that, sir, or waste in one day more oil than we may make good in a year. What we come 20,000 miles to get is worth saving, sir. So it is, so it is, if we get it. I was speaking of the oil in the hold, sir. And I was not speaking or thinking of that at all. Be gone, let it leak. I'm all a leak myself. Aye, leaks in leaks. Not only full of leaky casks, but those leaky casks are in a leaky ship, and that's a far worse plight than the Pequod's man. Yet I don't stop to plug my leak. For who can find it in the deep-loaded hull, or how hope to plug it even if found in this life's howling gale? Starbuck! I'll not have the Burtons hoisted. What will the owners say, sir? Let the owners stand on Nantucket Beach and out yell the typhoons. What cares Ahab? Owners! Owners! Thou art always prating to me, Starbuck, about those miserly owners as if the owners were my conscience. But look here, the only real owner of anything is its commander, and hark you, my conscience is in this ship's keel. On deck! Captain Ahab said the reddening mate, moving further into the cabin with a daring so strangely respectful and cautious that it almost seemed not only every way seeking to avoid the slightest outward manifestation of itself, but within also seemed more than half distrustful of itself. A better man than I might well pass over in thee what he would quickly enough resent in a younger man. I, and in a happier Captain Ahab. Devils! Dost thou then so much as dare to critically think of me on deck? Nay, sir, not yet. I do entreat. And I do dare, sir, to be forbearing. Shall we not understand each other better than hitherto, Captain Ahab? Ahab seized a loaded musket from the rack, forming part of most South Sea men's cabin furniture, and pointing it towards Starbuck, exclaimed, There is one god that is lord over the earth, and one captain that is lord over the Pequod. On deck! For an instant, in the flashing eyes of the mate and his fiery cheeks, you would have almost thought that he had really received the blaze of the leveled tube. But mastering his emotion, he half calmly rose, and as he quitted the cabin, paused for an instant and said, Thou hast outraged, not insulted me, sir. But for that I ask thee not to beware of Starbuck. Thou wouldst but laugh. But let Ahab beware of Ahab. Beware of thyself, old man. He waxes brave, but nevertheless obeys. Most careful bravery, that, murmured Ahab as Starbuck disappeared. What's that he said? Ahab, beware of Ahab. There's something there. Then, unconsciously using the musket for a staff, with an iron brow he paced to and fro in the little cabin. But presently the thick plaits of his forehead relaxed, and returning the gun to the rack he went to the deck. Thou art but too good a fellow, Starbuck, he said lowly to the mate. Then raising his voice to the crew, Furl the t'gallant sails and close reef the topsails, fore and aft. 
Back the main yard up, Burton's, and break out in the main hold. It were perhaps vain to surmise exactly why it was that, as respecting Starbuck, Ahab thus acted. It may have been a flash of honesty in him, or mere prudential policy, which under the circumstance imperiously forbade the slightest symptom of open disaffection, however transient in the important chief officer of his ship. However it was, his orders were executed, and the Burtons were hoisted. Chapter 110 Queequeg in his coffin Upon searching, it was found that the casks last struck into the hold were perfectly sound, and that the leak must be further off. So, it being calm weather, they broke out deeper and deeper, disturbing the slumbers of the huge ground-tier butts, and from that black midnight sending those gigantic moles into the daylight above. So deep did they go, and so ancient and corroded and weedy the aspect of the lowermost puncheons, that you almost look next for some mouldy cornerstone cask containing coins of Captain Noah, with the copies of the posted placards vainly warning the infatuated old world from the flood. Tierce after tierce, too, of water and bread and beef and shooks of staves and iron bundles of hoops were hoisted out, till at last the piled decks were hard to get about, and the hollow hull echoed underfoot as if you were treading over empty catacombs and reeled and rolled in the sea like an air-freighted demijohn. Top-heavy was the ship as a dinnerless student with all Aristotle in his head. Well was it that the typhoons did not visit them then. Now at this time it was that my poor pagan companion and fast-bosom friend Queequeg was seized with a fever which brought him nigh to his endless end. Be it said that in this vocation of whaling, sinecures are unknown. Dignity and danger go hand in hand. Till you get to be captain, the higher you rise, the harder you toil. So with poor Queequeg, who as harpooner must not only face all the rage of the living whale, but, as we have elsewhere seen, mount his dead back in a rolling sea, and finally descend into the gloom of the hold and bitterly sweating all day in that subterraneous confinement, resolutely manhandle the clumsiest casks and see to their stowage. To be short, among whalemen the harpooners are the holders, so called. Poor Queequeg. When the ship was about half disemboweled, you should have stooped over the hatchway and peered down upon him there, where stripped to his woolen drawers the tattooed savage was crawling about amid that dampness and slime like a green-spotted lizard at the bottom of a well. And a well or an ice house, it somehow proved to him, poor pagan, where, strange to say, for all the heat of his sweatings, he caught a terrible chill which lapsed into a fever, and at last, after some days' suffering, laid him in his hammock close to the very sill of the door of death. How he wasted and wasted away in those few long, lingering days, till there seemed but little left of him but his frame and tattooing. But as all else in him thinned, and his cheekbones grew sharper, his eyes nevertheless seemed growing fuller and fuller. They became of a strange softness of luster, and mildly but deeply looked out at you there from his sickness, a wondrous testimony to that immortal health in him which could not die or be weakened. And like circles on the water which, as they grow fainter, expand, so his eyes seemed rounding and rounding like the rings of eternity. An awe that cannot be named would steal over you as you sat by the side of this waning savage and saw as strange things in his face as any beheld who were bystanders when Zoroaster died. For whatever is truly wondrous and fearful in man never yet was put into words or books. And the drawing near of death, which alike levels all, alike impresses all with a last revelation which only an author from the dead could adequately tell. So that let us say it again, no dying Chaldee or Greek had higher and holier thoughts than those whose mysterious shades you saw creeping over the face of poor Queequeg as he quietly lay in his swaying hammock and the rolling sea seemed gently rocking him to his final rest and the ocean's invisible flood tide lifted him higher and higher towards his destined heaven. Not a man of the crew but gave him up. And as for Queequeg himself, what he thought of his case was forcibly shown by a curious favor, he asked. He called one to him in the gray morning watch, when the day was just breaking, and taking his hand, said that while in Nantucket he had chanced to see certain little canoes of dark wood 
like the rich war wood of his native isle, and upon inquiry he had learned that all whalemen who died in Nantucket were laid in those same dark canoes, and that the fancy of being so laid had much pleased him. For it was not unlike the custom of his own race, who, after embalming a dead warrior, stretched him out in his canoe, and so left him to be floated away to the starry archipelagos. For not only do they believe that the stars are isles, but that far beyond all visible horizons, their own mild, uncontinented seas interflow with the blue heavens, and so form the white breakers of the Milky Way. He added that he shuddered at the thought of being buried in his hammock, according to the usual sea custom, tossed like something vile to the death-devouring sharks. No, he desired a canoe like those of Nantucket, all the more congenial to him being a whaleman, that like a whaleboat these coffin canoes were without a keel, though that involved but uncertain steering and much leeway adown the dim ages. Now when this strange circumstance was made known aft, the carpenter was at once commanded to do Queequeg's bidding, whatever it might include. There was some heathenish, coffin-colored old lumber aboard, which, upon a long previous voyage, had been cut from the aboriginal groves of the Lackaday Islands, and from these dark planks the coffin was recommended to be made. No sooner was the carpenter apprised of the order than, taking his rule, he forthwith, with all the indifferent promptitude of his character, proceeded into the forecastle and took Queequeg's measure with great accuracy, regularly chalking Queequeg's person as he shifted the rule. Ah, poor fellow, I'll have to die now, ejaculated the Long Island sailor. Going to his vice bench, the carpenter, for convenience sake and general reference, now transferringly measured on it the exact length the coffin was to be, and then made the transfer permanent by cutting two notches at its extremities. This done, he marshaled the planks and his tools, and to work. When the last nail was driven and the lid duly planed and fitted, he lightly shouldered the coffin and went forward with it, inquiring whether they were ready for it yet in that direction. Overhearing the indignant but half-humorous cries with which the people on deck began to drive the coffin away, Queequeg, to everyone's consternation, commanded that the thing should be instantly brought to him, nor was there any denying him, seeing that of all mortals some dying men are the most tyrannical, and certainly, since they will shortly trouble us so little forevermore, the poor fellows ought to be indulged. Leaning over in his hammock, Queequeg long regarded the coffin with an attentive eye. He then called for his harpoon, had the wooden stock drawn from it, and then had the iron part placed in the coffin along with one of the paddles of his boat. All by his own request, also, biscuits were then ranged round the sides within, a flask of fresh water was placed at the head, and a small bag of woody earth scraped up in the hold at the foot. And a piece of sailcloth being rolled up for a pillow, Queequeg now entreated to be lifted into his final bed, that he might make trial of its comforts, if any it had. He lay without moving a few minutes, then told Juan to go to his bag and bring out his little god, Yojo. Then crossing his arms on his breast, with Yojo between, he called for the coffin lid, hatch he called it, to be placed over him. The head part turned over with a leather hinge, and there lay Queequeg in his coffin, with little but his composed countenance in view. Rar my, it will do, it is easy, he murmured at last, and signed to be replaced in his hammock. But ere this was done, Pip, who had been slyly hovering nearby all this while, drew nigh to him where he lay, and with soft sobbings took him by the hand, in the other holding his tambourine. Poor rover, will you never have done with all this weary roving? Where go you now? But if the currents carry you to those sweet Antilles where the beaches are only beat with water lilies, will you do one little errand for me? Seek out one Pip, who's now been missing long. I think he's in those far Antilles. If you find him, then comfort him, for he must be very sad. For look, he's left his tambourine behind. I found it. rig dig 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 Now, Queequeg die, and I'll beat you your dying march. I have heard, murmured Starbuck, gazing down the scuttle, that in violent fevers men all ignorance have talked in ancient tongues, and that when the mystery is probed it turns out always that in their wholly forgotten childhood those ancient tongues had been really spoken in their hearing by some lofty scholars. So to my fond faith poor Pip in this strange sweetness of his lunacy brings heavenly vouchers of all our heavenly home. Where learned he that but there? Hark, he speaks again, but more wildly now. Form two and two, 
Let's make a general of him. Oh, where's his harpoon? Lay it across here. Rig dig dig huzzah! Oh, for a game cock now to sit upon his head and crow. Queequeg dies game. Mind you that Queequeg dies game. Take you good heed of that Queequeg dies game. I say game, game, game. But base little Pip, he died a coward. Died all a shiver. Out upon Pip. Hark ya. If you find Pip, tell all the Antilles he's a runaway. A coward. A coward. A coward. Tell him he jumped from a whaleboat. I'd never beat my tambourine over base Pip and hail him general if he were once more dying here. No, no. Shame upon all coward. Shame upon him. Let him go drown like Pip that jumped from a whaleboat. Shame. Shame. During all this, Queequeg lay with closed eyes, as if in a dream. Pip was led away, and the sick man was replaced in his hammock. But now that he had apparently made every preparation for death, now that his coffin was proved a good fit, Queequeg suddenly rallied. Soon there seemed no need of the carpenter's box, and thereupon, when some expressed their delighted surprise, he, in substance, said that the cause of his sudden convalescence was this. At a critical moment, he had just recalled a little duty ashore which he was leaving undone, and therefore had changed his mind about dying. He could not die yet, he averred. They asked him then whether to live or die was a matter of his own sovereign will and pleasure. He answered, certainly. In a word, it was Queequeg's conceit that if a man made up his mind to live, mere sickness could not kill him. Nothing but a whale or a gale or some violent, ungovernable, unintelligent destroyer of that sort. Now there is this noteworthy difference between savage and civilized, that while a sick, civilized man may be six months convalescing, generally speaking, a sick savage is almost half well again in a day. So in good time, my Queequeg gained strength. And at length, after sitting on the windlass for a few indolent days, but eating with a vigorous appetite, he suddenly leaped to his feet, threw out arms and legs, gave himself a good stretching, yawned a little bit, and then springing into the head of his hoisted boat and poising a harpoon, pronounced himself fit for a fight. With a wild whimsiness, he now used his coffin for a sea chest, and emptying into it his canvas bag of clothes, set them in order there. Many spare hours he spent in carving the lid with all manner of grotesque figures and drawings, and it seemed that hereby he was striving in his rude way to copy parts of the twisted tattooing on his body. And this tattooing had been the work of a departed prophet and seer of his island, who by those hieroglyphic marks had written out on his body a complete theory of the heavens and the earth, and a mystical treatise on the art of attaining truth, so that Queequeg in his own proper person was a riddle to unfold, a wondrous work in one volume, but whose mysteries not even himself could read, though his own live heart beat against them. And these mysteries were therefore destined in the end to moulder away with the living parchment whereon they were inscribed, and so be unsolved to the last. And this thought it must have been which suggested to Ahab that wild exclamation of his when one morning turning away from surveying poor Queequeg, Oh, devilish tantalization of the gods! Chapter 111 The Pacific When gliding by the Bashi Isles, we emerged at last upon the great South Sea, where not for other things I could have greeted my dear Pacific with uncounted thanks, for now the long supplication of my youth was answered. That serene ocean rolled eastwards from me a thousand leagues of blue. There is one knows not what sweet mystery about this sea, whose gently awful stirring seemed to speak of some hidden soul beneath, like those fabled undulations of the Ephesian sod over the buried evangelist St. John. And meet it is that over these sea pastures, wide rolling watery prairies and potter's fields of all four continents, the waves should rise and fall and ebb and flow unceasingly. For here millions of mixed shades and shadows, drowned dreams, somnambulisms, reveries, all that we call lives and souls, lie dreaming, dreaming still, tossing like slumberers in their beds, the ever-rolling waves but made so by their restlessness. To any meditative Magian rover, this serene Pacific, once beheld, must ever after be the sea of his adoption. It rolls the midmost waters of the world, the Indian Ocean and Atlantic being but its arms. 
The same waves wash the moles of the new-built Californian towns, but yesterday planted by the recentest race of men, and lave the faded but still gorgeous skirts of Asiatic lands older than Abraham, while all between float milky ways of coral isles and low-lying, endless, unknown archipelagos and impenetrable Japans. Thus this mysterious divine Pacific zones the world's whole bulk about, makes all coasts one bay to it, seems the tide-beating heart of earth. Lifted by those eternal swells, you needs must own the seductive god, bowing your head to Pan. But few thoughts of Pan stirred Ahab's brain, as standing like an iron statue at his accustomed place beside the mizzen rigging, with one nostril he unthinkingly snuffed the sugary musk from the Bashi Isles, in whose sweet woods mild lovers must be walking, and with the other consciously inhaled the salt breath of the newfound sea, that sea in which the hated white whale must even then be swimming. Launched at length upon these almost final waters and gliding towards the Japanese cruising ground, the old man's purpose intensified itself. His firm lips met like the lips of a vice. The delta of his forehead's veins swelled like overladen brooks. In his very sleep, his ringing cry ran through the vaulted hull. Stern all the white whale spouts thick blood. Chapter 112. The Blacksmith. Availing himself of the mild, summer-cool weather that now reigned in these latitudes, and in preparation for the peculiarly active pursuits shortly to be anticipated, Perth, the begrimed, blistered old blacksmith, had not removed his portable forge to the hold again after concluding his contributory work for Ahab's leg, but still retained it on deck, fast lashed to ring bolts by the foremast. Being now almost incessantly invoked by the headsmen and harpooners and bowsmen to do some little job for them, altering or repairing or new shaping their various weapons and boat furniture. Often he would be surrounded by an eager circle all waiting to be served, holding boat spades, pike heads, harpoons and lances, and jealously watching his every sooty movement as he toiled. Nevertheless, this old man's was a patient hammer wielded by a patient arm. No murmur, no impatience, no petulance did come from him. Silent, slow, and solemn, bowing over still further his chronically broken back, he toiled away as if toil were life itself, and the heavy beating of his hammer, the heavy beating of his heart. And so it was, most miserable. A peculiar walk in this old man, a certain slight but painful appearing yawing in his gait, had at an early period of the voyage excited the curiosity of the mariners and to the importunity of their persisted questionings he had finally given in, and so it came to pass that everyone now knew the shameful story of his wretched fate. Belated, and not innocently, one bitter winter's midnight, on the road running between two country towns, the blacksmith half-stupidly felt the deadly numbness stealing over him, and sought refuge in a leaning, dilapidated barn. The issue was the loss of the extremities of both feet. Out of this revelation, part by part, at last came out the four acts of the gladness and the one long and as yet uncatastrophied fifth act of the grief of his life's drama. He was an old man who, at the age of nearly sixty, had postponedly encountered that thing in sorrow's technicals called ruin. He had been an artisan of famed excellence and with plenty to do, owned a house and garden, embraced a youthful, daughter-like, loving wife and three blithe, ruddy children, every Sunday went to a cheerful-looking church planted in a grove. But one night, under cover of darkness and further concealed in a most cunning disguisement, a desperate burglar slid into his happy home and robbed them all of everything. And darker yet to tell, the blacksmith himself did ignorantly conduct this burglar into his family's heart. It was the bottle conjurer. Upon the opening of that fatal cork, forth flew the fiend and shriveled up his home. Now, for prudent, most wise, and economic reasons, the blacksmith's shop was in the basement of his dwelling, but with a separate entrance to it, so that always had the young and loving, healthy wife listened with no unhappy nervousness, but with vigorous pleasure to the stout ringing of her young-armed old husband's hammer, whose reverberations, muffled by passing through the floors and walls, came up to her not unsweetly in her nursery, 
And so, to stout labor's iron lullaby, the blacksmith's infants were rocked to slumber. Oh, woe on woe! Oh, death, why canst thou not sometimes be timely? Hadst thou taken this old blacksmith to thyself, ere his full ruin came upon him, then had the young widow had a delicious grief, and her orphans a truly venerable, legendary sire to dream of in their after years, and all of them a care-killing competency. But death plucked down some virtuous elder brother, on whose whistling daily toil solely hung the responsibilities of some other family, and left the worse than useless old man standing till the hideous rot of life should make him easier to harvest. Why tell the whole? The blows of the basement hammer every day grew more and more between, and each blow every day grew fainter than the last. The wife sat frozen at the window with tearless eyes, glitteringly gazing into the weeping faces of her children. The bellows fell, the forge choked up with cinders, the house was sold, the mother dived down into the long churchyard grass. Her children twice followed her thither, and the houseless, familyless old man staggered off a vagabond in crepe, his every woe unreverenced, his grey head a scorn to flaxen curls. Death seems the only desirable sequel for a career like this, but death is only a launching into the region of the strange untried. It is but the first salutation to the possibilities of the immense remote, the wild, the watery, the unshored. Therefore, to the death-longing eyes of such men who still have left in them some interior compunctions against suicide, does the all-contributed and all-receptive ocean alluringly spread forth his whole plane of unimaginable taking terrors and wonderful new life adventures. And from the hearts of infinite Pacifics the thousand mermaids sing to them, Come hither, broken-hearted. Here is another life, without the guilt of intermediate death. Here are wonders supernatural, without dying for them. Come hither. Bury thyself in a life which, to your now equally abhorred and abhorring landed world, is more oblivious than death. Come hither. Put up thy gravestone, too, within the churchyard, and come hither till we marry thee. Hearkening to these voices, east and west, by early sunrise and by fall of eve, the blacksmith's soul responded, I, I come. And so Perth went a-wailing. Chapter 113 The Forge with matted beard and swathed in a bristling sharkskin apron about midday, Perth was standing between his forge and anvil, the latter placed upon an ironwood log, with one hand holding a pikehead in the coals, and with the other at his forge's lungs, when Captain Ahab came along, carrying in his hand a small, rusty-looking leathern bag. While yet a little distance from the forge, Moody Ahab paused, till at last Perth, withdrawing his iron from the fire, began hammering it upon the anvil the red mass sending off the sparks in thick hovering flights, some of which flew close to Ahab. Are these thy mother Carrie's chickens, Perth? They're always flying in thy wake. Birds of good omen, too, but not to all. Look here, they burn. But thou, thou livest among them without a scorch. Because I am scorched all over, Captain Ahab, answered Perth, resting for a moment on his hammer. I am past scorching. Not easily canst thou scorch a scar. Well, well, no more. Thy shrunk voice sounds too calmly, sanely woeful to me. In no paradise myself, I am impatient of all misery in others that is not mad. Thou shouldst go mad, blacksmith. Say, why dost thou not go mad? How canst thou endure without being mad? Do the heavens yet hate thee that thou canst not go mad? What wert thou making there? Welding an old pikehead, sir. There were seams and dents in it. And canst thou make it all smooth again, blacksmith, after such hard usage as it had? I think so, sir. And I suppose thou canst smooth almost any seams and dents, never mind how hard the metal, blacksmith? Aye, sir, I think I can. All seams and dents but one. Look ye here, then, cried Ahab, passionately advancing and leaning with both hands on Perth's shoulders. Look ye here, here! Can you smooth out a seam like this, blacksmith? Sweeping one hand across his ribbed brow. If thou couldst, blacksmith, glad enough would I lay my head upon thy anvil and feel thy heaviest hammer between my eyes. Answer! 
Canst thou smooth this seam? Oh, that is the one, sir. Said I not all seams and dents but one? Aye, blacksmith, it is the one. Aye, man, it is unsmoothable. For though thou only seest it here in my flesh, it has worked down into the bone of my skull. That is all wrinkles. But away with child's play. No more gaffs and pikes today. Looky here. Jingling the leathern bag as if it were full of gold coins. I, too, want a harpoon made. One that a thousand yoke of fiends could not part, Perth. Something that will stick in a whale like his own fin bone. There's the stuff flinging the pouch upon the anvil. Look, you blacksmith, these are the gathered nail stubs of the steel shoes of racing horses. Horseshoe stubs, sir. My Captain Ahab, thou hast here then the best and stubbornest stuff we blacksmiths ever work. I know it, old man. These stubs will weld together like glue from the melted bones of murderers. Quick, forge me the harpoon. And forge me first twelve rods for its shank. Then wind and twist and hammer these twelve together like the yarns and strands of a towline. Quick, I'll blow the fire. When at last the twelve rods were made, Ahab tried them one by one by spiraling them with his own hand round a long, heavy iron bolt. A flaw, rejecting the last one. Work that over again, Perth. This done, Perth was about to begin welding the twelve into one when Ahab stayed his hand and said he would weld his own iron. As then, with regular gasping hems, he hammered on the anvil, Perth passing to him the glowing rods, one after the other, and the hard-pressed forge shooting up its intense straight flame, a Parsee passed silently, and bowing over his head towards the fire seemed invoking some curse or some blessing on the toil. But as Ahab looked up, he slid aside. "'What's that bunch of Lucifers dodging about there for?' muttered Stubb, looking on from the forecastle. That Parsee smells fire like a fusee, and smells of it himself like a hot musket's powder pan. At last the shank in one complete rod received its final heat, and as Perth, to temper it, plunged it all hissing into the cask of water nearby, a scalding steam shot up into Ahab's bent face. Wouldst thou brand me, Perth? wincing for a moment with the pain. Have I been but forging my own branding iron then? Pray God, not that. Yet I fear something, Captain Ahab. Is not this harpoon for the white whale, for the white fiend? But now for the barbs, thou must make them thyself, man. Here are my razors, the best of steel. Here, and make the barbs sharp as the needle sleet of the icy sea. For a moment the old blacksmith eyed the razors as though he would fain not use them. Take them, man, I have no need for them. For I now neither shave, sup, nor pray till... But here, to work. Fashioned at last into an arrowy shape and welded by Perth to the shank, the steel soon pointed the end of the iron. And as the blacksmith was about giving the barbs their final heat prior to tempering them, he cried to Ahab to place the water cask near. No, no, no water for that. I want it of the true death temper. Ahoy there, Tashtigo, Queequeg, Dagu. What say ye, pagans? Will ye give me as much blood as will cover this barb? holding it high up. A cluster of dark nods replied yes. Three punctures were made in the heathen flesh, and the white whale's barbs were then tempered. Ego non baptizo te in nomine patris sed in nomine diaboli, deliriously howled Ahab as the malignant iron scorchingly devoured the baptismal blood. Now, mustering the spare poles from below and selecting one of hickory, with the bark still investing it, Ahab fitted the end to the socket of the iron. A coil of new tow-line was then unwound, and some fathoms of it taken to the windlass and stretched to a great tension. Pressing his foot upon it till the rope hummed like a harp-string, then eagerly bending over it and seeing no strandings, Ahab exclaimed, Good! And now for the seizings! At one extremity the rope was unstranded, and the separate spread yarns were all braided and woven round the socket of the harpoon. The pole was then driven hard up into the socket. From the lower end, the rope was traced halfway along the pole's length and firmly secured so, with intertwistings of twine. This done, pole, iron, and rope, like the three fates, remained inseparable, and Ahab moodily stalked away with the weapon, the sound of his ivory leg and the sound of the hickory pole both hollowly ringing along every plank. But ere he entered his cabin, 
A light, unnatural, half-bantering, yet most piteous sound was heard. O oh, Pip, thy wretched laugh, thy idle but unresting eye, all thy strange mummeries not unmeaningly blended with the black tragedy of the melancholy ship and mocked it. Chapter 114 The Gilder Penetrating further and further into the heart of the Japanese cruising ground, the Pequod was soon all astir in the fishery. Often, in mild, pleasant weather for 12, 15, 18, and 20 hours on the stretch, they were engaged in the boats, steadily pulling or sailing or paddling after the whales, or for an interlude of 60 or 70 minutes calmly awaiting their uprising, though with but small success for their pains. At such times, under an abated sun, afloat all day upon smooth, slow, heaving swells, Seated in his boat, light as a birch canoe, and so sociably mixing with the soft waves themselves that, like hearthstone cats, they purr against the gunwale, these are the times of dreamy quietude, when beholding the tranquil beauty and brilliancy of the ocean skin, one forgets the tiger heart that pants beneath it, and would not willingly remember that this velvet paw but conceals a remorseless fang. These are the times when in his whaleboat the rover softly feels a certain filial, confident, land-like feeling towards the sea, that he regards it as so much flowery earth, and the distant ship, revealing only the tops of her masts, seems struggling forward not through high rolling waves, but through the tall grass of a rolling prairie, as when the western emigrants' horses only show their erected ears while their hidden bodies widely wade through the amazing verdure. The long-drawn virgin veils, the mild blue hillsides, as over these there steals the hush, the hum, you almost swear that play-wearied children lie sleeping in these solitudes in some glad May time when the flowers of the woods are plucked. And all this mixes with your most mystic mood, so that fact and fancy, halfway meeting, interpenetrate and form one seamless whole. Nor did such soothing scenes, however temporary, fail of at least as temporary an effect on Ahab. But if these secret golden keys did seem to open in him his own secret golden treasuries, yet did his breath upon them prove but tarnishing. O oh, grassy glades, O oh, ever vernal, endless landscapes in the soul, in ye, though long parched by the dead drought of the earthy life, in ye men yet may roll like young horses in new morning clover, and for some few fleeting moments feel the cool dew of the life immortal on them. Would to God these blessed calms would last, but the mingled, mingling threads of life are woven by warp and woof, calms crossed by storms, a storm for every calm. There is no steady, unretracing progress in this life. We do not advance through fixed gradations and at the last one pause. Through infancy's unconscious spell, boyhood's thoughtless faith, adolescence doubt, the common doom, then skepticism, then disbelief, resting at last in manhood's pondering repose of if. But once gone through, we trace the round again, and are infants, boys, and men, and ifs eternally. Where lies the final harbor whence we unmoor no more? In what rapt ether sails the world of which the weariest will never weary? Where is the foundling's father hidden? Our souls are like those orphans whose unwedded mothers die in bearing them. The secret of our paternity lies in their grave, and we must there to learn it. And that same day, too, gazing far down from his boat's side into that same golden sea, Starbuck lowly murmured, loveliness unfathomable, as ever lover saw in his young bride's eye. Tell me not of thy teeth-tiered sharks and thy kidnapping cannibal ways. Let faith oust fact, let fancy oust memory. I look deep down and do believe. And Stubb, fish-like with sparkling scales, leaped up in that same golden light. I am Stubb, and Stubb has his history. But here, Stubb takes oaths that he has always been jolly. Chapter 115 
the Pequod meets the Bachelor. And jolly enough were the sights and the sounds that came bearing down before the wind some few weeks after Ahab's harpoon had been welded. It was a Nantucket ship, the Bachelor, which had just wedged in her last cask of oil and bolted down her bursting hatches, and now in glad holiday apparel was joyously, though somewhat vaingloriously, sailing around among the widely separated ships on the ground previous to pointing her prow for home. The three men at her masthead wore long streamers of narrow red bunting at their hats. From the stern, a whaleboat was suspended bottom down, and hanging captive from the bowsprit was seen the long lower jaw of the last whale they had slain. Signals, ensigns, and jacks of all colors were flying from her rigging on every side. Sideways lashed in each of her three basketed tops were two barrels of sperm, above which, in her topmast cross trees, you saw the slender breakers of the same precious fluid, and nailed to her main truck was a brazen lamp. As was afterwards learned, the bachelor had met with the most surprising success. All the more wonderful for that while cruising in the same seas, numerous other vessels had gone entire months without securing a single fish. Not only had barrels of beef and bread been given away to make room for the far more valuable sperm, but additional supplemental casks had been bartered for from the ship she had met, and these were stowed along the deck and in the captain's and officer's staterooms. Even the cabin table itself had been knocked into kindling wood, and the cabin mess dined off the broad head of an oil butt lashed down to the floor for a centerpiece. In the forecastle, the sailors had actually caulked and pitched their chests and filled them. It was humorously added that the cook had clapped a head on his largest boiler and filled it, that the steward had plugged his spare coffee pot and filled it, that the harpooners had headed the sockets of their irons and filled them, that indeed everything was filled with sperm except the captain's pantaloons pockets and those he reserved to thrust his hands into in self-complacent testimony of his entire satisfaction. As this glad ship of good luck bore down upon the moody Pequod, the barbarian sound of enormous drums came from her forecastle, and drawing still nearer, a crowd of her men were seen standing round her huge tripods, which covered with the parchment-like poke or stomach skin of the black fish, gave forth a loud roar to every stroke of the clenched hands of the crew. On the quarter-deck, the mates and harpooners were dancing with the olive-hued girls who had eloped with them from the Polynesian Isles, while suspended in an ornamented boat, firmly secured aloft between the foremast and mainmast, three Long Island negroes with glittering fiddle bows of whale ivory were presiding over the hilarious jig. Meanwhile, others of the ship's company were tumultuously busy at the masonry of the triworks from which the huge pots had been removed. You would have almost thought they were pulling down the cursed Bastille, such wild cries they raised as the now useless brick and mortar were being hurled into the sea. Lord and master over all this scene, the captain stood erect on the ship's elevated quarter-deck, so that the whole rejoicing drama was full before him, and seemed merely contrived for his own individual diversion. And Ahab, he too was standing on his quarter-deck, shaggy and black with a stubborn gloom. And as the two ships crossed each other's wakes, one all jubilations for things past, the other all forebodings as to things to come, the two captains in themselves impersonated the whole striking contrast of the scene. Come aboard! Come aboard! cried the gay bachelor's commander, lifting a glass and a bottle in the air. Has seen the white whale? gritted Ahab in reply. No! Only heard of him, but don't believe in him at all, said the other good-humouredly. Come aboard! Thou art too damned jolly! Sail on! Has lost any men? Not enough to speak of, two islanders, that's all. But come aboard, old hearty, come along, I'll soon take that black from your brow. Come along, will ya, Mary's the play, a full ship and homeward bound. How wondrous familiar is a fool, muttered Ahab. Then aloud, thou art a full ship and homeward bound, thou sayest. Well then, call me an empty ship and outward bound. So go thy ways, and I will mine. Forward there, set all sail and keep her to the wind. And thus, while the one ship went cheerily before the breeze, the others stubbornly fought against it. And so the two vessels parted, the crew of the Pequod looking with grave, lingering glances toward the receding bachelor. But the bachelor's men never heeding their gaze for the lively revelry they were in. And as Ahab, leaning over the taffrail, eyed the homeward-bound craft, he took from his pocket a small vial of sand, and then looking from the ship to the vial, 
seemed thereby bringing two remote associations together, for that vial was filled with Nantucket soundings. Chapter 116 The Dying Whale Not seldom in this life, when on the right side fortunes favor its sail close by us, we, though all a droop before, catch somewhat of the rushing breeze and joyfully feel our bagging sails fill out. So it seemed with the Pequod, for next day after encountering the gay bachelor, whales were seen, and four were slain, and one of them by Ahab. It was far down the afternoon, and when all the spearings of the crimson fight were done, and floating in the lovely sunset sea and sky, sun and whale both stilly died together, then such a sweetness and such plaintiveness, such inwreathing orisons curled up in that rosy air that it almost seemed as if far over from the deep green convent valleys of the Manila Isles, the Spanish land breeze, wantonly turned sailor, had gone to sea, freighted with these vesper hymns. Soothed again, but only soothed to deeper gloom, Ahab, who had sterned off from the whale, sat intently watching his final wanings from the now tranquil boat. For that strange spectacle, observable in all sperm whales dying, the turning sunwards of the head and so expiring, that strange spectacle beheld of such a placid evening somehow to Ahab conveyed a wondrousness unknown before. He turns and turns him to it. How slowly and how steadfastly, his homage rendering an invoking brow with his last dying motions. He too worships fire, most faithful, broad, baronial vassal of the sun. Oh, that these two favoring eyes should see these two favoring sights. Look here, far water locked, beyond all hum of human weal or woe. In these most candid and impartial seas, where to traditions no rocks furnish tablets, where for long Chinese ages the billows have still rolled on, speechless and unspoken to, as stars that shine upon the Niger's unknown source, here too life dies sunwards full of faith. But see, no sooner dead than death whirls round the corpse, and it heads some other way. O oh, thou dark Hindu, half of nature, who of drowned bones hast builded thy separate throne somewhere in the heart of these unverdured seas, thou art an infidel, thou queen, and too truly speakest to me in the wide slaughtering typhoon and the hushed burial of its after calm. Nor has this thy whale sunwards turned his dying head and then gone round again without a lesson to me. O oh, trebly hooped and welded hip of power, O oh, high aspiring rainbow jet, that one striveth, this one jetteth all in vain. In vain, O oh whale, dost thou seek intercedings with yon all quickening sun that only calls forth life but gives it not again. Yet dost thou, darker half, rock me with a prouder, if a darker faith. All thy unnameable imminglings float beneath me here. I am buoyed by breaths of once living things, exhaled as air but water now. Then hail, forever hail, O sea, in whose eternal tossings the wild fowl finds his only rest. Born of earth yet suckled by the sea, though hill and valley mothered me, you billows are my foster brothers. Chapter 117 The Whale Watch The four whales slain that evening had died wide apart, one far to windward, one less distant to leeward, one ahead, one astern. These last three were brought alongside ere nightfall, but the windward one could not be reached till morning, and the boat that had killed it lay by its side all night, and that boat was Ahab's. The waif pole was thrust upright into the dead whale's spout hole, and the lantern hanging from its top cast a troubled, flickering glare upon the black, glossy back, and far out upon the midnight waves, which gently chafed the whale's broad flank like soft surf upon a beach. Ahab and all his boat's crew seemed to sleep but the Parsi, who, crouching in the bow, sat watching the sharks that spectrally played round the whale, and tapped the light cedar planks with their tails. 
the sound like the moaning in squadrons over asphaltites of unforgiven ghosts of Gomorrah ran shuddering through the air. Started from his slumbers, Ahab face to face saw the Parsi, and hooped round by the gloom of the night, they seemed the last men in a flooded world. I have dreamed it again, said he. Of the hearses? Have I not said, old man, that neither hearse nor coffin can be thine? And who are hearsed that die on the sea? But I said, old man, that ere thou couldst die on this voyage, two hearses must verily be seen by thee on the sea, the first not made by mortal hands, and the visible wood of the last one must be grown in America. Aye, aye, a strange sight, that Parsi, a hearse and its plumes floating over the ocean with the waves for the pallbearers. Ha! Such a sight we shall not soon see. Believe it or not, thou canst not die till it be seen, old man. And what was that saying about thyself? Though it come to the last, I shall still go before thee, thy pilot. And when thou art so gone before, if ever that befall, then ere I can follow, thou must still appear to me, to pilot me still. Was it not so? Well then, did I believe all ye say, O my pilot? I have here two pledges that I shall yet slay Moby Dick and survive it. Take another pledge, old man, said the Parsi, as his eyes lighted up like fireflies in the gloom. Hemp only can kill thee. The gallows, you mean. I am immortal, then, on land and on sea, cried Ahab with a laugh of derision. Immortal on land and on sea. Both were silent again, as one man. The grey dawn came on and the slumbering crew arose from the boat's bottom, and ere noon the dead whale was brought to the ship. Chapter 118 The Quadrant The season for the line at length drew near, and every day when Ahab, coming from his cabin, cast his eyes aloft, the vigilant helmsman would ostentatiously handle his spokes, and the eager mariners quickly run to the braces and would stand there with all their eyes centrally fixed on the nailed doubloon, impatient for the order to point the ship's prow for the equator. In good time the order came. It was hard upon high noon, and Ahab, seated in the bounds of his high-hoisted boat, was about taking his wonted daily observation of the sun to determine his latitude. Now in that Japanese sea, the days in summer are as freshets of effulgences, that unblinkingly vivid Japanese sun seems the blazing focus of the glassy ocean's immeasurable burning glass. The sky looks lacquered, clouds there are none, the horizon floats, and this nakedness of unrelieved radiance is as the insufferable splendors of God's throne. Well that Ahab's quadrant was furnished with colored glasses through which to take sight of that solar fire. So, swinging his seated form to the roll of the ship, and with his astrological-looking instrument placed to his eye, he remained in that posture for some moments to catch the precise instant when the sun should gain its precise meridian. Meantime, while his whole attention was absorbed, the Parsi was kneeling beneath him on the ship's deck, and with face thrown up like Ahab's was eyeing the same sun with him, only the lids of his eyes half-hooded their orbs, and his wild face was subdued to an unearthly passionlessness. At length the desired observation was taken, and with his pencil upon his ivory leg, Ahab soon calculated what his latitude must be at that precise instant. Then, falling into a moment's reverie, he again looked up towards the sun and murmured to himself, Thou sea mark, thou high and mighty pilot, now tellest me truly where I am. But canst thou cast the least hint where I shall be? Or canst thou tell where some other thing besides me is this moment living? Where is Moby Dick? This instant thou must be eyeing him. These eyes of mine look into the very eye that is even now beholding him. Aye, and into the eye that is even now equally beholding the objects on the unknown thither side of thee, thou son. Then gazing at his quadrant and handling one after the other its numerous cabalistical contrivances, he pondered again and muttered, Foolish toy, 
Baby's plaything of haughty admirals and commodores and captains. The world brags of thee of thy cunning and might. But what, after all, canst thou do but tell the poor pitiful point where thou thyself happenest to be on this wide planet, and the hand that holds thee? No, not one jot more. Thou canst not tell why one drop of water or one grain of sand will be tomorrow noon. And yet with thy impotence thou insultest the sun. Science. Curse thee, thou vain toy, and cursed be all the things that cast man's eyes aloft to that heaven whose live vividness but scorches him, as these old eyes are even now scorched with thy light, O sun. Level by nature to this earth's horizon are the glances of man's eyes, not shot from the crown of his head, as if God had meant him to gaze on his firmament. Curse thee, thou quadrant, dashing it to the deck. No longer will I guide my earthly way by thee, the level ship's compass and the level dead reckoning by log and by line, these shall conduct me and show me my place on the sea. Ay, lighting from the boat to the deck. Thus I trample on thee, thou paltry thing that feebly pointest on high. Thus I split and destroy thee. As the frantic old man thus spoke and thus trampled with his live and dead feet, a sneering triumph that seemed meant for Ahab and a fatalistic despair that seemed meant for himself, these passed over the mute, motionless Parsee's face. Unobserved he rose and glided away, while awestruck by the aspect of their commander, the seamen clustered together on the forecastle, till Ahab, troubledly pacing the deck, shouted out, To the braces! Up helm! Square in! In an instant the yards swung round, and as the ship half-wheeled upon her heel, her three firm-seated, graceful masts erectly poised upon her long, ribbed hull seemed as three horati pirouetting on one sufficient steed. Standing between the nightheads, Starbuck watched the Pequod's tumultuous way, and Ahab's also as he went lurching along the deck. I have sat before the dense coal fire and watched it all aglow, full of its tormented, flaming life, and I have seen it wane at last down, down to dumbest dust. Old man of oceans, of all this fiery life of thine, what will at length remain but one little heap of ashes? Aye, cried Stubb, but sea coal ashes, mind you that, Mr. Starbuck, sea coal, not your common charcoal. Well, well, I heard Ahab mutter, here someone thrusts these cards into these old hands of mine, swears that I must play them and no others. And damn me, Ahab, but thou actest right. Live in the game and die in it. Chapter 119 The Candles Warmest climes, but nurse the cruelest fangs. The tiger of Bengal crouches in spiced groves of ceaseless verdure. Skies the most effulgent, but basket the deadliest thunders. Gorgeous Cuba knows tornadoes that never swept tame northern lands. So too is it that in these resplendent Japanese seas, the mariner encounters the direst of all storms, the typhoon. It will sometimes burst from out that cloudless sky like an exploding bomb upon a dazed and sleepy town. Towards evening of that day, the Pequod was torn of her canvas, and bare-poled was left to fight a typhoon which had struck her directly ahead. When darkness came on, sky and sea roared and split with the thunder, and blazed with the lightning that showed the disabled masts fluttering here and there with the rags which the first fury of the tempest had left for its after-sport. Holding by a shroud, Starbuck was standing on the quarter-deck, at every flash of the lightning glancing aloft to see what additional disaster might have befallen the intricate hamper there, while Stubb and Flask were directing the men in the higher hoisting and firmer lashing of the boats. But all their pains seemed not. Though lifted to the very top of the cranes, the windward quarter boat, Ahab's, did not escape. A great rolling sea dashing high up against the reeling ship's high teetering side stove in the boat's bottom at the stern and left it again all dripping through like a sieve. Bad work, bad work, Mr. Starbuck, said Stubb, regarding the wreck. But the sea will have its way. Stubb, for one, can't find it. You see, Mr. Starbuck, a wave has such a great long start before it leaps all round the world it runs, and then comes the spring. But as for me, all the start I have to meet it, it is just across the deck here. 
but never mind, it's all in fun. So the old song says, sings, Oh, jolly is the gale, and a joker is the whale, a flourish in his tail, such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, hokey-pokey lad is the ocean, oh. The scud all a-flyin', that's his flip, only foamin' when he stirs in the spicin', such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, hokey-pokey lad is the ocean, oh. Thunder splits the ships, but he only smacks his lips at tastin' of this flip, such a funny, sporty, gamey, jesty, jokey, hokey-pokey lad is the ocean, oh. Avast, stub, cried the starbuck. Let the typhoon sing and strike his harp here in our rigging, but if thou art a brave man, thou wilt hold thy peace. But I am not a brave man. Never said I was a brave man. I'm a coward, and I sing to keep up my spirits. And I tell you what it is, Mr. Starbuck. There's no way to stop my singing in this world but to cut my throat. And when that's done, ten to one, I sing you the doxology for a wind-up. Madman, look through my eyes if thou hast none of thine own. What? How can you see better of a dark night than anybody else? Never mind how foolish. Here, cried Starbuck, seizing Stubb by the shoulder and pointing his hand towards the weather bow. Markest thou not that the gale comes from the eastward? The very course Ahab is to run for Moby Dick. The very course he swung to this day noon. Now mark his boat there. Where is that stove? In the stern sheets, man, where he is wont to stand. His standpoint is stove, man. Now jump overboard and sing away if thou must. I don't half understand you. What's in the wind? Yes. Yes, round the Cape of Good Hope is the shortest way to Nantucket, soliloquized Starbuck suddenly, heedless of Stubb's question. The gale that now hammers at us to stave us, we can turn it into a fair wind that will drive us towards home. Yonder, to windward, all is blackness of doom. To leeward, homeward, I see it lightens up there, but not with the lightning. At that moment, in one of the intervals of profound darkness following the flashes, a voice was heard at his side, and almost at the same instant a volley of thunder peals rolled overhead. Who's there? Old thunder, said Ahab, groping his way along the bulwarks to his pivot hole, but suddenly finding his path made plain to him by elbowed lances of fire. Now, as the lightning rod to a spire on shore is intended to carry off the perilous fluid into the soil, so the kindred rod which at sea some ships carry to each mast is intended to conduct it into the water. But as this conductor must descend to a considerable depth that its end may avoid all contact with the hull, and as, moreover, if kept constantly towing there, it would be liable to many mishaps, besides interfering not a little with some of the rigging, and more or less impeding the vessel's way in the water, because of all this, the lower parts of a ship's lightning rods are not always overboard, but are generally made in long, slender links, so as to be the more readily hauled up into the chains outside, or thrown down into the sea as occasion may require. The rods! The rods! cried Starbuck to the crew, suddenly admonished to vigilance by the vivid lightning that had just been darting flambeaux to light Ahab to his post. Are they overboard? Drop them over, fore and aft, quick! Avast! cried Ahab. Let's have fair play here, though we be the weaker side. Yet I'll contribute to raise rods on the Himalayas and Andes that all the world may be secured. But out on privileges, let them be, sir. Look aloft, cried Starbuck. The corposants, the corposants. All the yard arms were tipped with a pallid fire and touched at each tri-pointed lightning rod end with three tapering white flames. Each of the three tall masts was silently burning in that sulfurous air like three gigantic wax tapers before an altar. Blast the boat, let it go, cried Stubb at this instant, as a swashing sea heaved up under his own little craft, so that its gunwale violently jammed his hand as he was passing a lashing. Blast it! But slipping backward on the deck, his uplifted eyes caught the flames, and immediately shifting his tone, he cried, The Corpusans have mercy on us all! To sailors, oaths are household words. They will swear in the trance of the calm and in the teeth of the tempest. They will imprecate curses from the topsail yard arms when most they teeter over to a seething sea. But in all my voyagings, seldom have I heard a common oath when God's burning finger has been laid on the ship, when his mene mene tekel oparsin has been woven into the shrouds and the cordage. While this pallidness was burning aloft, few words were heard from the enchanted crew, who in one thick cluster stood on the forecastle, all their eyes gleaming in that pale phosphorescence like a faraway constellation of stars. 
Relieved against the ghostly light, the gigantic jet negro Dagu loomed up to thrice his real stature and seemed the black cloud from which the thunder had come. The parted mouth of Tashtego revealed his shark white teeth, which strangely gleamed as if they too had been tipped by corpus ants, while lit up by the preternatural light, Queequeg's tattooing burned like satanic blue flames on his body. The tableau all waned at last with the pallidness aloft, and once more the Pequod and every soul on her decks were wrapped in a pall. A moment or two passed when Starbuck, going forward, pushed against someone. It was Stubb. What thinkest thou now, man? I heard thy cry. It was not the same in the song. No, no, it wasn't. I said the Corpus Ants have mercy on us all, and I hope they will still. But do they only have mercy on long faces? Have they no bowels for a laugh? And look you, Mr. Starbuck. But it's too dark to look. Hear me, then. I take that masthead flame we saw for a sign of good luck. For those masts are rooted in a hold that is going to be chock a block with sperm oil, you see. And so all that sperm will work up into the masts like sap in a tree. Yes, our three masts will yet be as three spermaceti candles. That's the good promise we saw. At that moment, Starbuck caught sight of Stubb's face, slowly beginning to glimmer into sight. Glancing upwards, he cried, See! See! And once more, the high, tapering flames were beheld with what seemed redoubled supernaturalness in their pallor. The Corpus Ants have mercy on us all, cried Stubb again. At the base of the mainmast, full beneath the doubloon and the flame, the Parsi was kneeling in Ahab's front, but with his head bowed away from him, while nearby, from the arched and overhanging rigging where they had just been engaged securing a spar, a number of the seamen, arrested by the glare, now cohered together and hung pendulous like a knot of numbed wasps from a drooping orchard twig. In various enchanted attitudes, like the standing or stepping or running skeletons in Herculaneum, others remained rooted to the deck, but all their eyes upcast. Aye, aye, men, cried Ahab. Look up at it, mark it well. The white flame but lights the way to the white whale. Hand me those mainmast links there. I would fain feel this pulse and let mine beat against it, blood against fire. So... Then, turning, the last link held fast in his left hand, he put his foot upon the Parsi, and with fixed upward eye and high-flung right arm, he stood erect before the lofty, tripointed trinity of flames. O oh, thou clear spirit of clear fire, whom on these seas I as a Persian once did worship, till in the sacramental act so burned by thee that to this hour I bear the scar, I now know thee, thou clear spirit, and I now know that thy right worship is defiance. To neither love nor reverence wilt thou be kind, and e'en for hate thou canst but kill, and all are killed. No fearless fool now fronts thee. I own thy speechless, placeless power, but to the last gasp of my earthquake life will dispute its unconditional, unintegral mastery in me. In the midst of the personified impersonal, a personality stands here. Though but a point at best, whensoe'er I came, wheresoe'er I go, yet while I earthly live, the queenly personality lives in me and feels her royal rights. But war is pain and hate is woe. Come in thy lowest form of love, and I will kneel and kiss thee. But at thy highest come as mere supernal power, and though thou launchest navies of full freighted worlds, there's that in here that still remains indifferent. O oh, thou clear spirit, of thy fire thou madest me, and like a true child of fire, I breathe it back to thee. Sudden repeated flashes of lightning. The nine flames leap lengthwise to thrice their previous height. Ahab with the rest closes his eyes, his right hand pressed hard upon them. I own thy speechless, placeless power, said I not so? nor was it wrung from me, nor do I now drop these links. Thou canst blind, but I can then grope. Thou canst consume, but I can then be ashes. Take the homage of these poor eyes and shut her hands, I would not take it. The lightning flashes through my skull, mine eyeballs ache and ache, my whole beaten brain seems as beheaded and rolling on some stunning ground. Oh, oh, yet blindfold, yet will I talk to thee. Light though thou be, thou leapest out of darkness, but I am darkness leaping out of light, leaping out of thee. The javelin cease, open eyes. See or not, there burn the flames. 
O thou magnanimous, now I do glory in my genealogy. But thou art but my fiery father, my sweet mother I know not. O cruel, what hast thou done with her? There lies my puzzle. But thine is greater. Thou knowest not how came ye. Hence callest thyself unbegotten. Certainly knowest not thy beginning. Hence callest thyself unbegun. I know that of me which thou knowest not of thyself, O thou omnipotent. There is some unsuffusing thing beyond thee, thou clear spirit, to whom all thy eternity is but time, all thy creativeness mechanical. Through thee, thy flaming self, my scorched eyes do dimly see it. O oh, thou foundling fire, thou hermit immemorial, thou too hast thy incommunicable riddle, thy unparticipated grief. Here again with haughty agony I read my sire. Leap! Leap up and lick the sky! I leap with thee, I burn with thee, would fain be welded with thee, defyingly I worship thee. The boat! The boat! cried Starbuck. Look at thy boat, old man! Ahab's harpoon, the one forged at Perth's fire, remained firmly lashed in its conspicuous crotch, so that it projected beyond his whaleboat's bow. But the sea that had stove its bottom had caused the loose leather sheath to drop off, and from the keen steel barb there now came a leveled flame of pale, forked fire. As the silent harpoon burned there like a serpent's tongue, Starbuck grasped Ahab by the arm. God! God is against thee, old man! Forbear! Tis an ill voyage, ill begun, ill continued. Let me square the odds while we may, old man, and make a fair wind of it homewards to go on a better voyage than this. Overhearing Starbuck, the panic-stricken crew instantly ran to the braces, though not a sail was left aloft. For the moment all the aghast mates' thoughts seemed theirs. They raised a half-mutinous cry. But dashing the rattling lightning links to the deck and snatching the burning harpoon, Ahab waved it like a torch among them, swearing to transfix with it the first sailor that but cast loose a rope's end. Petrified by his aspect and still more shrinking from the fiery dart that he held, the men fell back in dismay, and Ahab spoke again. All your oaths to hunt the white whale are as binding as mine. And heart, soul, and body, lungs, and life, old Ahab is bound. And that ye may know to what tune this heart beats, look ye here. Thus I blow out the last fear. And with one blast of his breath he extinguished the flame. As in the hurricane that sweeps the plain, men fly the neighborhood of some lone gigantic elm whose very height and strength but render it so much the more unsafe, because so much the more a mark for thunderbolts. So at those last words of Ahab's, many of the mariners did run from him in a terror of dismay. Chapter 120 the deck towards the end of the first night watch. Ahab standing by the helm, Starbuck approaching him. Uh, we must send down the main topsail yard, sir. The band is working loose, and the lee lift is half stranded. Shall I strike it, sir? Strike nothing. Lash it. If I had skysail poles, I'd sway them up now. Sir? In God's name, sir? Well, the anchors are working, sir. Shall I get them inboard? Strike nothing and stir nothing, but lash everything. The wind rises, but it has not gone up to my table lands yet. Quick and see to it. By masts and keels, he takes me for the hunchbacked skipper of some coasting smack. Send down my main topsail yard. Oh, glue pots! Loftiest trucks were made for wildest winds, and this brain truck of mine now sails amid the cloud scud. Shall I strike that? Oh, none but cowards send down their brain trucks in tempest time. What a hurusha off there. I would even take it for sublime, did I not know that the colic is a noisy malady. Now oh, take medicine, take medicine. Chapter 121 Midnight, the forecastle bulwarks. Stub and flask mounted on them and passing additional lashings over the anchors they are hanging. No, Stubb, you may pound that knot there as much as you please, but you will never pound into me what you were just now saying. And how long ago is it since you said the very contrary? Didn't you once say that whatever ship Ahab sails in, that ship should pay something extra on its insurance policy, just as though it were loaded with powder barrels aft and boxes of lucifers forward? Stop now, didn't you say so? Well, suppose I did. What then? 
I've part changed my flesh since that time. Why not my mind? Besides, supposing we are loaded with powder barrels aft and lucifers forward, how the devil could the lucifers get a fire in this drenching spray here? Why, my little man, you have pretty red hair, but you couldn't get a fire now. Shake yourself. Your Aquarius or the water bearer flask might fill pitchers at your coat collar. Don't you see, then, that for these extra risks, the marine insurance companies have extra guarantees? Here are hydrants, Flask. But hark again, and I'll answer you the other thing. First, take your leg off from the crown of the anchor here, though, so I can pass the rope. Now listen. What's the mighty difference between holding a mast's lightning rod in the storm and standing close by a mast that hasn't got any lightning rod at all in the storm? Don't you see, your timber head, that no harm can come to the holder of the rod unless the mast is first struck? What are you talking about, then? Not one ship in a hundred carries rods. And Ahab, I, man, and all of us were in no more danger then, in my poor opinion, than all the crews in ten thousand ships now sailing the seas. Why, you king post you, I suppose you would have every man in the world go about with a small lightning rod running up the corner of his hat, like a militia officer's skewered feather and trailing behind like his sash. Why don't you be sensible, Flask? It's easy to be sensible. Why don't you, then? Any man with half an eye can be sensible. I don't know that, Stubb. You sometimes find it rather hard. Yes, when a fellow's so through, it's hard to be sensible, that's a fact. And I'm about drenched with his spray. Never mind. Catch the turn there and pass it. Seems to me we're lashing down these anchors now as if they were never going to be used again. Tying these two anchors here, Flask, seems like tying a man's hands behind him. And what big, generous hands they are, to be sure. These are your iron fists, eh? What a hold they have, too. I wonder, Flask, whether the world is anchored anywhere. If she is, she swings with an uncommon long cable, though. There, hammer that nut down and we've done. So, next to touching land, lighting on deck is the most satisfactory. I say, just bring out my jacket skirts, will ya? Thank you. They laugh at long togs, so, Flask. But seems to me a long-tailed coat ought always to be worn in all storms afloat. The tails tapering down that way serve to carry off the water, do you see? Same with cocked hats, the cocksworm gable end eave troughs, Flask. No more monkey jackets and tarpaulins for me. I must mount a swallowtail and drive down a beaver. So, hello! Whew. There goes my tarpaulin overboard. Lord, Lord, that the winds that come from heaven should be so unmannerly. This is a nasty night, lad. Chapter 122. Midnight aloft, thunder and lightning. The main topsail yard. Tashtigo passing new lashings around it. Um, um, um. Stop that thunder. Plenty too much thunder up here. What's the use of thunder? Um, um, um. We don't want thunder, we want rum. Give us a glass of rum. Um, um, um. Chapter 123. The Musket. During the most violent shocks of the typhoon, the man at the Pequod's jawbone tiller had several times been reelingly hurled to the deck by its spasmodic motions, even though preventer tackles had been attached to it, for they were slack, because some play to the tiller was indispensable. In a severe gale like this, while the ship is but a tossed shuttlecock to the blast, it is by no means uncommon to see the needles in the compasses at intervals go round and round. It was thus with the Pequod's. At almost every shock, the helmsmen had not failed to notice the whirling velocity with which they revolved upon the cards. It is a sight that hardly anyone can behold without some sort of unwanted emotion. Some hours after midnight, the typhoon abated so much that through the strenuous exertions of Starbuck and Stubb, one engaged forward and the other aft, the shivered remnants of the jib and fore and main topsails were cut adrift from the spars and went eddying away to leeward like the feathers of an albatross, which sometimes are cast to the winds when that storm-tossed bird is on the wing. The three corresponding new sails were now bent and reefed, and a storm trysail was set further aft, so that the ship soon went through the water with some precision again, and the course for the present east-southeast, which it was to steer if practicable, was once more given to the helmsman. For during the violence of the gale, he had only steered according to its vicissitudes, but as he was now bringing the ship as near her course as possible, watching the compass meanwhile, lo, a good sign. The wind seemed coming around astern. Aye, the foul breeze became fair. Instantly the yards were squared to the lively song of Ho, the fair wind! Oh, ye ho! Cheerly, men! The crew singing for joy that so promising an event should so soon have falsified the evil portents preceding it. 
In compliance with the standing order of his commander to report immediately and at any one of the twenty-four hours any decided change in the affairs of the deck, Starbuck had no sooner trimmed the yards to the breeze, however reluctantly and gloomily, than he mechanically went below to apprise Captain Ahab of the circumstance. Ere knocking at his stateroom, he involuntarily paused before it a moment. The cabin lamp, taking long swings this way and that, was burning fitfully and casting fitful shadows upon the old man's bolted door, a thin one with fixed blinds inserted in place of upper panels. The isolated subterraneousness of the cabin made a certain humming silence to reign there, though it was hooped round by all the roar of the elements. The loaded muskets in the rack were shiningly revealed as they stood upright against the forward bulkhead. Starbuck was an honest, upright man, but out of Starbuck's heart, at that instant when he saw the muskets, there strangely evolved an evil thought, but so blent with its neutral or good accompaniments that for the instant he hardly knew it for itself. He would have shot me once, he murmured. Yes, there's the very musket that he pointed at me. That one with the studded stock. Let me touch it. Lift it. Strange that I, who have handled so many deadly lances, strange that I should shake so now. Loaded? I must see. I, I and powder in the pan. That's not good. Best spill it? Wait. I'll cure myself of this. I'll hold the musket boldly while I think. I come to report a fair wind to him. But how fair? Fair for death and doom. That's fair for Moby Dick. It's a fair wind that's only fair for that accursed fish. The very tube he pointed at me, the very one, this one. I hold it here. He would have killed me with the very thing I handle now. Aye, and he would fain kill all his crew. Does he not say he will not strike his spars to any gale? Has he not dashed his heavenly quadrant? And in these same perilous seas gropes he not his way by mere dead reckoning of the error-abounding log? And in this very typhoon did he not swear that he would have no lightning rods? But shall this crazed old man be tamely suffered to drag a whole ship's company down to doom with him? Yes, it would make him the willful murderer of thirty men and more if this ship come to any deadly harm, and come to deadly harm, my soul swears, this ship will, if Ahab have his way. If then he were this instant put aside, that crime would not be his. Ah, is he muttering in his sleep? Yes, just there. In there he's sleeping. Sleeping? Aye, but still alive and soon awake again. I can't withstand thee then, old man. Not reasoning, not remonstrance, not entreaty wilt thou hearken to, all this thou scornest. Flat obedience to thy own flat commands, this is all thou breathest. Aye, and sayest the men have vowed thy vow, sayest all of us are Ahab's, great God forbid. But is there no other way? No lawful way? Make him a prisoner to be taken home? What? Hope to wrest this old man's living power from his own living hands? Only a fool would try it. Say he were pinioned even, knotted all over with ropes and hawsers, chained down to ring bolts on this cabin floor, he would be more hideous than a caged tiger then. I could not endure the sight, could not possibly fly his howlings. All comfort, sleep itself, inestimable reason would leave me on the long, intolerable voyage. What then remains? The land is hundreds of leagues away and locked Japan the nearest. I stand alone here upon an open sea with two oceans and a whole continent between me and law. Aye, aye, tis so. Is heaven a murderer when its lightning strikes a would-be murderer in his bed, tindering sheets and skin together? And would I be a murderer then if... And slowly, stealthily, and half sideways looking, he placed the loaded musket's end against the door. On this level Ahab's hammock swings within, his head this way. A touch, and Starbuck may survive to hug his wife and child again. Oh, Mary, Mary, boy, boy, boy. But if I wake thee not to death, old man, 
Who can tell to what unsounded deep Starbuck's body this day week may sink with all the crew? Great God, where art thou? Shall I? Shall I? The wind has gone down and shifted, sir. The four falling topsails are reefed and set. She heads her course. Stern all. Oh, oh, Moby Dick, I clutch thy heart at last. Such were the sounds that now came hurtling from out the old man's tormented sleep, as if Starbuck's voice had caused the long, dumb dream to speak. The yet leveled musket shook like a drunkard's arm against the panel. Starbuck seemed wrestling with an angel. But turning from the door, he placed the death tube in its rack and left the place. He's too sound asleep, Mr. Stubb. Go thou down and wake him and tell him. I must see the deck here. Thou knowest what to say. Chapter 124 The Needle Next morning, the not-yet-subsided sea rolled in long, slow billows of mighty bulk, and striving in the Pequod's gurgling track pushed her on like giant's palms outspread. The strong, unstaggering breeze abounded so that sky and air seemed vast, outbellying sails. The whole world boomed before the wind. Muffled in the full morning light, the invisible sun was only known by the spread intensity of his place, whereas bayonet rays moved on in stacks. Emblazonings, as of crowned Babylonian kings and queens, reigned over everything. The sea was as a crucible of molten gold that bubblingly leaps with light and heat. Long maintaining an enchanted silence, Ahab stood apart, and every time the teetering ship loweringly pitched down her bowsprit, he turned to eye the bright sun's rays produced ahead, and when she profoundly settled by the stern, he turned behind and saw the sun's rearward place and how the same yellow rays were blending with his undeviating wake. Ha ha, my ship! Thou might as well be taken now for the sea chariot of the sun. Ho, ho, all ye nations before my prow, I bring the sun to ye. Yoke on the further billows, hello, a tandem, I drive the sea. But suddenly reined back by some counter thought, he hurried towards the helm, huskily demanding how the ship was heading. East, south, east, sir, said the frightened steersman. Thou liest, smiting him with his clenched fist. Heading east at this hour in the morning, and the sun astern? Upon this, every soul was confounded, for the phenomenon just then observed by Ahab had unaccountably escaped everyone else. But its very blinding palpableness must have been the cause. Thrusting his head halfway into the binnacle, Ahab caught one glimpse of the compasses. His uplifted arm slowly fell. For a moment, he almost seemed to stagger. Standing behind him, Starbuck looked and lo, the two compasses pointed east, and the Pequod was as infallibly going west. But ere the first wild alarm could get out abroad among the crew, the old man with a rigid laugh exclaimed, I have it. It has happened before, Mr. Starbuck. Last night's thunder turned our compasses, that's all. I was before now heard of such a thing, I take it. Aye, but never before has it happened to me, sir said the pale mate gloomily. Here it must needs be said that accidents like this have in more than one case occurred to ships in violent storms. The magnetic energy, as developed in the mariner's needle, is, as all know, essentially one with the electricity beheld in heaven. Hence, it is not to be much marveled at that such things should be. In instances where the lightning has actually struck the vessel so as to smite down some of the spars and rigging, the effect upon the needle has at times been still more fatal, all its lodestone virtue being annihilated, so that the before magnetic steel was of no more use than an old wife's knitting needle. But in either case, the needle never again of itself recovers the original virtue thus marred or lost, and if the binnacle compasses be affected, the same fate reaches all the others that may be in the ship, even were the lowermost one inserted into the kelson. Deliberately standing before the binnacle, and eyeing the transpointed compasses, the old man, with a sharp of his extended hand, now took the precise bearing of the sun, 
and satisfied that the needles were exactly inverted, shouted out his orders for the ship's course to be changed accordingly. The yards were braced hard up, and once more the Pequod thrust her undaunted bows into the opposing wind, for the supposed fair one had only been juggling her. Meanwhile, whatever were his own secret thoughts, Starbuck said nothing, but quietly he issued all requisite orders, while Stubb and Flask, who in some small degree seemed them to be sharing his feelings, likewise unmurmuringly acquiesced. As for the men, though some of them lowly rumbled, their fear of Ahab was greater than their fear of fate. But as ever before, the pagan harpooners remained almost wholly unimpressed, or if impressed, it was only with a certain magnetism shot into their congenial hearts from inflexible Ahabs. For a space, the old man walked the deck in rolling reveries, but chancing to slip with his ivory heel, he saw the crushed copper sight tubes of the quadrant he had the day before dashed to the deck. Thou poor, proud heaven gazer and sun's pilot, yesterday I wrecked thee, and today the compasses would fain have wrecked me. So, so. But Ahab is lord over the level lodestone yet. Mr. Starbuck, a lance without the pole, a top maul on the smallest of the sailmaker's needles. Quick! Accessory, perhaps, to the impulse dictating the thing he was now about to do were certain prudential motives, whose object might have been to revive the spirits of his crew by a stroke of his subtle skill in a matter so wondrous as that of the inverted compasses. Besides, the old man well knew that to steer by transpointed needles, though clumsily practicable, was not a thing to be passed over by superstitious sailors without some shudderings and evil portents. Men, said he, steadily turning upon the crew as the mate handed him the things he had demanded, my men, the thunder turned old Ahab's needles, but out of this bit of steel Ahab can make one of his own that will point as true as any. Abashed glances of servile wonder were exchanged by the sailors as this was said, and with fascinated eyes they awaited whatever magic might follow. But Starbuck looked away. With a blow from the top maul, Ahab knocked off the steel head of the lance, and then handing to the mate the long iron rod remaining, bade him hold it upright without its touching the deck. Then, with the maul, after repeatedly smiting the upper end of this iron rod, he placed the blunted needle endwise on the top of it, and less strongly hammered that several times, the mate still holding the rod as before. Then, going through some small, strange motions with it, whether indispensable to the magnetizing of the steel or merely intended to augment the awe of the crew is uncertain, he called for linen thread, and moving to the binnacle, slipped out the two reversed needles there and horizontally suspended the sail needle by its middle over one of the compass cards. At first the steel went round and round, quivering and vibrating at either end, but at last it settled to its place, when Ahab, who had been intently watching for this result, stepped frankly back from the binnacle, and pointing his stretched arm towards it, exclaimed, Look here for yourselves, if Ahab be not lord of the level lodestone. The sun is east, and that compass swears it. One after another they peered in, for nothing but their own eyes could persuade such ignorance as theirs, and one after another they slunk away. In his fiery eyes of scorn and triumph, you then saw Ahab in all his fatal pride. Chapter 125 The Log and Line while now the fated Pequod had been so long afloat this voyage, the log and line had but very seldom been in use. Owing to a confident reliance upon other means of determining the vessel's place, some merchantmen and many whalemen, especially when cruising, wholly neglect to heave the log, though at the same time, and frequently more for form's sake than anything else, regularly putting down upon the customary slate the course steered by the ship, as well as the presumed average rate of progression every hour. It had been thus with the Pequod, the wooden reel and angular log attached hung long untouched just beneath the railing of the after bulwarks. Rains and spray had damped it, sun and wind had warped it. All the elements had combined to rot the thing that hung so idly. But heedless of all this, his mood seized Ahab as he happened to glance upon the reel not many hours after the magnet scene, and he remembered how his quadrant was no more and recalled his frantic oath about the level log and line. The ship was sailing plungingly, 
Astern, the billows rolled in riots. Forward there, heave the log! Two seamen came, the golden-hued Tahitian and the grisly Manxman. Take the real one of you, I'll heave. They went towards the extreme stern on the ship's lee side, where the deck, with the oblique energy of the wind, was now almost dripping into the creamy, sidelong, rushing sea. The Manxman took the reel, and holding it high up by the projecting handle ends of the spindle, round which the spool of line revolved, so stood with the angular log hanging downwards till Ahab advanced to him. Ahab stood before him and was lightly unwinding some thirty or forty turns to form a preliminary hand coil to toss overboard, when the old Manxman, who was intently eyeing both him and the line, made bold to speak. Sir, I mistrust it. This line looks far gone. Long heat and wet have spoiled it. Twill hold, old gentleman. Long heat and wet have they spoiled thee? Thou seems to hold. More truer, perhaps, life holds thee, not thou it. I hold the spool, sir. But just as my captain says, with these grey hairs of mine, tis not worthwhile disputing, especially with a superior who'll ne'er confess. What's that? There's now a patched professor in Queen Nature's granite-founded college. But methinks he's too subservient. Where wert thou born? In the little rocky Isle of Man, sir. Excellent. Thou'st hit the world by that. I know not, sir, but I was born there. In the Isle of Man, eh? Well, the other way it's good. Here's a man from man. A man born in once independent man, and now unmanned of man, which is sucked in by what? Up with the reel. The dead blind wall butts all inquiring heads at last. Up with it. So. The log was heaved. The loose coils rapidly straightened out in a long, dragging line astern, and then instantly the reel began to whirl. In turn, jerkingly raised and lowered by the rolling billows, the towing resistance of the log caused the old reel man to stagger strangely. Hold hard! Snap! The overstrained line sagged down in one long festoon. The tugging log was gone. I crush the quadrant, the thunder turns the needles, and now the mad sea parts the log line. But Ahab can mend all. Haul in here, Tahitian, reel up, Maxman, and look here. Let the carpenter make another log, and mend thou the line. See to it. There he goes now. To him nothing's happened, but to me the skewer seems loosening out of the middle of the world. Haul in, haul in, Tahitian. These lines run whole and whirling out. Come in broken and dragging slow. Ah, Pip, come to help, eh, Pip? Pip? Whom call you Pip? Pip jumped from the whaleboat. Pip's missing. Let's see now if you haven't fished him up here, fisherman. It drags hard. I guess he's holding on. Jerk him, Tahiti! Jerk him off! We haul in no cowards! Here! Ho! Oh, there's his arm just breaking water! A hatchet! A hatchet! Cut it off! We haul in no cowards here! Captain Ahab, sir! Sir! Here's Pip trying to get on board again! Peace, thou crazy loon! cried the Manxman, seizing him by the arm. Away from the quarter-deck! The greater idiot ever scolds the lesser, muttered Ahab, advancing. Hands off from that holiness! Where sayest thou Pip was, boy? Astern there, sir, astern, low, low. And who art thou, boy? I see not my reflection in the vacant pupils of thy eyes. O oh God, that man should be a thing for immortal souls to sieve through. Who art thou, boy? Bellboy, sir, ship's crier. Ding, dong, ding, pip, pip, pip. One hundred pounds of clay reward for pip. Five feet high, looks cowardly, quickest known by that. Ding, dong, ding. Who's seen Pip the coward? There can be no hearts above the snow line. Though ye frozen heavens look down here, ye did beget this luckless child and have abandoned him, ye creative libertines. Here, boy, Ahab's cabin shall be Pip's home henceforth while Ahab lives. Thou touchest my inmost center, boy. Thou art tied to me by cords woven of my heartstrings. Come, let's down. What's this? Here's Velvet Shark skin, intently gazing at Ahab's hand and feeling it. Ah, now, had poor Pip but felt so kind a thing as this, perhaps he had ne'er been lost. This seems to me, sir, as a man rope, something that weak souls may hold by. Oh, sir, let old Perth now come and rivet these two hands together, the black one with the white, for I will not let this go. Oh, boy, nor will I thee unless I should thereby drag thee to worse horrors than are here. Come then to my cabin. 
Lo, ye believers in God's all goodness and in man all ill, lo, you see the omniscient God's oblivious of suffering man, and man, though idiotic and knowing not what he does, yet full of the sweet things of love and gratitude. Come, I feel prouder leading thee by thy black hand than though I grasped an emperor's. There go two daft ones now, muttered the old Manx man. One daft with strength, the other daft with weakness. But here's the end of the rotten line, all dripping too. Mend it, eh? I think we had best have a new line altogether. I'll see Mr. Stubb about it. Chapter 126. The Life Buoy. Steering now southeastward by Ahab's leveled steel, and her progress solely determined by Ahab's level log and line, the Pequod held on her path towards the equator. Making so long a passage through such unfrequented waters, descrying no ships, and ere long sideways impelled by unvarying trade winds over waves monotonously mild, all these seemed the strange, calm things preluding some riotous and desperate scene. At last, when the ship drew near to the outskirts, as it were, of the equatorial fishing ground, and in the deep darkness that goes before the dawn was sailing by a cluster of rocky islets, the watch, then headed by Flask, was startled by a cry so plaintively wild and unearthly, like half-articulated wailings of the ghosts of all Herod's murdered innocents, that one and all they started from their reveries and for the space of some moments stood or sat or leaned all transfixedly, listening like the carved Roman slave, while that wild cry remained within hearing. The Christian or civilized part of the crew said it was mermaids and shuddered, but the pagan harpooners remained unappalled. Yet the gray Manx man, the oldest mariner of all, declared that the wild, thrilling sounds that were heard were the voices of newly drowned men in the sea. Below, in his hammock, Ahab did not hear of this till grey dawn, when he came to the deck. It was then recounted to him by Flask, not unaccompanied with hinted dark meanings. He hollowly laughed, and thus explained the wonder. Those rocky islands the ship had passed were the resort of great numbers of seals, and some young seals that had lost their dams, or some dams that had lost their cubs, must have risen nigh the ship, and kept company with her, crying and sobbing with their human sort of wail. But this only the more affected some of them, because most mariners cherish a very superstitious feeling about seals, arising not only from their peculiar tones when in distress, but also from the human look of their round heads and semi-intelligent faces seen peeringly uprising from the water alongside. In the sea, under certain circumstances, seals have more than once been mistaken for men. But the bodings of the crew were destined to receive a most plausible confirmation in the fate of one of their number that morning. At sunrise, this man went from his hammock to his masthead at the fore, and whether it was that he was not yet half waked from his sleep, for sailors sometimes go aloft in a transition state, whether it was thus with the man, there is now no telling. But be that as it may, he had not long been at his perch when a cry was heard, a cry and a rushing, and looking up, they saw a falling phantom in the air, and looking down, a little tossed heap of white bubbles in the blue of the sea. The life buoy, a long, slender cask, was dropped from the stern, where it always hung, obedient to a cunning spring, but no hand rose to seize it, and the sun, having long beat upon this cask, it had shrunken, so that it slowly filled, and the parched wood also filled at its every pore, and the studded, iron-bound cask followed the sailor to the bottom as if to yield him his pillow, though in sooth but a hard one. And thus the first man of the Pequod that mounted the mast to look out for the white whale on the white whale's own peculiar ground, that man was swallowed up in the deep. But few perhaps thought of that at the time. Indeed, in some sort, they were not grieved at this event, at least as a portent, for they regarded it not as a foreshadowing of evil in the future, but as the fulfillment of an evil already presaged. They declared that now they knew the reason of those wild shrieks they had heard the night before. But again the old Manxman said nay. The lost life buoy was now to be replaced. Starbuck was directed to see to it, but as no cask of sufficient lightness could be found, 
And as in the feverish eagerness of what seemed the approaching crisis of the voyage, all hands were impatient of any toil but what was directly connected with its final end, whatever that might prove to be, therefore they were going to leave the ship's stern unprovided with a buoy, when by certain strange signs and innuendos, Queequeg hinted a hint concerning his coffin. A life buoy of a coffin, cried Starbuck, starting. Rather queer, that, I should say, said Stubb. It'll make a good enough one, said Flask. The carpenter here can arrange it easily. Bring it up, there's nothing else for it, said Starbuck, after a melancholy pause. Rig it, carpenter. Do not look at me so. The coffin, I mean. Dost thou hear me? Rig it. Shall I nail down the lid, sir? Moving his hand as with a hammer. Aye. And shall I caulk the seams, sir? Moving his hand as with a caulking iron. Aye. And shall I then pay over the same with pitch, sir? Moving his hand as with a pitch pot. Away! What possesses thee to this? Make a life buoy of the coffin and no more. Mr. Stubb, Mr. Flask, come forward with me. He goes off in a huff. The hole he can endure, at the parts he balks. Now, I don't like this. I make a leg for Captain Ahab, and he wears it like a gentleman, but I make a bandbox for Queequeg, and he won't put his head into it. Are all my pains to go for nothing with that coffin? And now I'm ordered to make a life buoy of it. It's like turning an old coat, going to bring the flesh on the other side now. I don't like this cobbling sort of business. I don't like it at all. It's undignified. It's not my place. Let tinkers' brats do tinkerings. We are their betters. I like to take in hand none but clean, virgin, fair and square mathematical jobs. Something that regularly begins at the beginning and is at the middle when midway and comes to an end at the conclusion. Not a cobbler's job that's at an end in the middle and at the beginning at the end. It's the old woman's tricks to be giving cobbling jobs. Lord, what an affection all old women have for tinkers. I know an old woman of 65 who ran away with a bald-headed young tinker once. And that's the reason I never would work for lonely widow old women ashore when I kept my job shop in the vineyard. They might have taken it into their lonely old heads to run off with me. But hey-ho, there are no caps at sea but snow caps. Let me see. Nail down the lid, caulk the seams, pay over the same with pitch, batten them down tight and hang it with a snap spring over the ship's stern. Wherever such things done before with a coffin, some superstitious old carpenters now would be tied up in the rigging ere they would do the job. But I'm made of knotty arutstuk hemlock, I don't budge. Cruppered with a coffin, sailing about with a graveyard tray. But never mind. We workers in woods make bridal bedsteads and card tables as well as coffins and hearses. We work by the month or by the job or by the profit. Not for us to ask the why and wherefore of our work, unless it be too confounded cobbling, and then we stash it if we can. Hmm. I'll do the job now tenderly. I'll have me... Let's see, how many in the ship's company all told? But I've forgotten. Anyway, I'll have me thirty separate Turks-headed lifelines, each three feet long, hanging all round to the coffin. Then, if the hull go down, there'll be thirty lively fellows all fighting for one coffin, a sight not seen very often beneath the sun. Come, hammer, caulking iron, pitch pot, and marling spike, let's to it. Chapter 127 The Deck the coffin laid upon two line tubs between the vice bench and the open hatchway, the carpenter caulking its seams, the string of twisted oakum slowly unwinding from a large roll of it placed in the bosom of his frock. Ahab comes slowly from the cabin gangway and hears Pip following him. Back, lad. I will be with you again presently. He goes. Not this hand complies with my humor more genially than that boy. Middle Isle of a church! What's here? Life buoy, sir. Mr. Starbuck's orders. Oh, look, sir, beware the hatchway. Thank you, man. Thy coffin lies handy to the vault. Sir? The hatchway. Oh, so it does, sir, so it does. Art thou not the leg maker? Look, did not this stump come from thy shop? I believe it did, sir. Uh, does the fair rule stand, sir? Well enough. But art thou not also the undertaker? Aye, sir. I patched up this thing here as a coffin for Queequeg, but they've set me now to turning it into something else. Then tell me, art thou not an errant, all-grasping, intermeddling, monopolizing, heathenish old scamp to be one day making legs and the next day coffins to clap them in, and yet again life buoys out of those same coffins? 
Thou art as unprincipled as the gods, and as much of a jack of all trades. But I do not mean anything, sir. I do as I do. The gods again. Hark ye, dost thou not ever sing working about a coffin? The titans, they say, hum snatches when chipping out the craters for volcanoes, and the grave digger in the play sings spade in hand. Dost thou never sing, sir? Do I sing? Oh, I'm indifferent enough, sir, for that. But the reason why the grave digger made music must have been because there was none in his spade, sir. But the cocking mallet is full of it. Hark to it. Aye. And that's because the lid there's a sounding board. And what in all things make the sounding board is this, there's not beneath. And yet a coffin with a body in it rings pretty much the same, carpenter. Hast thou ever helped carry a beer and heard the coffin knock against the churchyard gate going in? Faith, sir, I've... Faith? What's that? Why, faith, sir, it's only a sort of exclamation like, that's all, sir. Mm-hmm. Go on. I was about to say, sir, that art thou a silkworm? Dost thou spin thy own shroud out of thyself? Look at thy bosom. Dispatch and get these traps out of sight. He goes aft. That was sudden now. But squalls come sudden in hot latitudes. I've heard that the Isle of Albemarle, one of the Galapagos, is cut by the equator right in the middle. Seems to me some sort of equator cuts yon old man, too, right in his middle. He's always under the line. Fiery hot, I tell you. He's looking this way. Come, Oakum, quick, here we go again. This wooden mallet is the cork, and I'm the professor of musical glasses. Tap, tap. Ahab to himself. There's a sight. There's a sound. The gray-headed woodpecker tapping the hollow tree. Blind and dumb might well be envied now. See, that thing rests on two line tubs full of tow lines. A most malicious wag, that fellow. Rat-tat, so man's seconds tick. Oh, how immaterial are all materials. What things real are there but imponderable thoughts? Here now's the very dreaded symbol of grim death, by a mere hap made the expressive sign of the help and hope of most endangered life. A life buoy of a coffin. Does it go further? Can it be said that in some spiritual sense the coffin is, after all, but an immortality preserver? I'll think of that. But no. So far gone am I in the dark side of Earth, that its other side, the theoretic bright one, seems but uncertain twilight to me. Will you never have done, Carpenter, with that accursed sound? I go below. Let me not see that thing here when I return again. Now then, Pip, we'll talk this over. I do suck most wondrous philosophies from thee. Some unknown conduits from the unknown worlds must empty into thee. Chapter 128 The Pequod Meets the Rachel Next day, a large ship, the Rachel, was descried, bearing directly down upon the Pequod all her spars thickly clustering with men. At the time, the Pequod was making good speed through the water, but as the broad-winged, windward stranger shot nigh to where the boastful sails all fell together as blank bladders that are burst, and all life fled from the smitten hull. Bad news! She brings bad news! muttered the old Manxman. But ere her commander, who with trumpet to mouth stood up in his boat, ere he could hopefully hail, Ahab's voice was heard. Hast seen the white whale? Aye, yesterday. Have you seen a whaleboat adrift? Throttling his joy, Ahab negatively answered this unexpected question, and would then have fain boarded the stranger when the stranger captain himself, having stopped his vessel's way, was seen descending her side. A few keen pulls and his boat hook soon clinched the Pequod's main chains, and he sprang to the deck. Immediately he was recognized by Ahab for a Nantucketer he knew, but no formal salutation was exchanged. Where was he? Not killed, not killed, cried Ahab, closely advancing. How was it? It seemed that somewhat late on the afternoon of the day previous, while three of the stranger's boats were engaged with a shoal of whales, which had led them some four or five miles from the ship, and while they were yet in swift chase to windward, the white hump and head of Moby Dick had suddenly loomed up out of the blue water not very far to leeward, whereupon the fourth rigged boat, a reserved one, had been instantly lowered in chase. 
After a keen sail before the wind, this fourth boat, the swiftest keeled of all, seemed to have succeeded in fastening, at least as well as the man at the masthead could tell anything about it. In the distance he saw the diminished, dotted boat, and then a swift gleam of bubbling white water, and after that nothing more, whence it was concluded that the stricken whale must have indefinitely run away with his pursuers, as often happens. There was some apprehension, but no positive alarm as yet. The recall signals were placed in the rigging, darkness came on, and forced to pick up her three far-to-windward boats, ere going in quest of the fourth one in the precisely opposite direction, the ship had not only been necessitated to leave that boat to its fate till near midnight, but for the time to increase her distance from it. But the rest of her crew being at last safe aboard, she crowded all sails, stunsel on stunsel, after the missing boat, kindling a fire in her tripods for a beacon, and every other man aloft on the lookout. But though when she had thus sailed a sufficient distance to gain the presumed place of the absent ones when last seen, though she then paused to lower her spare boats to pull all around her and not finding anything had again dashed on, again paused and lowered her boats, and though she had thus continued doing till daylight, yet not the least glimpse of the missing keel had been seen. The story told, the stranger captain immediately went on to reveal his object in boarding the Pequod. He desired that ship to unite with his own in the search, by sailing over the sea some four or five miles apart on parallel lines, and so sweeping a double horizon, as it were. "'I will wager something now,' whispered Stubb to Flask, "'that someone in that missing boat wore off that captain's best coat, mayhap his watch. He's so cursed anxious to get it back. Who ever heard of two pious whale ships cruising after one missing whaleboat in the height of the whaling season? See, Flask, only see how pale he looks, pale in the very buttons of his eyes. Look, it wasn't the coat, it must have been the... My boy! My own boy is among them. For God's sake, I beg, I conjure, here exclaimed the stranger captain to Ahab, who thus far had but icily received his petition. For eight and forty hours let me charter your ship. I will gladly pay for it, and roundly pay for it, if there be no other way. For eight and forty hours only, only that... You must, oh, you must, and you shall do this thing. His son, cried Stubb. Oh, it's his son he's lost. I take back the coat and watch. What says Ahab? We must save that boy. He's drowned with the rest of them last night, said the old Manx sailor standing behind him. I heard, all of you heard their spirits. Now, as it shortly turned out, what made this incident of the Rachels the more melancholy was the circumstance that not only was one of the captain's sons among the number of the missing boat's crew, but among the number of the other boat's crews at the same time, but on the other hand, separated from the ship during the dark vicissitudes of the chase, there had been still another son. As that for a time, the wretched father was plunged to the bottom of the cruelest perplexity, which was only solved for him by his chief mates instinctively adopting the ordinary procedure of a whale ship in such emergencies. That is, when placed between jeopardized but divided boats, always to pick up the majority first. But the captain, for some unknown constitutional reason, had refrained from mentioning all this, and not till forced to it by Ahab's iciness did he allude to his one yet missing boy, a little lad but twelve years old, whose father, with the earnest but unmisgiving hardihood of a Nantucketer's paternal love, had thus early sought to initiate him in the perils and wonders of a vocation almost immemorially the destiny of all his race. Nor does it unfrequently occur that Nantucket captains will send a son of such tender age away from them for a protracted three or four years' voyage in some other ship than their own, so that their first knowledge of a whaleman's career shall be unenervated by any chance display of a father's natural but untimely partiality or undue apprehensiveness and concern. Meantime, now the stranger was still beseeching his poor boon of Ahab, and Ahab still stood like an anvil, receiving every shock but without the least quivering of his own. I will not go, said the stranger, till you say aye to me. Do to me as you would have me do to you in the like case, for you too have a boy, Captain Ahab, though but a child and nestling safely at home now, a child of your old age too. Yes, yes, you relent, I see it. Run, run, men now, and stand by to square in the yards. Avast, cried Ahab, touch not a rope yarn. Then in a voice that prolongingly molded every word, Captain Gardiner, I will not do it. 
Even now I lose time. Goodbye. Goodbye. God bless you, man, and may I forgive myself, but I must go. Mr. Starbuck, look at the binnacle watch. And in three minutes from this present instant, warn off all strangers, then brace forward again and let the ship sail as before. Hurriedly turning with averted face, he descended into his cabin, leaving the strange captain transfixed at this unconditional and utter rejection of his so earnest suit. But starting from his enchantment, Gardner silently hurried to the side, more fell than stepped into his boat, and returned to his ship. Soon the two ships diverged their wakes, and long as the strange vessel was in view, she was seen to yaw hither and thither at every dark spot, however small, on the sea. This way and that way her yards were swung round, starboard and larboard she continued to tack. Now she beat against the head sea, and again it pushed her before it, while all the while her masts and yards were thickly clustered with men as three tall cherry trees when the boys are cherrying among the boughs. But by her still halting course and winding woeful way, you plainly saw that this ship that so wept with spray still remained without comfort. She was Rachel weeping for her children because they were not. Chapter 129. The Cabin. Ahab moving to go on deck, Pip catches him by the hand to follow. Lad, lad, I tell thee, thou must not follow Ahab now. The hour is coming when Ahab would not scare thee from him, yet would not have thee by him. There is that in thee, poor lad, which I feel too curing to my malady. Like cures, like, and for this hunt my malady becomes my most desired health. Do thou abide below here, where they shall serve thee as if thou wert the captain. Aye, lad, thou shalt sit here in my own screwed chair, another screwed to it thou must be. No, 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 ye, ye have not a whole body, sir. Do ye but use poor me for your one lost leg. Only tread upon me, sir, I ask no more, so I remain a part of you. Oh, spite of million villains, this makes me a bigot in the fadeless fidelity of man, and a black and crazy. But methinks like cures like applies to him too. He grows so sane again. They tell me, sir, that Stubb did once desert poor little Pip, whose drowned bones now show white for all the blackness of his living skin. But I will never desert you, sir, as Stubb did him. Sir, I must go with you. If thou speakest thus to me much more, Ahab's purpose keels up in him. I tell thee, no, it cannot be. O oh, good master, master, master! Weep so, and I will murder thee. Have a care, for Ahab too is mad. Listen, and thou wilt often hear my ivory foot upon the deck, and still know that I am there. And now I quit thee. Thy hand, met. True art thou, lad, as the circumference to its center. So, God forever bless thee, and if it come to that, God forever save thee, let what will befall. Ahab goes, Pip steps one step forward. Here he this instant stood. I stand in his air, but I'm alone. Now were even poor Pip here, I could endure it, but he's missing. Pip, Pip, ding dong ding, who's seen Pip? He must be up here. Let's try the door. What? Neither lock, nor bolt, nor bar, and yet there's no opening it. It must be the spell. He told me to stay here. Aye, and told me this screwed chair was mine. Here then I'll seat me against the transom in the ship's full middle, all her keel and her three masts before me. Here our old sailors say in their black seventy-fours great admirals sometimes sit at table and lord it over rows of captains and lieutenants. Ah, what's this? Epaulets! Epaulets! The epaulets all come crowding. Pass round the decanters. Glad to see ya. Philip, messieurs! What an odd feeling now when a black boy is host to white men with gold lace upon their coats. Messieurs, have you seen one Pip? A little negro lad, five feet high, hangdog look, and cowardly. Jumped from a whaleboat once. Seen him? No. Well then, fill up again, captains, and let's drink shame upon all cowards. I name no names. Shame upon them. Put one foot upon the table. Shame upon all cowards. Hist! Above there I hear ivory. Oh, master, master, I am indeed downhearted when you walk over me. 
but here I'll stay. Though this stern strikes rocks and they bulge through, and oysters come to join me. Chapter 130. The Hat. And now that at the proper time and place, after so long and wide a preliminary cruise, Ahab, all other wailing waters swept, seemed to have chased his foe into an ocean fold to slay him the more securely there. Now that he found himself hard by the very latitude and longitude where his tormenting wound had been inflicted, now that a vessel had been spoken which on the very day preceding had actually encountered Moby Dick, and now that all his successive meetings with various ships contrastingly concurred to show the demoniac indifference with which the white whale tore his hunters, whether sinning or sinned against, now it was that there lurked a something in the old man's eyes which it was hardly sufferable for feeble souls to see. As the unsetting polar star, which through the live-long Arctic six-months night sustains its piercing, steady, central gaze, so Ahab's purpose now fixedly gleamed down upon the constant midnight of the gloomy crew. It domineered above them so that all their bodings, doubts, misgivings, fears, were fain to hide beneath their souls and not sprout forth a single spear or leaf. In this foreshadowing interval, too, all humor, forced or natural, vanished. Stubb no more strove to raise a smile, Starbuck no more strove to check one. Alike joy and sorrow, hope and fear, seemed ground to finest dust, and powdered for the time in the clamped mortar of Ahab's iron soul. Like machines, they dumbly moved about on the deck, ever conscious that the old man's desperate eye was on them. But did you deeply scan him in his more secret, confidential hours, when he thought no glance but one was on him? Then you would have seen that even as Ahab's eyes so awed the crews, the inscrutable Parsi's glance awed his, or somehow, at least in some wild way, at times affected it. Such an added, gliding strangeness began to invest the thin Fadala now. Such ceaseless shudderings shook him that the men looked dubious at him, half uncertain as it seemed, whether indeed he were a mortal substance, or else a tremulous shadow cast upon the deck by some unseen being's body. And that shadow was always hovering there. For not by night, even, had Fadala ever certainly been known to slumber or go below. He would stand still for hours, but never sat or leaned. His wan but wondrous eyes did plainly say, We two watchmen never rest. Nor at any time, by night or day, could the mariners now step up the deck unless Ahab was before them, either standing in his pivot hole or exactly pacing the planks between two undeviating limits, the mainmast and the mizzen. Or else they saw him standing in the cabin scuttle, his living foot advanced upon the deck as if to step, his hat slouched heavily over his eyes, so that however motionless he stood, however the days and nights were added on that he had not swung in his hammock, yet hidden beneath that slouching hat they could never tell unerringly whether for all this his eyes were really closed at times, or whether he was still intently scanning them. No matter though he stood so in the scuttle for a whole long hour on the stretch, and the unheeded night damp gathered in beads of dew upon that stone-carved coat and hat. The clothes that the night had wet, the next day's sunshine dried upon him. And so, day after day, and night after night, he went no more beneath the planks. Whatever he wanted from the cabin, that thing he sent for. He ate in the same open air, that is, his two only meals, breakfast and dinner. Supper he never touched, nor reaped his beard, which darkly grew, all gnarled as unearthed roots of trees blown over, which still grow idly on at naked base, though perished in the upper verdure. But though his whole life was now become one watch on deck, and though the Parsi's mystic watch was without intermission as his own, yet these two never seemed to speak, one man to the other, unless at long intervals some passing, unmomentous matter made it necessary. Though such a potent spell seemed secretly to join the twain, openly into the awestruck crew they seemed pole-like asunder. If by day they chanced to speak one word, by night dumb men were both, so far as concerned the slightest verbal interchange. 
At times, for longest hours, without a single hail, they stood far parted in the starlight, Ahab in his scuttle, the Parsi by the mainmast, but still fixedly gazing upon each other, as if in the Parsi Ahab saw his forethrone shadow, in Ahab the Parsi his abandoned substance. And yet somehow did Ahab, in his own proper self, as daily, hourly, and every instant commandingly revealed to his subordinates, Ahab seemed an independent lord, the Parsi but his slave. Still again, both seemed yoked together, and an unseen tyrant driving them, the lean shade siding the solid rib. For be this Parsi what he may, all rib and keel was solid Ahab. At the first faintest glimmering of the dawn, his iron voice was heard from aft. Man the mastheads! And all through the day, till after sunset and after twilight, the same voice every hour at the striking of the helmsman's bell was heard. What do you see? Sharp! Sharp! But when three or four days had slided by after meeting the children seeking Rachel, and no spout had yet been seen, the monomaniac old man seemed distrustful of his crew's fidelity. At least of nearly all except the pagan harpooners. He seemed to doubt even whether Stubb and Flask might not willingly overlook the sight he sought. But if these suspicions were really his, he sagaciously refrained from verbally expressing them, however his actions might seem to hint them. I will have the first sight of the whale myself, he said. Aye, Ahab must have the doubloon. And with his own hands he rigged a nest of basketed bolands and sending a hand aloft with a single sheathed block to secure to the mainmast head, he received the two ends of the downward reeved rope, and attaching one to his basket, prepared a pin for the other end in order to fasten it at the rail. This done, with that end yet in his hand, and standing beside the pin, he looked round upon his crew, sweeping from one to the other, pausing his glance long upon Dagu, Queequeg, and Tashtigo, but shunning Fadala and then settling his firm, relying eye upon the chief mate, said, Take the rope, sir. I give it into thy hands, Starbuck. Then arranging his person in the basket, he gave the word for them to hoist him to his perch, Starbuck being the one who secured the rope at last, and afterwards stood near it. And thus, with one hand clinging round the royal mast, Ahab gazed abroad upon the sea for miles and miles, ahead, astern, this side and that, within the wide expanded circle commanded at so great a height. When in working with his hands at some lofty, almost isolated place in the rigging, which chances to afford no foothold, the sailor at sea is hoisted up to that spot and sustained there by the rope. Under these circumstances, its fastened end on deck is always given in strict charge to some one man who has the special watch of it. Because in such a wilderness of running rigging, whose various different relations aloft cannot always be infallibly discerned by what is seen of them at the deck, and when the deck ends of these ropes are being every few minutes cast down from the fastenings, it would be but a natural fatality if, unprovided with a constant watchman, the hoisted sailor should by some carelessness of the crew be cast adrift and fall all swooping to the sea. So Ahab's proceedings in this matter were not unusual. The only strange thing about them seemed to be that Starbuck, almost the one only man who had ever ventured to oppose him with anything in the slightest degree approaching to decision, one of those two whose faithfulness on the lookout he had seemed to doubt somewhat. It was strange that this was the very man he should select for his watchman, freely giving his whole life into such an otherwise distrusted person's hands. Now the first time Ahab was perched aloft, Ari had been there ten minutes, one of those red-billed, savage seahawks, which so often fly incommodiously close round the manned mastheads of whalemen in these latitudes. One of these birds came wheeling and screaming round his head in a maze of untrackably swift circlings. Then it darted a thousand feet straight up into the air, then spiralized downwards and went eddying again round his head. But with his gaze fixed upon the dim and distant horizon, Ahab seemed not to mark this wild bird, nor indeed would anyone else have marked it much, it being no uncommon circumstance. Only now almost the least heedful eyes seemed to see some sort of cunning meaning in almost every sight. "'Your hat! Your hat, sir!' suddenly cried the Sicilian seaman, who, being posted at the mizzenmast hedge, stood directly behind Ahab, though somewhat lower than his level, and with a deep gulf of air dividing them. But already the sable wing was before the old man's eyes, the long hooked bill at his head. With a scream, the black hawk darted away with his prize. 
An eagle flew thrice round Tarquin's head, removing his cap to replace it. And thereupon Tanaquil, his wife, declared that Tarquin would be king of Rome. But only by the replacing of the cap was that omen accounted good. Ahab's hat was never restored. The wild hawk flew on and on with it, far in advance of the prow, and at last disappeared. While from the point of that disappearance, a minute black spot was dimly discerned, falling from that vast height into the sea. Chapter 131. The Pequod Meets the Delight. The intense Pequod sailed on. The rolling waves and days went by, the life buoy coffin still lightly swung, and another ship, most miserably misnamed the Delight, was descried. As she drew nigh, all eyes were fixed upon her broad beams, called shears, which in some whaling ships crossed the quarterdeck at the height of eight or nine feet, serving to carry the spare, unrigged, or disabled boats. Upon the stranger's shears were beheld the shattered white ribs and some few splintered planks of what had once been a whaleboat. But you now saw through this wreck as plainly as you see through the peeled, half-unhinged and bleaching skeleton of a horse. Hast seen the white whale? Look, replied the hollow-cheeked captain from his taffrail, and with his trumpet he pointed to the wreck. Hast killed him? The harpoon is not yet forged that will ever do that, answered the other, sadly glancing upon a rounded hammock on the deck, whose gathered sides some noiseless sailors were busy in sewing together. Not forged! And snatching Perth's leveled iron from the crotch, Ahab held it out, exclaiming, Look here, Nantucketer! Here in this hand I hold his death! Tempered in blood and tempered by lightning are these barbs, and I swear to temper them triply in that hot place behind the fin where the white whale most feels his accursed life. Then God keep thee, old man. Seest thou that? Pointing to the hammock. I bury but one of five stout men who were alive only yesterday, but were dead ere night. Only that one I bury, the rest were buried before they died, you sail upon their tomb. Then turning to his crew, Are you ready there? Place the plank then on the rail and lift the body. So then, Oh God, advancing towards the hammock with uplifted hands, May the resurrection and the life brace forward, up helm, cried Ahab like lightning to his men. But the suddenly started Pequod was not quick enough to escape the sound of the splash that the corpse soon made as it struck the sea. Not so quick indeed, but that some of the flying bubbles might have sprinkled her hull with their ghostly baptism. As Ahab now glided from the dejected delight, the strange life buoy hanging at the Pequod's stern came into conspicuous relief. Ah, yonder! Look yonder, men! cried a foreboding voice in her wake. In vain, O oh ye strangers, ye fly our sad burial. Ye but turn us your taffrail to show us your coffin. Chapter 132. The Symphony. It was a clear, steel-blue day. The firmaments of air and sea were hardly separable in that all-pervading azure. Only the pensive air was transparently pure and soft with a woman's look, and the robust and manlike sea heaved with long, strong, lingering swells as Samson's chest in his sleep. Hither and thither on high glided the snow-white wings of small, unspeckled birds. These were the gentle thoughts of the feminine air. But to and fro in the deeps, far down in the bottomless blue, rushed mighty leviathans, swordfish, and sharks, and these were the strong, troubled, murderous thinkings of the masculine sea. But though thus contrasting within, the contrast was only in shades and shadows without. Those two seemed one. It was only the sex, as it were, that distinguished them. Aloft, like a royal czar and king, the sun seemed giving this gentle air to this bold and rolling sea, even as bride to groom. And at the girdling line of the horizon, a soft and tremulous motion, most seen here at the equator, denoted the fond, throbbing trust, the loving alarms, 
with which the poor bride gave her bosom away. Tied up and twisted, gnarled and knotted with wrinkles, haggardly firm and unyielding, his eyes glowing like coals that still glow in the ashes of ruin, on tottering Ahab stood forth in the clearness of the morn, lifting his splintered helmet of a brow to the fair girl's forehead of heaven. O oh, immortal infancy and innocency of the azure! Invisible winged creatures that frolic all round us, sweet childhood of air and sky! How oblivious were ye of old Ahab's close-coiled woe! But so have I seen little Miriam and Martha, laughing-eyed elves, heedlessly gamble round their old sire, sporting with the circle of singed locks which grew on the marge of that burnt-out crater of his brain. Slowly crossing the deck from the scuttle, Ahab leaned over the side and watched how his shadow in the water sank and sank to his gaze, the more and the more that he strove to pierce the profundity. But the lovely aromas in that enchanted air did at last seem to dispel for a moment the cankerous thing in his soul. That glad, happy air, that winsome sky, did at last stroke and caress him. The stepmother world, so long cruel, forbidding, now threw affectionate arms round his stubborn neck and did seem to joyously sob over him, as if over one that, however willful and erring, she could yet find it in her heart to save and to bless. From beneath his slouched hat, Ahab dropped a tear into the sea. Nor did all the Pacific contain such wealth as that one wee drop. Starbuck saw the old man, saw him how he heavily leaned over the side, and he seemed to hear in his own true heart the measureless sobbing that stole out of the center of the serenity around. Careful not to touch him or be noticed by him, he yet drew near to him and stood there. Ahab turned. Starbuck. Sir. No, oh, Starbuck. It is a mild, mild wind and a mild looking sky. On such a day, very much such a sweetness as this, I struck my first whale. A boy harpooner of eighteen. Forty. Forty. Forty years ago. Ago. Forty years of continual wailing, forty years of privation and peril and storm time, forty years on the pitiless sea. For forty years has Ahab forsaken the peaceful land, for forty years to make war on the horrors of the deep. Aye, and yes, Starbuck, out of those forty years I have not spent three ashore. When I think of this life I have led, the desolation of solitude it has been, the masoned, walled town of a captain's exclusiveness, which admits but small entrance to any sympathy from the green country without. Her weariness, heaviness, Guinea coast slavery of solitary command. When I think of all this, only half suspected, not so keenly known to me before, and how for forty years I have fed upon dry, salted fare, fit emblem of the dry nourishment of my soul, when the poorest landsman has had fresh fruit to his daily hand and broken the world's fresh bread to my moldy crusts, her way whole oceans away from that young girl wife I wedded past fifty and sailed for Cape Horn the next day, leaving but one dent in my marriage pillow. Wife? Wife? Rather a widow with her husband alive. Aye, I widowed that poor girl when I married her, Starbuck. And then the madness, the frenzy, the boiling blood, and the smoking brow with which for a thousand lowerings old Ahab has furiously, foamingly chased his prey. More a demon than a man. Aye. Aye, what a forty years fool. Fool. Old fool has old Ahab been. Why this strife of the chase? Why weary and palsy the arm at the oar and the iron and the lance? How the richer or better is Ahab now? Behold, O oh, Starbuck, is it not hard that with this weary load I bear one poor leg should have been snatched from under me? Here, brush this old hair aside, it blinds me that I seem to weep. Locks so grey did never grow but from some ashes. But do I look very old, so very, very old, Starbuck? 
I feel deadly faint, bowed and humped, as though I were Adam staggering beneath the piled centuries since paradise. God, 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 crack my heart, stave my brain, mockery, mockery. Bitter, biting mockery of grey hairs, have I lived enough joy to wear ye, and seem and feel thus intolerably old? Close, stand close to me, Starbuck. Let me look into a human eye. It is better than to gaze into sea or sky. Better than to gaze upon God. By the green land, by the bright hearthstone. This is the magic glass, man. I see my wife and my child in thine eye. No, no, stay on board. On board. Lower not when I do. When branded Ahab gives chase to Moby Dick. That hazard shall not be thine. No, no. Not with the faraway home I see in that eye. Oh, my captain. My captain, noble soul, grand old heart after all. Why should anyone give chase to that hated fish? Away with me! Let us fly these deadly waters, let us home. Wife and child too are Starbucks, wife and child of his brotherly, sisterly, playfellow youth. Even as thine, sir, are the wife and child of thy loving, longing, paternal old age. Away! Let us away! This instant let me alter the course. How cheerily, how hilariously, O oh my captain, would we bowl on our way to see old Nantucket again. I think, sir, they have some such mild blue days even as this in Nantucket. They have. They have, I have seen them, some summer days in the morning. About this time, yes, it is his noon nap now. The boy vivaciously wakes, sits up in bed, and his mother tells him of me, of cannibal old me, how I am abroad upon the deep, but will yet come back to dance him again. But tis my Mary, my Mary herself. She promised that my boy every morning should be carried to the hill to catch the first glimpse of his father's sail. Yes, yes, no more. It is done. We head for Nantucket. Come, my captain, study out the course and let us away. See, see the boy's face from the window, the boy's hand on the hill. But Ahab's glance was averted. Like a blighted fruit tree, he shook and cast his last cindered apple to the soil. What is it? What nameless, inscrutable, unearthly thing is it? What cousining, hidden lord and master and cruel, remorseless emperor commands me that against all natural lovings and longings I so keep pushing and crowding and jamming myself on all the time, recklessly making me ready to do what in my own proper natural heart I durst not so much as dare. Is Ahab Ahab? Is it I, God, or who that lifts this arm? But if the great sun move not of himself, but is as an errand boy in heaven, nor one single star can revolve but by some invisible power. How then can this one small heart beat, this one small brain think thoughts, unless God does that beating, does that thinking, does that living, and not I? By heaven, man, we are turned round and round in this world like yonder windless, and fate is the handspike. And all the time, lo, that smiling sky and this unsounded sea. Look, see yon albacore. Who put it into him to chase and fang that flying fish? Where do murderers go, man? Who's to doom when the judge himself is dragged to the bar? But it is a mild, mild wind and a mild-looking sky, and the air smells now as if it blew from a faraway meadow. They have been making hay somewhere under the slopes of the Andes, Starbuck, and the mowers are sleeping among the new-mown hay. Sleeping? I toil how we may, we all sleep at last on the field. Sleep, aye, and rust amid greenness, as last year's scythes flung down and left in the half-cut swaths. Starbuck! But blanched to a corpse's hue with despair, the mate had stolen away. Ahab crossed the deck to gaze over on the other side, but started 
at two reflected fixed eyes in the water there. Fadala was motionlessly leaning over the same rail. Chapter 133 The Chase First Day That night, in the mid-watch, when the old man, as his wont at intervals, stepped forth from the scuttle in which he leaned and went to his pivot hole, he suddenly thrust out his face fiercely, snuffing up the sea air as a sagacious ship's dog will, in drawing nigh to some barbarous isle. He declared that a whale must be near. Soon that peculiar odor, sometimes to a great distance given forth by the living sperm whale, was palpable to all the watch. Nor was any mariner surprised when, after inspecting the compass, and then the dog vane, and then ascertaining the precise bearing of the odor as nearly as possible, Ahab rapidly ordered the ship's course to be slightly altered and the sail to be shortened. The acute policy dictating these movements was sufficiently vindicated at daybreak by the sight of a long sleek on the sea directly and lengthwise ahead, smooth as oil and resembling in the pleated, watery wrinkles bordering it the polished, metallic-like marks of some swift tide-rip at the mouth of a deep, rapid stream. Man the mastheads! Call all hands! Thundering with the butts of three clubbed handspikes on the forecastle deck, Dagu roused the sleepers with such judgment claps that they seemed to exhale from the scuttle, so instantaneously did they appear with their clothes in their hands. What do you see? cried Ahab, flattening his face to the sky. Nothing, nothing, sir, was the sound hailing down in reply. Tagallant sails, stunsels, alow and aloft, and on both sides. All sail being set, he now cast loose the lifeline reserved for swaying him to the main royal mast head, and in a few moments they were hoisting him thither, when, while but two-thirds of the way aloft, and while peering ahead through the horizontal vacancy between the main topsail and topgallant sail, he raised a gull-like cry in the air. There she blows! There she blows! A hump like a snow hill! It is Moby Dick! Fired by the cry which seemed simultaneously taken up by the three lookouts, the men on deck rushed to the rigging to behold the famous whale they had so long been pursuing. Ahab had now gained his final perch some feet above the other lookouts, Tashtego standing just beneath him on the cap of the top gallant mast, so that the Indian's head was almost on a level with Ahab's heel. From this height, the whale was now seen some mile or so ahead, at every roll of the sea revealing his high, sparkling hump, and regularly jetting his silent spout into the air. To the credulous mariners, it seemed the same silent spout they had so long ago beheld in the moonlit Atlantic and Indian oceans. And did none of you see it before? cried Ahab, hailing the perched men all around him. I saw him almost that same instant, sir, that Captain Ahab did, and I cried out, said Tashtego. Not the same instant, not the same. No, the doubloon is mine. Fate reserved the doubloon for me. I only, none of you could have raised the white whale first. There she blows, there she blows, there she blows. There again, there again, he cried in long-drawn, lingering, methodic tones, attuned to the gradual prolongings of the whale's visible jets. He's going to sound! In stunsels, down top gallant sails. Stand by three boats, Mr. Starbuck. Remember, stay on board and keep the ship. Helm there, luff, luff a point. So, steady, man, steady. There go flukes. No, no, only black water. Already the boats there. Stand by, stand by. Lower me, Mr. Starbuck. Lower, lower, quick, quicker. And he slid through the air to the deck. He's heading straight to leeward, sir, cried Stubb. Right away from us. Can out have seen the ship yet. Be dumb, man. Stand by the braces. Hard down the helm. Brace up. Shivera, shivera. So, well that. Boats, boats. Soon all the boats but Starbucks were dropped. All the boat sails set, all the paddles plying, with rippling swiftness shooting to leeward, and Ahab heading the onset. A pale death glimmer lit up Fadala's sunken eyes. A hideous motion gnawed his mouth. Like noiseless nautilus shells, their light prows sped through the sea, but only slowly they neared the foe. 
As they neared him, the ocean grew still more smooth, seen drawing a carpet over its waves, seen a noon meadow so serenely it spread. At length, the breathless hunter came so nigh his seemingly unsuspecting prey that his entire dazzling hump was distinctly visible, sliding along the sea as if an isolated thing and continually set in a revolving ring of finest fleecy greenish foam. He saw the vast, involved wrinkles of the slightly projecting head beyond. Before it, far out on the soft, Turkish-rugged waters, went the glistening white shadow from his broad, milky forehead, a musical rippling playfully accompanying the shade. And behind, the blue waters interchangeably flowed over into the moving valley of his steady wake. And on either hand, bright bubbles arose and danced by his side. But these were broken again by the light toes of hundreds of gay fowl softly feathering the sea, alternate with their fitful flight, and like to some flagstaff arising from the painted hull of an argosy, the tall but shattered pole of a recent lance projected from the white whale's back, and at intervals one of the cloud of soft-toed fowls hovering and to and fro skimming like a canopy over the fish silently perched and rocked on this pole, the long tail feathers streaming like pennons. A gentle joyousness, a mighty mildness of repose in swiftness invested the gliding whale. Not the white bull Jupiter swimming away with ravished Europa clinging to his graceful horns, his lovely leering eyes sideways intent upon the maid, with smooth bewitching fleetness rippling straight for the nuptial bower in Crete. Not Jove, not that great majesty supreme, did surpass the glorified white whale as he so divinely swam. On each soft side, coincident with the parted swell that but once leaving him then flowed so wide away, on each bright side the whale shed off enticings. No wonder there had been some among the hunters who namelessly transported and allured by all this serenity had ventured to assail it, but had fatally found that quietude but the vesture of tornadoes. Yet calm, enticing calm, O whale, thou glidest on to all who for the first time eye thee, no matter how many in that same way thou mayest have be juggled and destroyed before. And thus, through the serene tranquillities of the tropical sea, among waves whose hand clappings were suspended by exceeding rapture, Moby Dick moved on, still withholding from sight the full terrors of his submerged trunk, entirely hiding the wretched hideousness of his jaw. But soon the fore part of him slowly rose from the water. For an instant his whole marbleized body formed a high arch like Virginia's natural bridge, and warningly waving his bannered flukes in the air, the grand god revealed himself, sounded and went out of sight. Hoveringly halting and dipping on the wing, the white sea fowls longingly lingered over the agitated pool that he left. With oars apeak and paddles down, the sheets of their sails adrift, the three boats now stilly floated, awaiting Moby Dick's reappearance. An hour, said Ahab, standing rooted in his boat's stern, and he gazed beyond the whale's place towards the dim blue spaces and wide wooing vacancies to leeward. It was only an instant, for again his eyes seemed whirling round in his head as he swept the watery circle. The breeze now freshened. The sea began to swell. The birds! The birds! cried Tashtigo. In long Indian file, as when herons take wing, the white birds were now all flying toward Ahab's boat and when within a few yards began fluttering over the water there, wheeling round and round with joyous expectant cries. Their vision was keener than man's. Ahab could discover no sign in the sea. But suddenly as he peered down and down into its depths, he profoundly saw a white living spot, no bigger than a white weasel, with wonderful celerity uprising and magnifying as it rose till it turned and then there were plainly revealed two long crooked rows of white glistening teeth floating up from the undiscoverable bottom. 
It was Moby Dick's open mouth and scrolled jaw, his vast shadowed bulk still half blending with the blue of the sea. The glittering mouth yawned beneath the boat like an open-doored marble tomb, and giving one sidelong sweep with his steering oar, Ahab whirled the craft aside from this tremendous apparition. Then, calling upon Fadala to change places with him, went forward to the bows and, seizing Perth's harpoon, commanded his crew to grasp their oars and stand by to stern. Now, by reason of this timely spinning round the boat upon its axis, its bow, by anticipation, was made to face the whale's head while yet under water. But as if perceiving this stratagem, Moby Dick, with that malicious intelligence ascribed to him, sidelingly transplanted himself, as it were, in an instant, shooting his pleated head lengthwise beneath the boat. Through and through, through every plank and each rib, it thrilled for an instant, the whale obliquely lying on his back in the manner of a biting shark, slowly and feelingly taking its bows full within his mouth, so that the long, narrow, scrolled lower jaw curled high up into the open air, and one of the teeth caught in a rowlock. The bluish pearl white of the inside of the jaw was within six inches of Ahab's head, and reached higher than that. In this attitude, the white whale now shook the slight cedar as a mildly cruel cat her mouse. With unastonished eyes, Fadala gazed and crossed his arms. But the tiger yellow crew were tumbling over each other's heads to gain the uttermost stern. And now, while both elastic gunwales were springing in and out as the whale dallied with the doomed craft in this devilish way, and from his body being submerged beneath the boat, he could not be darted at from the bows, for the bows were almost inside of him, as it were. And while the other boats involuntarily paused as before a quick crisis impossible to withstand, then it was that monomaniac Ahab, furious with this tantalizing vicinity of his foe, which placed him all alive and helpless in the very jaws he hated, frenzied with all this, he seized the long bone with his naked hands and wildly strove to wrench it from its gripe. As now he thus vainly strove, the jaw slipped from him. The frail gunwales bent in, collapsed, and snapped, as both jaws, like an enormous shears sliding further aft, bit the craft completely in twain, and locked themselves fast again in the sea, midway between the two floating wrecks. These floated aside, the broken ends drooping, the crew at the stern wreck clinging to the gunwales and striving to hold fast to the oars to lash them across. At that preluding moment, ere the boat was yet snapped, Ahab, the first to perceive the whale's intent by the crafty upraising of his head, a movement that loosed his hold for the time, at that moment his hand had made one final effort to push the boat out of the bight, but only slipping further into the whale's mouth and tilting over sideways as it slipped, the boat had shaken off his hold on the jaw, spilled him out of it as he leaned to the push, and so he fell flat-faced upon the sea. Ripplingly withdrawing from his prey, Moby Dick now lay at a little distance, vertically thrusting his oblong white head up and down in the billows, and at the same time slowly revolving his whole spindled body, so that when his vast wrinkled forehead rose some twenty or more feet out of the water, the now rising swells with all their confluent waves dazzlingly broke against it, vindictively tossing their shivered spray still higher into the air. This motion is peculiar to the sperm whale. It receives its designation, pitch poling, from its being likened to that preliminary up and down poise of the whale lance in the exercise called pitch poling, previously described. By this motion, the whale must best and most comprehensively view whatever objects may be encircling him. So, in a gale, the but half baffled channel billows only recoil from the base of the eddy stone, triumphantly to overleap its summit with their scud. But soon resuming his horizontal attitude, Moby Dick swam swiftly round and round the wrecked crew, sideways churning the water in his vengeful wake, as if lashing himself up to still another and more deadly assault. The sight of the splintered boat seemed to madden him, as the blood of grapes and mulberries cast before Antiochus elephants in the Book of Maccabees. Meanwhile, Ahab, half-smothered in the foam of the whale's insolent tail and too much of a cripple to swim, though he could still keep afloat even in the heart of such a whirlpool as that, helpless Ahab's head was seen like a tossed bubble which the least chance shock might burst. 
From the boat's fragmentary stern, Fadala incuriously and mildly eyed him. The clinging crew at the other drifting end could not succor him. More than enough was it for them to look to themselves. For so revolvingly appalling was the white whale's aspect, and so planetarily swift the ever-contracting circles he made, that he seemed horizontally swooping upon them. And though the other boats, unharmed, still hovered hard by, still they dared not pull into the eddy to strike, lest that should be the signal for the instant destruction of the jeopardized castaways, Ahab and all, nor in that case could they themselves hope to escape. With straining eyes, then, they remained on the outer edge of the direful zone, whose center had now become the old man's head. Meantime, from the beginning, all this had been described from the ship's mastheads, and squaring her yard, she had borne down upon the scene, and was now so nigh that Ahab in the water hailed her. Sail on the... But that moment of breaking sea dashed on him from Moby Dick and whelmed him for the time. But struggling out of it again and chancing to rise on a towering crest, he shouted, Sail on the whale! Drive him off! The Pequod's prow was pointed, and breaking up the charmed circle, she effectually parted the white whale from his victim. As he sullenly swam off, the boats flew to the rescue. Dragged into Stubb's boat with bloodshot, blinded eyes, the white brine caking in his wrinkles, the long tension of Ahab's bodily strength did crack, and helplessly he yielded to his body's doom, for a time lying all crushed in the bottom of Stubb's boat, like one trodden underfoot of herds of elephants. Far inland, nameless wails came from him, as desolate sounds from out ravines. But this intensity of his physical prostration did but so much the more abbreviate it. In an instant compass, great hearts sometimes condense to one deep pang, the sum total of those shallow pains kindly diffused through feebler men's whole lives. And so such hearts, though summary in each one suffering, Still, if the gods decree it in their lifetime, aggregate a whole age of woe, wholly made up of instantaneous intensities. For even in their pointless centers, those noble natures contain the entire circumferences of inferior souls. The harpoon, said Ahab, halfway rising and draggingly leaning on one bended arm. Is it safe? Aye, sir, for it was not darted. This is it, said Stubb, showing it. Lay it before me. Any missing men? One, two, three, four, five. There were five oars, sir, and here are five men. That's good. Help me, man, I wish to stand. So, so. I see him, there, there, going to leeward still. What a leaping spout. Hands off from me, the eternal sap runs up in Ahab's bones again. Set the sail, out oars, the helm. It is often the case that when a boat is stove, its crew, being picked up by another boat, help to work that second boat, and the chase is thus continued with what is called double-banked oars. It was thus now. But the added power of the boat did not equal the added power of the whale, for he seemed to have treble-banked his every fin, swimming with a velocity which plainly showed that if now, under these circumstances, pushed on, the chase would prove an indefinitely prolonged, if not a hopeless one. Nor could any crew endure for so long a period such an unintermitted, intense straining at the oar, a thing barely tolerable only in some one brief vicissitude. The ship itself, then, as it sometimes happens, offered the most promising intermediate means of overtaking the chase. Accordingly, the boats now made for her, and were soon swayed up to their cranes, the two parts of the wrecked boat having been previously secured by her, and then hoisting everything to her side and stacking her canvas high up and sideways outstretching it with stunsels like the double-jointed wings of an albatross, the Pequod bore down in the leeward wake of Moby Dick. At the well-known methodic intervals, the whale's glittering spout was regularly announced from the manned mastheads, and when he would be reported as just gone down, Ahab would take the time, and then pacing the deck, binnacle watch in hand, so soon as the last second of the allotted hour expired, his voice was heard, Whose is the doubloon now? Do you see him? And if the reply was, No, sir, straightway he commanded them to lift him to his perch. In this way the day wore on, Ahab now aloft and motionless, anon unrestingly pacing the planks. As he was thus walking, uttering no sound except to hail the men aloft, or to bid them hoist a sail still higher, or to spread one to a still greater breadth, thus to and fro pacing beneath his slouched hat, 
At every turn he passed his own wrecked boat, which had been dropped upon the quarter-deck, and lay there reversed, broken bow to shattered stern. At last he paused before it. And as in an already overclouded sky, fresh troops of clouds will sometimes sail across, so over the old man's face there now stole some such added gloom as this. Stubb saw him pause, and perhaps intending not vainly, though, to evince his own unabated fortitude and thus keep up a valiant place in his captain's mind, he advanced and, eyeing the wreck, exclaimed, The thistle the ass refused. It pricked his mouth too keenly, sir. <laughs> What soulless thing is this that laughs before a wreck? Man, man, did I not know thee brave as fearless fire, and as mechanical I could swear thou wert a poltroon. Groan nor laugh should be heard before a wreck. Aye, sir, said Starbuck, drawing near. Tis a solemn sight, an omen and an ill one. Omen? Omen? The dictionary! If the gods think to speak outright to man, they will honorably speak outright, not shake their heads and give an old wives darkling hint. Be gone! Ye two are the opposite poles of one thing. Starbuck is stub reversed, and stub is Starbuck, and ye two are all mankind. And Ahab stands alone among the millions of the peopled earth, nor gods nor men his neighbors. Cold. Cold, I shiver. How now, aloft there, do you see him? Sing out for every spout, though he spout ten times a second. The day was nearly done. Only the hem of his golden robe was rustling. Soon it was almost dark, but the lookout men still remained unset. Can't see the spout now, sir. Too dark, cried a voice from the air. How heading when last seen? As before, sir, straight to leeward. Good. We will travel slower now tis night. Down royals and top-gallant stunsails, Mr. Starbuck. We must not run over him before morning. He's making a passage now and may heave to a while. Helm there, keep her full before the wind. Aloft, come down. Mr. Stubb, send a fresh hand to the foremasthead and see it manned till morning. Then advancing towards the doubloon in the mainmast. Men, this gold is mine, for I earned it. But I shall let it abide here till the white whale is dead. And then whosoever of you first raises him upon the day he shall be killed, this gold is that man's. And if on that day I shall again raise him, then ten times its sum shall be divided among all of you. Away now, the deck is thine, sir. And so saying, he placed himself halfway within the scuttle, and slouching his hat stood there till dawn, except when at intervals rousing himself to see how the night wore on. Chapter 134 The Chase, Second Day At daybreak, the three mastheads were punctually manned afresh. Do you see him? cried Ahab, after allowing a little space for the light to spread. See nothing, sir. Turn up all hands and make sail. He travels faster than I thought for. The top gallant sails, aye, they should have been kept on her all night. Ah, but no matter, tis but resting for the rush. Here be it said that this pertinacious pursuit of one particular whale continued through day into night and through night into day is a thing by no means unprecedented in the South Sea fishery. For such is the wonderful skill, prescience of experience, and invincible confidence acquired by some great natural geniuses among the Nantucket commanders that from the simple observation of a whale when last descried, they will, under certain given circumstances, pretty accurately foretell both the direction in which he will continue to swim for a time while out of sight, as well as his probable rate of progression during that period. And in these cases, somewhat as a pilot, when about losing sight of a coast whose general trending he well knows, and which he desires shortly to return to again, but at some further point, like as this pilot stands by his compass and takes the precise bearing of the cape at present visible, in order the more certainly to hit aright the remote, unseen headland eventually to be visited, so does the fisherman at his compass with the whale. For after being chased and diligently marked through several hours of daylight, then when night obscures the fish, the creature's future wake through the darkness is almost as established to the sagacious mind of the hunter as the pilot's coast is to him. So that to this hunter's wondrous skill, the proverbial evanescence of a thing writ in water, a wake, is to all desired purposes well nigh as reliable as the steadfast land.
And as the mighty iron leviathan of the modern railway is so familiarly known in its every place that with watches in their hands men time his rate as doctors that of a baby's pulse, and lightly say of it the up train or the down train will reach such or such a spot at such or such an hour, even so, almost, there are occasions when these Nantucketers time that other leviathan of the deep, according to the observed humor of his speed, and say to themselves, so many hours hence this whale will have gone two hundred miles, will have about reached this or that degree of latitude or longitude. But to render this acuteness at all successful in the end, the wind and the sea must be the whaleman's allies. For of what present avail to the becalmed or windbound mariner is the skill that assures him he is exactly ninety-three leagues and a quarter from his port. Inferable from these statements, are many collateral, subtle matters touching the chase of whales. The ship tore on, leaving such a furrow in the sea as when a cannonball missent becomes a plowshare and turns up the level field. By salt and hemp, cried Stubb, but this swift motion of the deck creeps up one's legs and tingles at the heart. And a ship and I are two brave fellows. Ha ha! Someone take me up and launch me spine-wise on the sea, for by live oaks my spine's a keel. Ha ha! We go the gate that leaves no dust behind. There she blows, she blows, she blows! Right ahead, was now the masthead cry. Aye, aye, cried Stubb, I knew it, you can't escape. Blow on and split your spout, oh whale. The mad fiend himself is after you. Blow your trump, blister your lungs, Ahab will dam off your blood as a miller shuts his water gate upon the stream. And Stubb did but speak out for well nigh all that crew. The frenzies of the chase had by this time worked them bubblingly up, like old wine worked anew. Whatever pale fears and forebodings some of them might have felt before, these were not only now kept out of sight through the growing awe of Ahab, but they were broken up and on all sides routed as timid prairie hares that scatter before the bounding bison. The hand of fate had snatched all their souls, and by the stirring perils of the previous day, the rack of the past night's suspense, the fixed, unfearing, blind, reckless way in which their wild craft went plunging towards its flying mark, by all these things their hearts were bowled along. The wind that made great bellies of their sails and rushed the vessel on by arms invisible as irresistible, this seemed the symbol of that unseen agency which so enslaved them to the race. They were one man, not thirty. For as the one ship that held them all, though it was put together of all contrasting things, oak and maple and pine wood, iron and pitch and hemp, yet all these ran into each other in the one concrete hull which shot on its way both balanced and directed by the long central keel, even so all the individualities of the crew, this man's valor, that man's fear, guilt and guiltiness, all varieties were welded into oneness and were all directed to that fatal goal which Ahab, their one lord and keel, did point to. The rigging lived. The mastheads like the tops of tall palms were outspreadingly tufted with arms and legs. Clinging to a spar with one hand, some reached forth the other with impatient wavings. Others, shading their eyes from the vivid sunlight, sat far out on the rocking yards, all the spars in full bearing of mortals, ready and ripe for their fate. Ah, how they still strove through that infinite blueness to seek out the thing that might destroy them. Why sing you not out for him if you see him, cried Ahab, when after the lapse of some minutes since the first cry no more had been heard. Sway me up, men. You've been deceived. Not Moby Dick casts one odd jet that way and then disappears. It was even so. In their headlong eagerness, the men had mistaken some other thing for the whale spout, as the event itself soon proved. For hardly had Ahab reached his perch, hardly was the rope belayed to its pin on deck, when he struck the keynote to an orchestra that made the air vibrate as with the combined discharges of rifles. The triumphant halloo of thirty buckskin lungs was heard, as much nearer to the ship than the place of the imaginary jet, less than a mile ahead, Moby Dick bodily burst into view. For not by any calm and indolent spoutings, not by the peaceable gush of that mystic fountain in his head, did the white whale now reveal his vicinity, but by the far more wondrous phenomenon of breaching, 
Rising with his utmost velocity from the furthest depths, the sperm whale thus booms his entire bulk into the pure element of air, and piling up a mountain of dazzling foam, shows his place to the distance of seven miles and more. In those moments, the torn and raged waves he shakes off seem his mane. In some cases, this breaching is his act of defiance. There she breaches! There she breaches! was the cry, as in his immeasurable bravados, the white whale tossed himself salmon-like to heaven. So suddenly seen in the blue plain of the sea, and relieved against the still bluer margin of the sky, the spray that he raised for the moment intolerably glittered and glared like a glacier, and stood there gradually fading and fading away from its first sparkling intensity to the dim mistiness of an advancing shower in a veil. I breach your last of the sun, Moby Dick, cried Ahab. Thy hour and thy harpoon are at hand. Down, down, all of you, but one man at the fore. The boats, stand by. Unmindful of the tedious rope ladders of the shrouds, the men, like shooting stars, slid to the deck by the isolated backstays and halyards, while Ahab, less dartingly but still rapidly, was dropped from his perch. Lower away, he cried, so soon as he had reached his boat, a spare one rigged the afternoon previous. Mr. Starbuck, the ship is thine. Keep away from the boats, but keep near them. Lower all. As if to strike a quick terror into them, by this time being the first assailant himself, Moby Dick had turned and was now coming for the three crews. Ahab's boat was central, and cheering his men, he told them he would take the whale head and head. That is, pull straight up to his forehead, a not uncommon thing, for when within a certain limit such a course excludes the coming onset from the whale's sidelong vision. But ere that close limit was gained, and while yet all three boats were plain as the ship's three masts to his eye, the white whale churning himself into furious speed, almost in an instant, as it were, rushing among the boats with open jaws and a lashing tail, offered appalling battle on every side, and heedless of the irons darted at him from every boat, seemed only intent on annihilating each separate plank of which those boats were made. But skillfully maneuvered, incessantly wheeling like trained chargers in the field, the boats for a while eluded him, though at times but by a plank's breadth, while all the time Ahab's unearthly slogan tore every other cry but his to shreds. But at last, in his untraceable evolutions, the white whale so crossed and recrossed and in a thousand ways entangled the slack of the three lines now fast to him, that they foreshortened, and of themselves warped the devoted boats toward the planted irons in him, though now for a moment the whale drew aside a little as if to rally for a more tremendous charge. Seizing that opportunity, Ahab first paid out more line, and then was rapidly hauling and jerking in upon it again, hoping that way to disencumber it of some snarls, when lo, a sight more savage than the embattled teeth of sharks. Caught and twisted, corkscrewed in the mazes of the line, loose harpoons and lances, with all their bristling barbs and points, came flashing and dripping up to the chocks in the bows of Ahab's boat. Only one thing could be done. Seizing the boat knife, he critically reached within, through, and then without the rays of steel, dragged in the line beyond, passed it inboard to the bowsman, and then, twice sundering the rope near the chocks, dropped the intercepted faggot of steel into the sea, and all was fast again. That instant, the white whale made a sudden rush among the remaining tangles of the other lines, by so doing irresistibly dragged the more involved boats of stub and flask towards his flukes, dashed them together like two rolling husks on a surf-beaten beach, and then, diving down into the sea, disappeared in a boiling maelstrom, in which for a space the odorous cedar chips of the wrecks danced round and round like the grated nutmeg in a swiftly stirred bowl of punch, while the two crews were yet circling in the waters, reaching out after the revolving line tubs, oars, and other floating furniture, while a sloped little flask bobbed up and down like an empty vial, twitching his legs upwards to escape the dreaded jaws of sharks, and Stubb was lustily singing out for someone to ladle him up, and while the old man's line, now parting, admitted of his pulling into the creamy pool to rescue whom he could, in that wild simultaneousness of a thousand concreted perils, Ahab's yet unstricken boat seemed drawn up towards heaven by invisible wires, as arrow-like shooting perpendicularly from the sea, the white whale dashed his broad forehead against its bottom and sent it turning over and over into the air till it fell again gunwale downwards, and Ahab and his men struggled out from under it like seals from a seaside cave. 
The first uprising momentum of the whale, modifying its direction as he struck the surface, involuntarily launched him along it to a little distance from the center of the destruction he had made. And with his back to it, he now lay for a moment, slowly feeling with his flukes from side to side. And whenever a stray oar, a bit of plank, the least chip or crumb of the boats touched his skin, his tail swiftly drew back and came sideways, smiting the sea. But soon, as if satisfied that his work for that time was done, he pushed his pleated forehead through the ocean, and trailing after him the intertangled lines continued his leeward way at a traveler's methodic pace. As before, the attentive ship, having described the whole fight, again came bearing down to the rescue, and dropping a boat picked up the floating mariners, tubs, oars, and whatever else could be caught at and safely landed them on her decks. Some sprained shoulders, wrists, and ankles, livid contusions, wrenched harpoons and lances, inextricable intricacies of rope, shattered oars and planks, all these were there. But no fatal or even serious ill seemed to have befallen anyone. As with Hadala the day before, so Ahab was now found, grimly clinging to his boat's broken half, which afforded a comparatively easy float, nor did it so exhaust him as the previous day's mishap. But when he was helped to the deck, all eyes were fastened upon him, as instead of standing by himself, he still half hung upon the shoulder of Starbuck, who had thus far been the foremost to assist him. His ivory leg had been snapped off, leaving but one short, sharp splinter. Aye, aye, Starbuck. It is sweet to lean sometimes, be the leaner who he will, and would old Ahab had leaned oftener than he has. The ferrule has not stood, sir, said the carpenter, now coming up. I put good work into that leg. But no bones broken, sir, I hope, said Stubb, with true concern. Aye, and all splintered to pieces, Stubb. Do you see it? But even with a broken bone, old Ahab is untouched, and I account no living bone of mine one jot more me than this dead one that's lost. Nor white whale, nor man, nor fiend can so much as graze old Ahab in his own proper and inaccessible being. Can any lead touch yonder floor? Any mast scrape yonder roof? I'm off there. Which way? Dead to leeward, sir. Up helm, then. Pile on the sail again, shipkeepers. Down the rest of the spare boats and rig them. Mr. Starbuck, away and muster the boat's crews. Let me first help thee towards the bulwark, sir. Oh, 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 how this splinter gores me now. A cursed fate that the unconquerable captain in the soul should have such a craven mate. Sir? Oh, my body, man, not thee. Give me something for a cane. There, that shivered lance will do. Muster the men. Surely, I've not seen him yet. By heaven, it cannot be. Missing? Quick, call them all! The old man's hinted thought was true. Upon mustering the company, the Parsi was not there. The Parsi! cried Stubb. He must have been caught in the black vomit wrench, Lee. Run, all of you, above, below, cabin, folks will find him. Not gone, not gone. But quickly they returned to him with the tidings that the Parsi was nowhere to be found. Aye, sir, said Stubb. Caught among the tangles of your line. I thought I saw him dragging under. My line? My line? Gone? Gone? What means that little word? What death knell rings in it that old Ahab shakes as if he were the belfry? The harpoon, too. Toss over the litter there. Do you see it? The forged iron men, the white whales. No, 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 blistered fool. This hand did dart it. It is in the fish. Aloft there, keep him nailed. Quick, all hands to the rigging of the boats. Collect the oars, harpooners, the irons, the irons. Hoist the royals higher. A pull on all the sheets. Helm there. Steady. Steady for your life. I'll ten times girdle the unmeasured globe, yea, and dive straight through it, but I'll slay him yet. Great God, but for one single instant show thyself, cried Starbuck. Never, never wilt thou capture him, old man. In Jesus' name, no more of this that's worse than devil's madness. Two days chased, twice stove to splinters, thy very leg once more snatched from under thee, thy evil shadow gone, all good angels mobbing thee with warnings. What more wouldst thou have? Shall we keep chasing this murderous fish till he swamps the last man? Shall we be dragged by him to the bottom of the sea? Shall we be towed by him to the infernal world? Oh, oh, impiety and blasphemy to hunt him more. Starbuck, of late, 
I felt strangely moved to thee. Ever since that hour, we both saw... Thou knowest what in one another's eyes. But in this matter of the whale, be the front of thy face to me as the palm of this hand, a lipless, unfeatured blank. Ahab is forever Ahab, man. This whole act's immutably decreed. T'was rehearsed by thee and me a billion years before this ocean rolled. Fool! I am the fate's lieutenant. I act under orders. Look thou, underling, that thou obeyest mine. Stand round me, men. You see an old man cut down to the stump, leaning on a shivered lance, propped up on a lonely foot. Tis Ahab, his body's part. But Ahab's soul's a centipede that moves upon a hundred legs. I feel strained, half-stranded as ropes that tow dismasted frigates in a gale, and I may look so. But ere I break, you'll hear me crack. Until you hear that. Know that Ahab's hawser toes his purpose yet. Believe your men in the things called omens, then laugh aloud and cry encore. For ere they drown, drowning things will twice rise to the surface, then rise again to sink forevermore. So with Moby Dick. Two days he's floated, tomorrow will be the third. Aye, men, he'll rise once more, but only to spout his last. Do you feel brave, men? Brave! As fearless fire, cried Stubb. And as mechanical, muttered Ahab. Then as the men went forward, he muttered on, the things called omens. And yesterday I talked the same to Starbuck there concerning my broken boat. Oh, how valiantly I seek to drive out of others' hearts what's clenched so fast in mine. A posse, a posse gone, gone. And he was to go before but still was to be seen again ere I could perish. How's that? There's a riddle now might baffle all the lawyers backed by the ghosts of the whole line of judges. Like a hawk's beak, it pecks my brain. I'll, I'll solve it, though. When dusk descended, the whale was still in sight to leeward. So once more the sail was shortened and everything passed nearly as on the previous night. Only the sound of hammers and the hum of the grindstone was heard till nearly daylight as the men toiled by lanterns in the complete and careful rigging of the spare boats and sharpening their fresh weapons for the morrow. Meantime, of the broken keel of Ahab's wrecked craft, the carpenter made him another leg. While still, as on the night before, slouched Ahab stood fixed within his scuttle, his hid heliotrope glance anticipatingly gone backward on its dial, set due eastward for the earliest sun. Chapter 135. The Chase, Third Day. The morning of the third day dawned, fair and fresh, and once more the solitary nightman at the foremast head was relieved by crowds of the daylight lookouts who dotted every mast and almost every spar. Do you see him? cried Ahab. But the whale was not yet in sight. In his infallible wake, though. But follow that wake, that's all. Helm there, steady as thou goest, and hast been going. What a lovely day again. We're at a new-made world, and made for a summer house to the angels, and this morning the first of its throwing open to them. A fairer day could not dawn upon that world. Here's food for thought. Had Ahab time to think? But Ahab never thinks. He only feels, feels, feels. That's tingling enough for mortal man to think's audacity. God only has that right and privilege. Thinking is, or ought to be, a coolness and a calmness, and our poor hearts throb and our poor brains beat too much for that. And yet, I've sometimes thought my brain was very calm, frozen calm. This old skull cracks so like a glass in which the contents turn to ice and shiver it. And still this hair is growing now, this moment growing, and heat must breed it. But no, it's like that sort of common grass that will grow anywhere between the earthly clefts of Greenland ice or in Vesuvius lava. How the wild winds blow it. They whip it about me as the torn shreds of split sails lash the tossed ship they cling to. 
A vile wind that has no doubt blown ere this through prison corridors and cells and wards of hospitals and ventilated them, and now comes blowing hither as innocent as fleeces. Out upon it, it's tainted. Were I the wind, I'd blow no more on such a wicked, miserable world. I'd crawl somewhere to a cave and slink there. And yet tis a noble and heroic thing, the wind. Whoever conquered it. In every fight it has the last and bitterest blow. Run tilting at it and you but run through it. Ha <sighs> ha. A coward wind that strikes stark naked men but will not stand to receive a single blow. Even Ahab is a braver thing and nobler thing than that. Would now the wind but had a body. But all the things that most exasperate and outrage mortal man, all these things are bodiless. But only bodiless as objects, not as agents. There's a most special, a most cunning, oh, a most malicious difference. And yet, I say again and swear it now, that there's something all glorious and gracious in the wind. These warm trade winds, at least, that in the clear heavens blow straight on in strong and steadfast, vigorous mildness, and veer not from their mark, however the baser currents of the sea may turn and tack, and mightiest Mississippis of the land shift and swerve about, uncertain where to go at last. And by the eternal poles, these same trades that so directly blow my good ship on, these trades, or something like them, something so unchangeable and full as strong, blow my keeled soul along. To it! Aloft there, what do you see? Nothing, sir. Nothing. And noon at hand. The doubloon goes a-begging. See the sun. Aye, aye. It must be so. I've oversailed him. How? Got the start? Ah, he's chasing me now, not I him. That's bad. I might have known it too. Fool! The lines, the harpoons he's towing. Aye, aye, I've run him by last night. About! About! Come down, all of you, but the regular lookouts. Man the braces! Steering as she had done, the wind had been somewhat on the Pequod's quarter, so that now being pointed in the reverse direction, the braced ship sailed hard upon the breeze as she re-churned the cream in her own white wake. Against the wind he now steers for the open jaw, murmured Starbuck to himself, as he coiled the new-hauled main brace upon the rail. God keep us, but already my bones feel damp within me, and from the inside wet my flesh. I misdoubt me that I disobey my God in obeying him. Stand by to sway me up, cried Ahab, advancing to the hempen basket. We should meet him soon. Aye, aye, sir. And straightway Starbuck did Ahab's bidding, and once more Ahab swung on high. A whole hour now passed, gold beaten out to ages. Time itself now held long breaths with keen suspense. But at last, some three points off the weather bow, Ahab described the spout again, and instantly from the three mastheads three shrieks went up as if the tongues of fire had voiced it. Forehead to forehead I meet thee this third time, Moby Dick. On deck there, brace sharper up, crowd her into the wind's eye. He's too far off to lower yet, Mr. Starbuck. The sails shake. Stand over that helmsman with a top maul. So, so, he travels fast and I must down. But let me have one more good look round aloft here at the sea. There's time for that. An old, old sight, and yet somehow so young, aye, and not changed a wink since I first saw it, a boy from the sand hills of Nantucket. The same, the same, the same to no eyes to me. There's a soft shower to leeward. Such lovely leewardings. They must lead somewhere. There's something else than common land more palmy than the palms. Leeward. The white whale goes that way, to look to windward, then. The better if the bitterer quarter. But goodbye. Goodbye, old masthead. What's this, green? Aye, tiny mosses in these warped cracks. No green weather stains on Ahab's head. There's the difference now between man's old age and matters. But aye, old mast, we both grow old together. Sound in our hulls, though, are we not, my ship? Aye, minus a leg, that's all. By heaven, this dead wood has the better of my live flesh every way. I can't compare with it. And I've known some ships made of dead trees outlast the lives of men made of the most vital stuff of vital fathers. What's that he said? 
he should still go before me, my pilot, and yet to be seen again. But where? Will I have eyes at the bottom of the sea, supposing I descend those endless stairs? And all night I've been sailing from him, wherever he did sink to. Aye. I, like many more, thou told's direful truth as touching thyself, O Parsi. But Ahab, there thy shot fell short. Goodbye, masthead. Keep a good eye upon the whale. The while I'm gone, we'll talk tomorrow. Nay, tonight, when the white whale lies down there, tied by head and tail. He gave the word, and still gazing round him, was steadily lowered through the cloven blue air to the deck. In due time, the boats were lowered, but as standing in his shallop stern, Ahab just hovered upon the point of the descent, he waved to the mate, who held one of the tackle ropes on deck, and bade him pause. Starbuck, sir. For the third time, my soul's ship starts upon this voyage, Starbuck. Aye, sir. Thou wilt have it so. Some ships sail from their ports and ever afterwards are missing, Starbuck. Truth, sir. Saddest truth. Some men die at ebb tide, some at low water, some at the full of the flood. And I feel now like a billow that's all one crested comb, Starbuck. I am old. Shake hands with me, man. Their hands met, their eyes fastened, Starbuck's tears the glue. Ah, oh, my captain, my captain, noble heart, go not, go not. See, it's a brave man that weeps. How great the agony of the persuasion, then. Lower away, cried Ahab, tossing the mate's arm from him. Stand by the crew. In an instant, the boat was pulling round close under the stern. The sharks! The sharks! cried a voice from the low cabin window there. Oh, master, my master, come back! But Ahab heard nothing, for his own voice was high lifted then, and the boat leaped on. Yet the voice spake true, for scarce had he pushed from the ship when numbers of sharks, seemingly rising from out the dark waters beneath the hull, maliciously snapped at the blades of the oars every time they dipped in the water, and in this way accompanied the boat with their bites. It is a thing not uncommonly happening to the whaleboats in those swarming seas, the sharks at times apparently following them in the same prescient way that vultures hover over the banners of marching regiments in the east. But these were the first sharks that had been observed by the Pequod since the white whale had been first descried. And whether it was that Ahab's crew were all such tiger-yellow barbarians, and therefore their flesh more musky to the senses of the sharks, a matter sometimes well known to affect them, however it was, they seemed to follow that one boat without molesting the others. Heart of wrought steel, murmured Starbuck, gazing over the side and following with his eyes the receding boat. Canst thou yet ring boldly to that sight, lowering thy keel among ravening sharks and followed by them open mouth to the chase, and this the critical third day? For when three days flow together in one continuous, intense pursuit, be sure the first is the morning, the second the noon, and the third the evening, and the end of that thing, be that end what it may. Oh, my God! What is this that shoots through me, and leaves me so deadly calm, yet expectant, fixed at the top of a shudder? Future things swim before me as in empty outlines and skeletons. All the past is somehow grown dim, Mary girl, thou fadest in pale glories behind me. Boy, I seem to see but thy eyes grown wondrous blue. Strangest problems of life seem clearing, but clouds sweep between. Is my journey's end coming? My legs feel faint, like his who has footed it all day. Feel thy heart beats it yet? Stir thyself, Starbuck, stave it off. Move, move, speak aloud. Masthead there, see you, my boy's hand on the hill. Crazed. Aloft there, keep thy keenest eye upon the boats. Marked well the whale. Oh, again. Drive off that hawk. See, he pecks, he tears the vein. Pointing to the red flag flying at the main truck. Ah, he soars away with it. Where's the old man now? Seest thou that sight, O Ahab? Shudder, shudder. The boats had not gone very far when, by a signal from the mastheads, a downward pointed arm, Ahab knew that the whale had sounded. But intending to be near him at the next rising, he held on his way a little sideways from the vessel. 
the becharmed crew maintaining the profoundest silence as the head-beat waves hammered and hammered against the opposing bow. Drive, drive in your nails, O ye waves. To their uttermost heads drive them in. Ye but strike a thing without a lid, and no coffin and no hearse can be mine. And hemp only can kill me, ha ha! Suddenly the waters around them slowly swelled in broad circles, then quickly upheaved as if sideways sliding from a submerged berg of ice swiftly rising to the surface. A low rumbling sound was heard, a subterraneous hum, and then all held their breaths. As bedraggled with trailing ropes and harpoons and lances, a vast form shot lengthwise but obliquely from the sea. Shrouded in a thin, drooping veil of mist, it hovered for a moment in the rainbowed air, and then fell, swamping back into the deep. Crushed thirty feet upwards, the waters flashed for an instant like heaps of fountains, then brokenly sank in a shower of flakes, leaving the circling surface cream like new milk round the marble trunk of the whale. Give way! cried Ahab to the oarsmen, and the boats darted forward to the attack. But maddened by yesterday's fresh irons that corroded in him, Moby Dick seemed combinedly possessed by all the angels that fell from heaven. The wide tears of welded tendons overspreading his broad white forehead beneath the transparent skin looked knitted together. As head-on he came churning his tail among the boats and once more flailed them apart, spilling out the irons and lances from the two mates' boats and dashing in one side of the upper part of their bows, but leaving Ahab's almost without a scar. While Dagu and Queequeg were stopping the strained planks, and as the whales swimming out from them turned and showed one entire flank as he shot by them again, at that moment a quick cry went up. Lashed round and round to the fish's back, pinioned into turns upon turns in which during the past night the whale had reeled the involutions of the lines around him, the half-torn body of the Parsi was seen. His sable raiment frayed to shreds, his distended eyes turned full upon old Ahab. The harpoon dropped from his hand. Be fooled! Be fooled! Drawing in a long, lean breath. Aye, Parsi, I see thee again. Aye, and thou goest before. And this, this then is the hearse that thou didst promise. But I hold thee to the last letter of thy word. Where is the second hearse? Away, mates, to the ship. Those boats are useless now. Repair them if you can in time and return to me. If not, Ahab is enough to die. Down, men. The first thing that butt off us to jump from this boat, I stand in that thing I harpoon. Ye are not other men but my arms and my legs, and so will weigh me. Where's the whale? Gone down again? But he looked too nigh the boat for as if bent upon escaping with the corpse he bore, and as if the particular place of the last encounter had been but a stage in his leeward voyage, Moby Dick was now again steadily swimming forward, and had almost passed the ship, which thus far had been sailing in the contrary direction to him, though for the present her headway had been stopped. He seemed swimming with his utmost velocity, and now only intent upon pursuing his own straight path in the sea. "'Oh, Ahab!' cried Starbuck. "'Not too late is it, even now, the third day, to desist!' See, Moby Dick seeks thee not. It is thou, thou, that madly seekest him. Setting sail to the rising wind, the lonely boat was swiftly impelled to leeward by both oars and canvas, and at last when Ahab was sliding by the vessel so near as plainly to distinguish Starbuck's face as he leaned over the rail, he hailed him to turn the vessel about and follow him not too swiftly at a judicious interval. Glancing upwards, he saw Tashtego, Queequeg, and Dagu eagerly mounting to the three mastheads, while the oarsmen were rocking in the two staved boats, which had but just been hoisted to the side and were busily at work in repairing them. One after the other, through the portholes as he sped, he also caught flying glimpses of stub and flask, busying themselves on deck among bundles of new irons and lances. As he saw all this, as he heard the hammers in the broken boats, far other hammers seemed driving a nail into his heart. But he rallied. And now, marking that the vane or flag was gone from the main masthead, he shouted to Tashtigo, who had just gained that perch, to descend again for another flag and a hammer and nails, and so nail it to the mast. Whether fagged by the three days' running chase and the resistance to his swimming in the knotted hamper he bore, or whether it was some latent deceitfulness and malice in him, 
Whichever was true, the white whale's way now began to abate, as it seemed, from the boat so rapidly nearing him once more, though indeed the whale's last start had not been so long a one as before. And still, as Ahab glided over the waves, the unpitying sharks accompanied him, and so pertinaciously stuck to the boat, and so continually bit at the plying oars, that the blades became jagged and crunched and left small splinters in the sea at almost every dip. Heed them not! Those teeth but give new rowlocks to your oars! Pull on! Is the better rest, the shark's jaw, than the yielding water? But at every bite, sir, the thin blades grow smaller and smaller. They will last long enough. Pull on! But who can tell, he muttered, whether these sharks swim to feast on the whale or on Ahab. But pull on. I all alive now. We near him. The helm. Take the helm. Let me pass. And so saying, two of the oarsmen helped him forward to the bows of the still-flying boat. At length, as the craft was cast to one side and ran ranging along with the white whale's flank, he seemed strangely oblivious of its advance, as the whale sometimes will, and Ahab was fairly within the smoky mountain mist which, thrown off from the whale's spout, curled round his great monadnock hump. He was even thus close to him, when with body arched back and both arms lengthwise high lifted to the poise, he darted his fierce iron and his far fiercer curse into the hated whale. As both steel and curse sank to the socket as if sucked into a morass, Moby Dick sideways writhed, spasmodically rolled his nigh flank against the bow, and without staving a hole in it, so suddenly canted the boat over that had it not been for the elevated part of the gunwale to which he then clung, Ahab would once more have been tossed into the sea. As it was, three of the oarsmen, who foreknew not the precise instant of the dart, and were therefore unprepared for its effects, these were flung out, but so fell that in an instant two of them clutched the gunwale again, and rising to its level on a combing wave, hurled themselves bodily inboard again, the third man helplessly dropping astern, but still afloat and swimming. Almost simultaneously, with a mighty volition of ungraduated, instantaneous swiftness, the white whale darted through the weltering sea, but when Ahab cried out to the steersman to take new turns with the line and hold it so, and commanded the crew to turn round on their seats and tow the boat up to the mark, the moment the treacherous line felt that double strain and tug, it snapped in the empty air. What breaks in me? Some sinew cracks tis whole again. Oars! Oars! Burst in upon him! Hearing the tremendous rush of the sea-crashing boat, the whale wheeled round to present his blank forehead at bay. But in that evolution, catching sight of the nearing black hull of the ship, seemingly seeing in it the source of all his persecutions, bethinking it, it may be a larger and nobler foe, of a sudden he bore down upon its advancing prow, smiting his jaws amid fiery showers of foam. Ahab staggered, his hand smote his forehead. I grow blind. Hands stretch out before me that I may yet grope my way. Is night? The whale! The ship! cried the cringing oarsmen. Oars! Oars! Sloop downwards to thy depths! O oh, see that ere it be forever too late, Ahab may slide this last, last time upon his mark. I see the ship! The ship! Dash on, my men! Will you not save my ship? But as the oarsmen violently forced their boat through the sledge-hammering seas, the before whales smitten bow ends of two planks burst through, and in an instant almost the temporarily disabled boat lay nearly level with the waves, his half-wading, splashing crew trying hard to stop the gap and bail out the pouring water. Meantime, for that one beholding instant, Tashtigo's masthead hammer remained suspended in his hand, and the red flag half wrapping him as with a plaid, then streamed itself straight out from him as his own forward flowing heart, while Starbuck and Stubb, standing upon the bowsprit beneath, caught sight of the downcoming monster just as soon as he. The whale! The whale! Up helm! Up helm! Oh, all oh, you sweet powers of air, now hug me close! Let not Starbuck die, if die he must, in a woman's fainting fit. Up helm, I say! You fools, the jaw, the jaw! Is this the end of all my bursting prayers, all my lifelong fidelities? Oh, Ahab, Ahab, lo, thy work! Steady, helmsman, steady! Nay, nay, up helm again, he turns to meet us! Oh, his unappeasable brow drives on towards us, whose duty tells him he cannot depart! My God, stand by me now! 
Stand not by me, but stand under me, whoever you are that will now help Stubb. For Stubb, too, sticks here. I grin at thee, thou grinning whale, whoever helped Stubb or kept Stubb awake but Stubb's own unwinking eye. And now poor Stubb goes to bed upon a mattress that is all too soft, would it were stuffed with brushwood. I grin at thee, thou grinning whale. Look, ye sun, moon, and stars, I call ye assassins of as good a fellow as ever spouted up his ghost. For all that, I would yet ring glasses with ye, would ye but hand the cup. Oh, 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 thou grinning whale, but there'll be plenty of gulping soon. Why fly ye not, O oh Ahab? For me, off shoes and jacket to it. Let Stubb die in his drawers. A most mouldy and oversalted death, though. Cherries, 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 oh, flask for one red cherry ere we die. Cherries? I only wish that we were where they grow. Go, oh, Stubb, I hope my poor mother's drawn my part pay ere this. If not, few coppers will now come to her, for the voyage is up. From the ship's bows, nearly all the seamen now hung inactive. Hammers, bits of plank, lances, and harpoons mechanically retained in their hands, just as they had darted from their various employments, all their enchanted eyes intent upon the whale, which from side to side, strangely vibrating his predestinating head, sent a broad band of overspreading semicircular foam before him as he rushed. Retribution, swift vengeance, eternal malice were in his whole aspect, and spite of all that mortal man could do, the solid white buttress of his forehead smote the ship's starboard bow, till men and timbers reeled. Some fell flat upon their faces. Like dislodged trucks, the heads of the harpooners aloft shook on their bull-like necks. Through the breach they heard the waters pour, as mountain torrents down a flume. The ship, the hearse, the second hearse, cried Ahab from the boat. Its wood could only be American. Diving beneath the settling ship, the whale ran quivering along its keel, but turning under water, swiftly shot to the surface again, far off the other bow, but within a few yards of Ahab's boat, where for a time he lay quiescent. I turn my body from the sun. What ho, Testigo? Let me hear thy hammer. Oh, ye three unsurrendered spires of mine, thou uncracked keel and only God-bullied hull, thou firm deck and haughty helm and pole-pointed prow, death-glorious ship, must you then perish and without me? Am I cut off from the last fond pride of meanest shipwrecked captains? Oh, lonely death on lonely life, oh, now I feel my topmost greatness lies in my topmost grief. Oh! Ho! From all your furthest bounds pour you now in, you bold billows of my whole foregone life, and top this one piled coma of my death. Towards thee I roll, thou all-destroying but unconquering whale. To the last I grapple with thee. From hell's heart I stab at thee. For hate's sake I spit my last breath at thee. Sink all coffins and all hearses to one common pool. And since neither can be mine, let me then tow to pieces while still chasing thee, though tied to thee, thou damned whale. Thus I give up the spear. The harpoon was darted. The stricken whale flew forward. With igniting velocity, the line ran through the groove, ran foul. Ahab stooped to clear it. He did clear it, but the flying turn caught him round the neck, and voicelessly as Turkish mutes bowstring their victim, he was shot out of the boat ere the crew knew he was gone. Next instant, the heavy eye splice in the rope's final end flew out of the stark empty tub, knocked down an oarsman, and smiting the sea, disappeared in its depths. For an instant, the tranced boat's crew stood still, then turned. The ship? Great God, where is the ship? Soon they, through dim, bewildering mediums, saw her sidelong fading phantom, as in the gaseous Fata Morgana, only the uppermost masts out of water, while fixed by infatuation or fidelity or fate to their once lofty perches, the pagan harpooners still maintained their sinking lookouts on the sea. And now concentric circles seize the lone boat itself, and all its crew in each floating oar and every lance pole and spinning, animate and inanimate, all round and round in one vortex, carried the smallest chip of the Pequod out of sight.
but as the last whelmings intermixingly poured themselves over the sunken head of the Indian at the mainmast, leaving a few inches of the erect spar yet visible, together with long streaming yards of the flag, which calmly undulated with ironical coincidings over the destroying billows they almost touched, at that instant a red arm and a hammer hovered backwardly uplifted in the open air in the act of nailing the flag faster and yet faster to the subsiding spar. A skyhawk that tauntingly had followed the main truck downwards from its natural home among the stars, pecking at the flag and incommoding Tashtego there, this bird now chanced to intercept its broad fluttering wing between the hammer and the wood and simultaneously feeling that ethereal thrill the submerged savage beneath in his death grasp kept his hammer frozen there and so the bird of heaven with archangelic shrieks and his imperial beak thrust upwards and his whole captive form folded in the flag of ahab went down with his ship which like satan would not sink to hell till she had dragged a living part of heaven along with her and helmeted herself with it now small gulls flew screaming over the yet yawning gulf. A sullen white surf beat against its steep sides. Then all collapsed, and the great shroud of the sea rolled on as it rolled five thousand years ago. Epilogue and I only am escaped alone to tell thee, Job. The drama's done. Why then here does anyone step forth? Because one did survive the wreck. It so chanced that after the Parsee's disappearance, I was he whom the fates ordained to take the place of Ahab's bowsman, when that bowsman assumed the vacant post. The same who, when on the last day the three men were tossed out from the rocking boat, was dropped astern. So, floating on the margin of the ensuing scene and in full sight of it, when the half-spent suction of the sunk ship reached me, I was then, but slowly, drawn towards the closing vortex. When I reached it, it had subsided to a creamy pool. Round and round then, and ever contracting towards the button-like black bubble at the axis of that slowly wheeling circle, like another Ixian, I did revolve. Till gaining that vital center, the black bubble upward burst, and now, liberated by reason of its cunning spring, and owing to its great buoyancy rising with great force, the coffin life buoy, shot lengthwise from the sea, fell over and floated by my side. Buoyed up by that coffin for almost one whole day and night, I floated on a soft and dirge-like mane. The unharming sharks, they glided by as if with padlocks on their mouths. The savage seahawks sailed with sheathed beaks. On the second day, a sail drew near, nearer, and picked me up at last. It was the devious cruising Rachel, that in her retracing search after her missing children, only found another orphan. Extracts, supplied by a sub-sub-librarian. It will be seen that this mere painstaking burrower and grubworm of a poor devil of a sub-sub appears to have gone through the long Vatican's and street stalls of the earth picking up whatever random allusions to whales he could anyways find in any book whatsoever, sacred or profane. Therefore you must not, in every case at least, take the higgledy-piggledy whale statements, however authentic, in these extracts for veritable gospel cetology. Far from it. As touching the ancient authors generally, as well as the poets here appearing, these extracts are solely valuable or entertaining as affording a glancing bird's-eye view of what has been promiscuously said, thought, fancied, and sung of the Leviathan by many nations and generations, including our own. So fare thee well, poor devil of a sub-sub, whose commentator I am. Thou belongest to that hopeless, sallow tribe which no wine of this world will ever warm, and for whom even pale sherry would be too rosy strong but with whom one sometimes loves to sit and feel poor devilish too, and grow convivial upon tears, and say to them bluntly with full eyes and empty glasses, and in not altogether unpleasant sadness, Give it up, sub-subs, for by how much the more pains ye take to please the world, by so much the more shall ye forever go thankless. Would that I could clear out Hampton Court and the Tuileries for ye. 
But gulp down your tears and high aloft to the royal mast with your hearts, for your friends who have gone before are clearing out the seven-storied heavens and making refugees of long-pampered Gabriel, Michael, and Raphael against your coming. Here you strike but splintered hearts together. There you shall strike unsplinterable glasses. And God created great whales. From Genesis. Le